This is the man in black here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Peter Lorre, who appears as a mysterious gentleman called George Ravel. Miss Wendy Berry plays our worried heroine, Marjorie. Mr. George Zuko is the lawyer, Alex Stevens. The story called The Moment of Darkness is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold a solution until the last possible moment. And so, with a moment of darkness, and with the performances of Peter Lorre, Wendy Berry, George Zuko, and our other players, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. <laughs> the Train Bleu crack express train from Paris to the French Riviera which in these carefree days before the war used to make the journey from Paris to Nice overnight. At the Gare du Sud on this particular mild spring evening, the train with its glistening wagon lits or sleeping cars waits in a station filled with smoke and the iron coughing of engines. You can hear the excited crowd at the slamming of compartment doors. You can see the guard standing by with his watch in hand, with his horn ready to blow as a signal. En voiture, messieurs les voyageurs! En voiture! À bientôt! Better get in, Emily. The train's just about ready to start. Commotion there. The last moment just before the signal, a girl in a light summer dress carrying a small suitcase hurries along the platform towards car number 10. The girl is blonde and evidently English, and as she hurries towards the guard. En voiture! Dépêchez-vous, mademoiselle. Hurry up, please. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Is this carriage number 10? Oui, mademoiselle, numéro 10. Hurry up, please. Thank you. I'll get in. And at no! must be at least a mile long. Car 10. Compartment number 6. Compartment number 6. Compartment... Uh, oh, here it is. Yes, come in. Mr. Stevens, I... Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. Won't you come in? I, uh, I thought this was Mr. Stevens' compartment. It is his compartment. I'm sharing it with him. He, uh... He is on the train, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He's going to look for some luggage that failed to turn up. In the meantime, won't you come in and sit down? Thank you. As an old friend of Toby Stevens, why do you smile? <laughs> Nothing. It's just odd to hear a dignified man like Mr. Stevens called Toby. That's all. Well, it suits him. As an old friend of his anyway, may I introduce myself? I'm Ken Blake, on vacation from the American consulate in London. How do you do? My name is Gray, Marjorie Gray. I, uh, I most particularly wanted to have a word with Mr. Stevens. Miss Gray, will you pardon my impertinence if I ask... Ask what? Whether it's about your Aunt Hester at Monte Carlo and the man who seems so determined to scare her to death. You know about that? Yes, a little. After all, that's why Toby's left his law practice and come all the way from London. He said... Mr. Stevens. Marjorie. Great Scott, what are you doing here? I came up from Monte Carlo especially to see you. I thought I'd find you in Paris, but when I got to your hotel, they told me you'd gone. Cook said they'd reserved a compartment on this train for you. So, well, here I am. But why? Before you see Aunt Hester, Mr. Stevens, I want to know what you meant by that letter you wrote me. I meant exactly what I said, Marjorie. I'm going to expose this faker, George Revel. <laughs> Excuse me, if you two want to talk, I'll just clear out of here. Oh, no, Ken, stay where you are. Really, Mr. Stevens? You made an impression on her, Ken. When the girl suddenly becomes thoroughly British after spending half her life on the Riviera, well, you made an impression. Don't talk like that, Toby. She won't get annoyed with you for saying it. She'll just get annoyed with me. Marjorie, this is Ken Blake. We've met, thanks. I asked him to come along with me, and for a very good reason. Indeed? Ken was for years at the American consulate in Paris. 
He knows all the heads of the Surete General, that's the Scotland Yard of France. And in particular, he knows the great detective Flamond, who's the chef de Surete. I thought Kent might be very useful when we nab Ravel. But I tell you, Ravel is dangerous. Dangerous, my eyes. Something's going to happen. I know something dreadful's going to happen. Now, let's face the situation, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester is middle-aged, wealthy, and... Uh... Oh, if only Uncle Paul hadn't died. He was the decentest person I ever knew. But he did die, my dear. And Hester can't be consoled. She can't eat, she can't sleep, she can't think of anything except getting in touch with his spirit. Along comes this faker Ravel to give seances. I wonder if he is a faker. You're not falling for this Tommy rot, surely. Really, Mr. Blake. If I'd asked for your advice in this matter... I beg your pardon, Miss Gray. When we get to Nice, I'll take the first train back to Paris. Oh, no. No, wait, please. I, I didn't mean to be rude. It's nice of you to help us, but it's the whole atmosphere of Monte Carlo. Well, that's quite all right, my dear. We understand, of course. There's Aunt Hester in that villa over the Mediterranean. There's Ravel, all thin and quiet and swarthy, with those somber-looking eyes of his. He, he seems to dominate her, just as Mr. Stevens used to. Dominate her, my dear? That's rather a strong word for an easygoing old buffer like me. Oh, the things Ravel does at those seances are terrifying. I don't know whether he's an imposter or not, but I am sure nobody else can do what he does. Now there, Marjorie, is where you're wrong. I can. You can? Yes, I promise to duplicate in front of your aunt every single trick Ravel ever performed. Oh, but that's impossible. Is it? Wait and see. I'll put it up to Mr. Blake. It isn't merely that Ravel is tied up, tied hand and foot in a chair, while these horrible things are going on. I know there are people who can get out of ropes and back into them again. But Ravel lets you take one precaution that shows there can't be any trickery. Oh, and what is that precaution? Just before the lights go out, he takes a piece of white paper. Well? He puts one under each foot. You take a pencil and draw an outline around the shoe on the paper. If he moved the millionth fraction of an inch, it would show in the outline later. But it never does. <laughs> well, look here, Toby, that's a bad one. Why does it strike you as being so funny? Because I can do it, too. Just give me a moment of darkness, that's all. You mean he gets out of his shoes or something like that? No, he could hardly get out of his shoes and back into them without disturbing the outline. Then he doesn't leave his chair after all. On the contrary, he can be all over the room. Well, how in Satan's name does he do it? My dear fellow, there's nothing simple. The Villa Bijou Monte Carlo the next evening. On the lighted terrace, that white villa, overlooking the olive groves and the sea, three people are seated at their ease, enjoying the night air. Below glitters the town, a white palm garden. But even its lamps are dimmed by the firework illuminations from the Promenade des Anglais. When the Principality of Monaco celebrates its ruler's birthday, Great rockets go hissing upwards to burst and bloom in colored fires against a black sky. Yeah, I don't like those fireworks. The noise upsets me. I wish they'd stop. Never mind the fireworks, Hester. You've heard my proposition. Give me an answer. Oh, what's more? You spill broth on your jacket at dinner. You're the clumsiest eater I ever saw. Here, here. Let me take a handkerchief to it. Please, Aunt Hester. Won't you answer, Mr. Stevens? Why don't you two let me alone, both of you? We're only trying to help you. Don't you believe that? Oh, yes, I, 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 I believe it. But I'm happy. I talked with my husband twice last week. Now, look here, Hester. This has got to stop. Why? Ravel's a fraud, and I can prove it. If Monsieur Ravel is a fraud, what is he gained by this? Has he asked for money? I don't know. Has he? No. Not a penny. You haven't changed your will by any chance. People do queer things sometimes that even their solicitors don't know about. Oh, no, dear, I haven't changed my will. When I die, uh, Marjorie inherits everything. I am a lonely woman. I'm getting old. I haven't got much to look forward to. Now, why don't you go your way and let me go mine? Suppose Ravel is a fraud. Just suppose it. Well, all right, have your way. You wouldn't like to think you'd been deliberately tricked and imposed on now, would you? Oh, no, no, of Now, listen, Hester. If I prove to you these so-called miracles were really tricks that I can do myself. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Alex, Alex Stevens. I ought to prove that here and now. Would that shake your faith a little? Mm, yes, I, I suppose it would. I. But how did you become so clever all of a sudden? How did you become so gullible all of a sudden? 
You used to scoff at this sort of thing. You used to be gay and lively and go to the casino. Well, that was before Paul died. You're shivering, Marjorie. If you feel cold, put on a wrap. I'm, I'm not cold. It, it's only... Only what? Oh, I've got a kind of presentiment that there's something dreadful hanging over us. I can't tell what direction it's taking or who's in danger. But I'm sure it's going to burst. Just as sure as I... Hi, George, look at that rocket. Yes. Red and gold stars. And a deathly white blaze like the life we're living. You can see every leaf in the garden. Every blade of grass. And we can also see... Look there. Rebel and Ken Blake coming up the path. This, this Ken Blake, Mr. Stevens. Are you sure he's quite honest? My dear Marjorie, Ken's all right. I've known him for years. I thought he came here to help expose Ravel. But he and Ravel are as thick as thieves. What sort of game is going on here? Game, mademoiselle? You spoke of a game? Yes, Monsieur Ravel, I did. So did I, friend Ravel. Are you ready for my demonstration tonight? Demonstration? In the seance room, upstairs. You claim you can bring back the dead. Pardon me, monsieur, I claim nothing. When I'm in trance, I cannot tell what happens. But I can. I'm going to make ghosts walk by perfectly natural means. You know, monsieur Stevens, I... I don't understand your logic. Logic? Yes, you wish to, uh... How do you put it? Expose me? But how will you expose me by these childish tricks? If I show you a counterfeit ten-pound note, does that prove there's no Bank of England? I'm not going to argue subtleties with you. You can always beat me there. <laughs> I'm a plain, ordinary man with a little common sense to back me up. No, no, no. Come on, my friend. Not an ordinary man, surely. Just exactly what are you hinting at? Yes, I... I I'd like to know that, too. Oh, Madame Hester, believe me. I didn't mean to upset you. I, it would, I, I wouldn't upset you for anything. No, I'll bet you wouldn't. Well, I kiss your hand, madame. I'm, I'm all apologies. Well, let this gentleman do what he likes. But I warn him, it is dangerous. Dangerous? How is it dangerous? That's the first time you've spoken, Mr. Blake. Why have you been so quiet? Uh, please, Marjorie, please now, be a good girl and stop interrupting. Oh, I'm sorry, Aunt Hester, but he's been muttering to himself and moving from one foot to the other and... And looking guilty. Confound it, I'm not looking guilty. Aren't you? No, it's a hot night. I don't like this business at all. Why will a seance be dangerous? Why? Because we shall be tampering with evil forces. Evil forces, my foot. Oh, you doubt it? Yes. <laughs> this brave Monsieur Stevens is challenging the unseen world. He's mocking at forces he does not understand. Believe me, Monsieur... They are not mocked without danger. I'll risk that, thanks. Well, up in a seance room, with a door bolted on the inside, we shall be at their mercy. The evil forces, the elementals, will wax and grow strong. They can take us in their grip as I take this walking stick and... You've got strong hands, Monsieur Ravel. The hands of evil spirits are stronger, much stronger. I'm afraid. I wonder if we ought to do this. I've been wondering the same thing. What does your aunt say? Well, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I'm so confused. And I want to break down and cry. I, well, I suppose we'd better do it, or Alex Stevens will never let me hear the end of it. For the last time, monsieur, will you be warned of danger? No. Very well. Oh, Madame Hester. Uh, yes, monsieur. Ravel. Do you believe that I'm an imposter? Why, no. No, dear, of course not, but... Uh, but in uh, your heart, you're not yet convinced. Uh, well, I... I, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not such a fool as some people seem to think. But if something did happen, something to show there are living forces beyond this world, it would convince you utterly? Oh, yes, I... I, I suppose it would. <laughs> then uh, shall we allow Monsieur Stevens to go on with his demonstration? I have a feeling we shouldn't do this. Oh, I'm afraid. Upstairs at the Villa Bijou, there is a small, bare, deeply carpeted room. Its only furniture consists of a round table, five chairs, and a large cabinet phonograph. There is only one door, and there are no windows. In one chair a little way back from the table sits Mr. Alexander Stevens. He is tied hand and foot, the outline of his shoes drawn with pencil on pieces of paper so that he cannot move. Now then, friend Raphael, 
Have you quite finished tying me up? Oh, yes. Yes, and I bet you you won't get out of these knots, sir. Well, we'll see about that. Are the rest of you ready? Yes, yes, all right. Oh, dear, I, I wish I'd put some smelling salts in my handbag. Well, what do you want us to do now? We'll have conditions exactly as they are for Mr. Ravel. I'll sit in this chair back from the table. You four sit around the table, clasping hands to form a circle. All right, let's get on with it. Ken, will you start the gramophone? <laughs> I believe it's customary, Mr. Ravel, to have hymns played at the beginning of the seance. To establish the proper frame of mind? Yes, monsieur, that's true. You fool. What did you say? Oh, uh, nothing, monsieur. Please continue. Start the gramophone, Ken. When you've done that, turn out the lights on that switch by the door. Then join the circle. Clasp each other's hands tightly and don't let go unless... Unless what? Well, unless something gets me. Be careful, monsieur. Go on, please. Start the gramophone. All right, here goes. Now the lights, Ken. Switch off the lights. Lights? Yes, yes, yes. There you are. It's pitch dark. I can't see my way back to the table. Here, Ken. Here's my hand. Thank you. Mine on the, on the other side, Mr. Blake. Thank you. I've got my bearings now. Are all of you clasping the hands of the next person? Then quiet and wait for what's going to happen. Ken, look. Look where? Over there, where Mr. Stevens is sitting. What about it? There's a luminous spot in the dark, about the size of a shilling. It's... Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, quiet, please. Did anything touch the back of your neck? No. Ah! Oh, 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 what was that? Eric Stevens, I know it. This was not on a program, madame. Break the circle and get those lights on. The luminous spot is still there. Oh, hurry, Ken. I can't see my way in the dark. I don't know which direction the lights are. Wait a minute. Here's the wall. If I grope along here, I ought to find the switch. Yes, yes, here it is. Lights. Ah! Quiet. Quiet silence, mademoiselle, if you please. What's wrong with Mr. Stevens? What's that sticking out of his chest? the handle of a dagger. And a good deal of blood has soaked through his coat, too. <laughs> well, Monsieur Blake, will you turn off his gramophone? Yes, certainly. But you're not saying that Toby Stevens is dead. I'm afraid he is, my friend. That's a direct heart wound. Perhaps ten seconds of intense agony, and then the end. Oh, is the door still bolted from the inside? Yes. And we are all alone, here, the four of us. This rash gentleman, one imagines, did not kill himself. He's too well tied up. I know who killed him. Mr. George Ravel. You did, with luminous paint. I killed him, mademoiselle? With luminous paint? I mean, that was part of the trick. You tied him up. You were the only one who touched him. And? What of that, mademoiselle? Luminous paint doesn't show up in the light. You smeared a little of it on his coat. That showed you exactly where to strike in the dark. I commend your good sense, madame. But there are two excellent reasons why I had nothing to do with this. The first reason I, I must keep to myself, but the second reason can easily be proved. Well, what is it? Well, up to the time that man screamed, you yourself were holding my right hand, and madame Hester was holding my left hand. Did either of you let go at any time? No. No, that is, that is I didn't. What about you, Aunt Hester? No, no, Marjorie did. I didn't let go either. He never moved. Hold on. Wait a minute. Well, monsieur, speak up. I was holding Marjorie's hand on one side and her aunt's on the other. And they didn't move either. Nobody let go or left the circle. That's true. Consequently, none of us could have killed Toby Stevens. Yes, it is true. Somebody must have sneaked in here. Oh, no. As you said yourself, the door is bolted on the inside. Then who the devil did kill him? Well, that's the question. Has anybody ever seen that dagger before? No. It, it looks like one of those curio things you buy in the shops. Yes, and uh, with the design of wooden scroll work on the handle. No fingerprints will show. Nothing else. Except some musical instruments. <laughs> a tambourine, an accordion, and a speaking trumpet. You know, I, I blame myself for this. You ought to. Why? Because you killed him. Don't ask me how, but I know why. Indeed, mademoiselle. You found my motive. Yes, yes, I have. 
You've got Aunt Hester fully believing in you now, haven't you? Easy, Marjorie. In another minute, you'll be talking about forces and elementals and heaven knows what. <laughs> you'll be saying it was a spirit hand that killed Mr. Stevens because nobody else could have. Please, Marjorie, brace up. Someone's got to send for the police. Why don't you send for the police, Ken? Couldn't you help us there? Help you? How? Mr. Stevens said you knew the heads of the Sûreté. He said you knew this man, Flamand, who's supposed to be the greatest detective in France. Oh, but this isn't French territory. Monte Carlo is the independent state of Monaco. I'm sorry, Marjorie. Ordinarily, I might have helped. You mean you won't help us? I'm sorry, Marjorie. I can't. Then I've got to help myself. George Revell, you killed Mr. Stevens! But how? Yes, how? <laughs> Twenty-four hours later, twenty-four hours of blind puzzling. In the railway station at Nice, nine miles from Monte Carlo, the night express for Paris is already underway. The guard has blown his signal, and the great wheels grind. And a young man, hatless and worried, pushes through the crowd past the already moving train. No, monsieur, c'est défendu. Vous êtes trop tard. Too late, nothing. I'm getting aboard this train. On est garde, monsieur. I'm sorry to have caused you any trouble, guard. But do you happen to know whether... Marjorie! Ken Blake! What are you doing on this train? Exactly the question I wanted to ask you. Walk along the corridor with me, will you? All right. Marjorie, you little idiot. What's the idea of running away? If it's any of your business, Mr. Blake, I'm not running away. I'm merely going to Paris. You were told to stay in Monte Carlo. Don't you know you can land in jail for this? They'll put you in jail too, won't they? Yes, I suppose so. But what's the idea of going to Paris? Well, first of all, I had to get Aunt Hester away from that man, Ravel. She really thinks he can call up ghosts now. Is your aunt on this train? Yes, in that compartment there. Second, I'm going to Paris for some real help. I'm going to the Sûreté. I'm going to see this man, Flamand. You won't find Flamand in Paris, Marjorie. And you'll certainly never get him to arrest Georges Ravel. And why not? Because, my dear idiot, Georges Ravel is Flamand. What are you saying? The man who calls himself Ravel is really Flamand, the head of the whole French detective bureau. He made me promise not to tell anybody. Oh, then that's why you've been looking so guilty for two days. Yes, I tried to tip you off today, but the police were with us all the time. So he is a fake spiritual medium. Mr. Stevens was right about that. And I still say I'm right about the other thing. Whoever he is, Ravel killed Mr. Stevens. But how and why? Oh, I don't know. This alleged detective. Did he tell you why he was masquerading as a medium in Monte Carlo? No. All I know is that we're in one sweet mess. We've left town without permission. They'll probably stop the train and send us back in a patrol wagon. Oh, no, 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 my friend. That won't be at all necessary. Ravel! Yes, mademoiselle. Ravel or uh, Flamand. <laughs> well, since you know me as Ravel, call me that. You... You knew that I was on this train? Oh, well, naturally. Look here, old man. I kept quiet about you because you swore it was a matter of life and death. But will you answer a couple of questions now? Oh, with pleasure. Why did you pose as a medium? Because the Monarchan government employed me to trap a murderer. So I had to work hard, you see, undercover. All right. Why was Toby Stevens killed? Stevens was killed because he was a blackmailer. A blackmailer? Yes, mademoiselle. Does that surprise you? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Very much. I tried to warn Stevens, but the fool wouldn't listen. And then, well, I wasn't quick enough. Stevens was murdered, of course, by one of us four in the seance room. Well, that's impossible. Hmm? Impossible? Oh, no. The trick was baffling because of its simplicity. I'm sure you killed him. <laughs> one moment, mademoiselle. Let me show you what I mean by trick baffling because it is so simple. Take, for example, the pencil outline drawn on a paper around the medium shoes. Did Stevens tell you how I did that? No. On this train two nights ago, he, he started to tell us, but... Then he just stopped in the middle of it and laughed. <laughs> you see, the medium leaves his chair. Well, he makes tambourines rattle and ghost forms appear. Yet the pencil outline is not disturbed. Now, how does he manage it? Well, how does he manage it? Well, quite easily. He returns to his chair, 
He turns over the two pieces of paper. He takes another pencil and draws an outline of his shoes on the reverse side of the paper. <laughs> you look at it. And... and imagine it's the same outline we drew. Precisely. So easily are people misled. And it was the same way with a murder. But there couldn't have been any trick about the murder. None of us left the circle. We were all clasping hands when we heard that scream. Don't you agree? Huh? Oh, yes, I agree. I can't stand this any longer. When we heard Mr. Stevens utter that horrible scream... What I... makes you think it was Stevens who uttered that scream? I... I beg your pardon. What makes you think it was Stevens who screamed? Well, wasn't it? Oh, you assumed it, yes. We, we all assumed it. But up to that time, Stevens wasn't even hurt. Wasn't hurt? You see, the source of sound cannot be located in the dark. It was the murderer who uttered that appalling crime. In a few seconds of darkness, before the lights went on, the killer simply leaned across and drove that dagger into Stephen's chest. And you prove that? Yes. If Stevens had been hit at the time of the scream, blood would have blotted out the spot of luminous paint. Yet... Marjorie Gray saw the pain shining after the scream. That's true, Marjorie. I heard you say so. You put the luminous paint there, Ravel. You were the only person who touched him. Oh, no. There was one other person who touched him. Who was it? Another person in full sight of you said Stevens had spilled broth on his coat and swabbed at his chest with a handkerchief. You mean... I mean, of course, the real murderer. Your Aunt Hester... Yes, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester. Aunt Hester. Keep back, all of you. Oh, so you managed to find the revolver. Marjorie, I poisoned your Uncle Paul. I poisoned my husband. And Alex Stevens knew it. You can't get away, madame. <laughs> Keep away from that door. I never believed in spiritualism. I let myself be influenced by a medium because Alex Stevens would try to stop it. He was getting money out of me. He wanted no other influence. Don't open that door, madame. But I am opening it. Oh, Aunt Hester, don't! I told you I wasn't a fool as I looked. I had the knife in my hand. Back. Stop her, kid! Stop her! Well, mademoiselle, <laughs> she has committed many crimes, but now she has paid for them all. <laughs> And so closes The Moment of Darkness, starring Peter Laurie, Wendy Berry, with George Zuko. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins will star in a study in terror titled The Diary of Sophronia Winter. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Wilbur Hatch, Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wines.
Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you Mr. Orson Welles. Mr. Welles will appear as star of the suspense drama called The Dark Tower, from the play by George S. Kaufman and the late Alexander Wolcott. But before we raise the curtain on this evening's tale of suspense, here is a message from your host, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Let us picture a scene in the fashionable restaurant El Patio in Havana, Cuba. From the next table, we hear a Cuban judge of fine wines describe in glowing terms the wonderful climate and soil of our own California. When his American guest points out that his Cuban host has never been to the United States, the Cuban answers, Well, it's true I've never visited your California, but from only such perfect wine country could come sherry of such superb quality as that we have enjoyed, Roma California Sherry. Yes, by their example, wine connoisseurs of many other lands tell you that in Roma wines are all the great qualities that must be present in a wine for great enjoyment. It's for this reason these wine experts of other lands import Roma wines from great distances to be enjoyed as a rare luxury. But for you, this luxury of other lands becomes a daily pleasure. Because you can enjoy any of Roma Wine's many different taste-appealing wine types without additional charge for import duties and expensive shipment from great distance. These two great Roma Wine features, superb quality and small cost, have made Roma Wines America's largest selling wine. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A. Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with the Dark Tower, and with the performance of our star, Orson Welles, as that noted actor, Damon Wellington, scion of the celebrated royal family of stage and screen, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! You dare... You dare call me a ham. Violet, I will prove to the world there are no brains within that thick, Teutonic skull. I'll cleave it open like an overripe melon. Who thus profanes the rehearsal of my lines? Enter, if thou art man of woman born. I fear thee not. Hello, Damon. Ben Weston, you old son of a god. I heard you were back from the coast. What news in the Rialto from that cesspool of the arts known as Hollywood. Have they turned my picture to the wall at the Brown Derby yet? No, it's still there. I despise myself for wanting to know, of course. It's marvelous to have you back, Ben, old boy. Seen Jessica yet? Yes, I've seen her. Isn't she looking fine? Feeling better than she has for years, I think. You got a great thing in this play, Ben. Changed quite a bit from the original, of course. Sort of a satire on the family. Perhaps it might be more dignified to say that the family is a satire on the play. Yes, I heard about it. For instance, those lines you heard me declaiming as you entered actually happened to me once. You know, that German, what's his name, who directed Macbeth, he called me a ham. And I chased him out of the theater and for four city blocks in full costume with a two-edged sword. (laughs) Damon. There's a little thing I like in the second act, too. Jessica asked me why I don't stop drinking, and I say, what? Would you have me subsist entirely on food and reach the gargantuan proportions of an Orson Welles? That ought to needle a boy wonder. (laughs) Amen. Damon, can't you stop clowning for a minute? Of course I can. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave. Damon, please. Please be serious. What's the matter, old man? You know as well as I do what's the matter. No, frankly, I can't say that I do. To me, the world looks rather well. Does it? And Jessica, feeling better than she has for years, is she? Well, isn't she? Of course not. How could she be? And why shouldn't she be? Damon, don't you realize there's been a murder? How to be sure, so there has, and a good thing, too, if you ask me. What of it? What of it? Can't you see the thing is hanging over this house like a... like a curse? I hadn't noticed anything hanging over this house, profane or otherwise. And what about Jessica? Oh, I suppose it's bound to upset her a little, but she's really in fine shape, Ben. It's going to be marvelous in this play. There's more at stake in this than a play, Damon. The thing has never been solved. Perhaps it never will be. Perhaps that's just as well. 
But Jessica can't remember, don't you understand, Damon? She can't remember. Well, well, Ed, Jessica can't remember. Listen to me, Damon. I wouldn't mind it if it was just that other people thought she might have done it. But they would do that anyway. But, but she does. Ah, oh, come on, Ben. I don't believe it. I've talked to her, Damon. I know. Oh, I Damon, see. I love Jessica more than anything else in the world. You know that. Yes, Ben, I do. But this way, I... I couldn't... You couldn't marry a murderess, hmm? I just think it'd be rather exciting. Now that you mention it, I rather wish I had. Instead of some of those I did marry. Damon. I'm sorry. Pretty serious to you, isn't it, old man? Did you think it wouldn't be? Well, to tell you the truth, Ben, I hadn't thought about it at all. That's the trouble with being an actor. As long as your heart's good, you don't give a hang about the rest of the play. Yeah. You told Jessica? Yes, we had a long talk. How did she take it? You know, Jessica, she carried it off, of course. But... Uh, ben, you know, in spite of all our histrionic bickering, I'm rather nuts about Jessica myself. I know you are, Damon. I have no very fundamental objections to you, either. I would describe you, my dear Benjamin, as adequate. Thanks. So I think perhaps you and I would better have a nice, long, heart-to-heart -heart talk. What good will talking do? I think if you'll do the listening and let me do the talking, you'll see. Lend me your ears. I will a tale unfold. Well, Jessica, as you know, had been in a sanitarium for nearly a year. She hadn't been on the stage in more than two years. The Dark Tower was to be her first attempt to work again. All that time. I know it isn't the greatest play in the world, but it has a surefire box office appeal. Jessica needed that to get her confidence back. Well, we were just polishing up a few last-minute changes here at the house. David Torrance, the producer, you know, he was there with us. And, of course, there are the usual little differences. And another thing, Damon. When you kick me in the middle of the second act... Where? You know perfectly well where. Is it absolutely essential that you boot me halfway across the stage? What do you want me to do? Pull my punches? That's one of the high spots in the show. It may be a high spot to you, darling, but it's just a black and blue spot to me. Very well. Henceforth, I shall appear for the second act on crutches. You know, Uncle David, that's not a bad idea. Oh, now, Damon, let's be serious. There's a lot of work to I'm do. I'm quite serious. I could throw him at her. You might try throwing me a cue once in a while. It's the use of having a play if you just make up the lines as you go along. The critics thought my ad-libbing very witty, remember, dear? Oh, Damon, you're such an insufferable ham. A ham? A ham? Me? A now, ham? Now, now, children, please. I let's... fail to see why I should permit that little minx to insult me with impunity, David. How dare you speak to me that way? You started it. I did not. You started You called me a ham. You are ham, ham, ham! Minx, minx, minx! Stop that brawling. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Martha is the sun. I quite agree. What? That you're a ham. Gad, I'm beset by harpies. David, haven't you any control over these hirelings of yours? Oh, I'm only the producer, my dear Martha. You at least are a member of the family. And you at least can quit. <laughs> We're terribly sorry, Aunt Martha. We've been a nuisance, I know, and I apologize. Damon, eh? I even apologize to you. Don't be silly, Jim. I've been much the worst, I know, but I've really been terribly keyed up working again and... You know, Ben is coming east for the opening. Love rears its ugly head. Don't be hurried, Damon. It's all right. I couldn't even be angry if he was. Anyway, I'll have a husband to protect me by this time next week. I can lick him with one hand tied behind me. Damon, seriously. I know I owe you an awful lot. Me? I hadn't actually realized how far I'd gone. These last six months have been like coming alive again. The play and Ben. Thanks, Damon. Good Lord. Now, I think I'll dress for dinner. Let's all go out to the... I'll get it. Aunt Martha, where would you like to go? To a rest home. Hello? Who? No. No, he's not here. 
He's not here, I tell you. He's dead. Oh, darling, what is it? It was for Stanley. For Stanley? Yes. Never mind, darling, it's all right. Just some fool who didn't know. Of course. Damon, you take David and Martha out to dinner, will you? I think I'll... Lie down for a little while. Oh, come on, Jess. You mustn't let a little thing like that upset you. I know, but I'm awfully tired. Please. Jessica! You'd uh, better leave her alone for a while, Martha. Oh, I suppose so. It was for Stanley Vance, the husband, huh? Yes. He's dead, you say? Might as well tell him about it, Martha. I was always for telling about it. Well, you don't have to. I'd rather... He was the cause of her breakdown, of course. Should have been an actor. That's why Jessica married him. She married him because he forced her to marry him. Uh, He controlled that girl's mind like some sort of fiendish hypnotist. My dear Martha, I've always said that if Jessica was fool enough to marry a psychoanalyst... Damon, stop playing the heartless brother. You saw what Stanley did to her. I was in Hollywood. Perhaps that's why Damon went to Hollywood, huh? Well... What could one do? She was legally married to the man. She'd listen to no one but him. Here's what happened, David. She went to this fellow to be psychoanalyzed, and in the process, something happened. I don't know what it was, but Vance acquired a power over Jessica's mind that was utterly inhuman. He married her quite frankly to have her support him. Then he found he'd overplayed his hand and sent her into a complete mental collapse. When he found he couldn't snap her out of it, and she was no longer a source of revenue to him, he simply decamped. Hmm. You say Vance is now dead? We heard the happy news about six months ago. Some public benefactor had shot him. I've always meant to look that fellow up. From that very day, she began to get better. From the moment she heard the news, it was as though a spell had been lifted. Hmm. Now she's practically all well. You know, it's odd that that someone phoning for him after all these months. Probably the sheriff just catching up. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Damon. You don't suppose? I'll go. It may be a peasant with a petition. Good evening. My dear Martha, you are positively psychic. The Honorable Stanley Vance. Thank you. I trust the shock will not be too great. One knoweth not the place nor the hour when the bridegroom cometh, does one? My luggage will be here shortly. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. Good evening, Martha. I regret to arrive so unceremoniously. I have been ill. So we have been told. We have been assured, however, that your illness was fatal. Damon, I thought I... Stanley. Jessica. My poor, poor darling. Stanley. Oh, but you're ill, my dear, aren't you? You're ill. You should be resting. You're tired and exhausted, aren't you? Terribly. Terribly tired. Yes. I am tired. Oh, great. Terribly tired. I'll take you up to your room, darling. I take it we still have the same room, Martha. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. The poor girl, you can see how weak she is. If you think you're going to stay under this roof for a single minute, get out! Very well. Get out! Very well, if you insist on being inhospitable, Martha... You'll pack your things, Jessica. We'll go to an hotel. Yes. Yes, Stanley. Jessica. But I'm so tired. Will you help me, Stanley? Of course I will, my dear. Come along. Stanley. Yes, Martha? All right, Stanley. You win. Ah. You're asking us to avail ourselves of your hospitality, Martha? Yes, You can stay. That's very sweet of you, Martha. Isn't it, darling? Yes. Yes, Stanley. But somehow, someday, there'll be a time of reckoning for you, Stanley Vance. And until it comes, keep out of my sight. The pleasure will be all mine. Come, darling. We'll go to our room now. Yes, Stanley. Damon. Yes, my aged auntie. Damon, what are we going to do? I don't know what you're going to do, Ducky. But I'm going down to the Lambs Club and have a quadruple scotch and soda. You may think it hard.
heartless of me, but during the next few days, I simply stayed away. I think you'll understand my reasons later. As for Jessica, she was, of course, completely in his power again. And about a week later, there appeared upon the scene a gentleman who was destined to play a very substantial role in our little drama. I think you've already met him, at least on one occasion. I'll get it, Jessica, darling. Hello? No, Mr. Damon Wellington isn't here. Can I take a message, please? Mr. Max Hartsfeld. Hartsfeld. Uh, I'll tell him you called, Mr. Hartsfeld. I really couldn't say. Well, you can come up and wait if you like, of course, but I can't promise he'll see you. Very well, goodbye. Jessica? Yes, Stanley? Do you know any friend of Damon's named Max Hartsfeld? No, Stanley. He seemed extremely eager to see him. He said he'd come up here and wait. Oh, I see. It's no matter. Tell me, darling, have you been feeling a little stronger these last few days? Yes. I think perhaps I am, Stanley. But of course you're not ready to go back on the stage again, are you, darling? No. Of course not, Stanley. Poor darling. No more love, no more... Well, my little lovebirds... How are you two? How are you, Jessica? A little stronger, I think. Am I a little stronger, Stanley? Of course you are, my dear. Uh, Jessica, I think you'd better leave us now. There's something I want to talk over with Damon. Yes, Stanley. I'll see you again very shortly, darling. Yes, Stanley. Well, Damon, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. Really? I wish I could say the same. I suppose you realize, Damon, that... It's out of the question for Jessica to go on in the play in her present condition. Uh, kind of the point where your Vance have a pressing engagement with a pin-up girl, and I have got to change into my zoot suit. <sighs> now, seriously, Damon, I know that you somehow connect me with Jessica's condition. By an odd coincidence, I do. What of it? I know it would make you and everyone very happy if Jessica could go on in the play. Aha, uh -huh, the light at last illuminates my adult witch, so it's a shakedown. A shakedown, is it, Stanley? My dear Damon, I really don't know what you're talking about. Look here, about. my larcenous in-law. I've been shaken down by experts on every conceivable count, including the Man Act in my time, and I can smell them a mile away. What you propose is that for certain financial considerations, you will leave this happy home, Jessica will recover, and she can go on in the play. The answer is No. There won't be any play without her, Damon. Are you suggesting that my name is not sufficient to draw the suckers? I can get a dozen people to play Jessica's part. Margaret O'Brien, Marjorie Maine, Daisy, Agnes Moorhead. Makes no difference to me, anybody at all. Don't try to bluff me, Damon. After all this build-up, you won't dare go on without Jessica. You little know me, stinky. You may consider your little farce as having closed on opening night. As for Jessica, I'm very much afraid that she's made her bed, and now she'll have to lie in it. There's no cure for her short of murder with yourself as a victim. And I do not propose to put my neck in the hangman's noose. Good night. I think you'll see things my way a little God later, Damon. Did. By the way, did I have any calls? Oh, yes. Uh, Max Hartsfeld called. Max said he was Hartsfeld. coming up here to wait for you. Good heavens, when? He's on his way now, I imagine. Look. Tell him I'm out, will you? Going to Hollywood or something. Fellow's been pestering me all week. Wants to buy into the show, and I simply don't want to see him. Oh, he wants to buy into the show. Yes, he does not share your lamentable lack of faith in my talent, Stanley, and he's dying to buy into the show. Uh, does he know Jessica won't be able to uh, appear? Of course he does, you idiot. Everybody does. Don't you read the trade papers? And now, good night, repulsive. I have other fish to fry. Toodaloo, flat top. Jessica. Oh, Jessica, my dear. I'm coming, Stanley. Tell me, Jessica, The Dark Tower, the play you are going to appear in with Damon, you have an interest in it, don't you? Yes. Yes, I think I do. An equal interest with Damon? With Damon, yes. Uh, how much do you suppose that interest is worth, Jessica? A hundred thousand dollars, I think. A hundred thousand dollars, huh? 
Yes, that was it. Have you thought about what you're going to do with it now that you can't appear in the play yourself? No, Stanley, I haven't. You see, I'm not at all sure the play will be a success without you, Jessica. I don't know, Stanley. And so it might be wise to sell your share of it before it opens. Don't you agree, Jessica? Yes. Yes, I do agree. And, Jessica, if I could find a buyer, and I think perhaps I can, it might be best if I were to handle the details for you. Don't you think? Yes, Stanley. You handle it. The fact of the matter is, there's a man coming up here this evening, a friend of Damon's, Max Hartsfeld. Do you remember I asked you about him? Yes. It won't be any trouble to you, darling. All you'll have to do is sign the necessary papers. Oh. Excuse me. Is this the residence of Mr. Damon Wellington? <laughs> Mr. Hartsfeld? Yes. Oh, come in, please. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Wellington is at home? No, and we don't expect him, but he's discussed with me the reason for your visit, and I think perhaps you and I can reach a satisfactory agreement. And you are... Uh, Stanley Vance. I'm Miss Wellington's husband. This is my wife. How do you do? How do you do? I'm very glad to... Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Hartsfield. May I have your hat and coat? Thank you. And your gloves, please. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, eccentricity, perhaps. I always keep them on. Oh. And <laughs> uh, Mr. Hartsfield, Damon tells me that... You wish to buy an interest in the new Wellington play, The Dark Tower. Yes, I, I've been seeking an interview with Mr. Wellington. Yes, so he's told me. However, <laughs> Damon has very definitely made up his mind not to sell any part of his interest in the play. You are sure of this, Mr. Vance? Oh, yes, quite sure. I had a long talk with him about it only this evening. I <laughs> see. I will not conceal from you that this is a source of great disappointment to me, Mr. Vance. I have such a deep admiration for the talents of Mr. Wellington. I ventured in a few previous theatrical enterprises. Now, at last, I hope... That... I quite understand your feelings, Mr. Hartsfeld, and I think that I may be able to help you. Yes? Yes. You see... Damon owns only half of the Wellington interest in the play. <laughs> My wife, Miss Jessica Wellington, owns the other half. And she, we, if the offer were sufficiently attractive... Uh, indeed. Uh, you, you are willing to sell then, Miss Wellington? Yes, whatever Stanley says. Good. Then perhaps we should get down to detail, huh? <laughs> yes, Mr. Vance. And Miss Wellington, I'm afraid you will think me very rude. Not but, at all. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, since the talents of Miss Wellington's brother uh, must be considered the very essence of our bargaining, and since you are acting as her agent in any event, I wonder if she would forgive me if I asked that you and I conclude this part of our business <laughs> alone, Mr. Vance. Oh, of course. <laughs> Jessica will understand perfectly. Won't you, my dear? Yes, Stanley. Run along then, darling. I'll call you when we need you. Yes, Stanley. <sighs> Now, Mr. Vance, I imagine you will wish to know a little more about the man with whom you are dealing. Here's my card. I'm staying at the Waldorf. I've written the room number on the card for you. Well, there's no need, really. <laughs> yes. But before we discuss terms, there is one other thing. Yeah? I wonder... You do not know me, do you, Mr. Vance? Know you? I, I... You do not know why I've been looking forward with such pleasure to an interview with you? Alone. I know, I... I... Well, it's very simple. It's very simple, really, Mr. Vance. It's, uh, it's just that I'm... <laughs> I'm going to kill you. To kill me? Really, Mr. Hartsfeld? With these two hands. And before you die... Huh? Before you die... I want you to know the reason. Uh... Jessica... No. No, no. <laughs> so you see, Ben, there is your murderer, Mr. Max Hartsfeld. And I hope you're duly grateful to him. An elusive fellow, Hartsfield. The police have been trying to find him for two weeks. They never will. He... Uh, well, there's no fingerprints, you see. Uh, he always kept his gloves on. It's uh, an eccentricity. Damon. <laughs> an eccentricity. Wait a minute. 
Do you mean you? Yeah, my dear Mutton. My dear Muttonhead. Listen, darling, the whole thing's perfectly clear. It's as plain as the putty nose on Max Hartsfeld's face. I still can't get it into my head. Benjamin, if you don't know who Max Hartsfeld is by now, you are the only person within the sound of my voice who does not. You mean you impersonated... Then it wasn't Jessica. Jessica? <laughs> she never could have done it. The girl has talent, but no genius. But Damon, murder. Murder, he says. Dear friend, you share with me a guilty secret. Your lips are sealed. Come. In the words of Hamlet, never so help you mercy. Note that you know aught of me. Swear by my sword. What? Swear! I swear. Well said, old mole. Well, I think that winds up the case, Watson. Uh, Jessica will receive by registered post a signed confession by Max Hartsfeld, bound in vellum. That should end her worries. You may consider it as my wedding present. It will be a work not without literary merit, although written lefty. I should prefer it to be published posthumously. I look forward to a long and brilliant career in the theater. I should not care to terminate it abruptly upon so paltry a characterization as the late Max Hartsfeld. Music. Curtain. <laughs> And so closes The Dark Tower by Alexander Wolcott and George S. Kaufman. And starring Orson Welles, tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If we could bring to this microphone a man typical of all Roma wine dealers, this is what he might tell you. I sell a lot of the good Roma wines. They are, you know, America's largest selling wines. My Roma wine customers, I've noticed, are sociable people who enjoy entertaining friends. Talking with me, they give a lot of credit for the success of their entertaining to the enjoyable Roma wines they serve. They're thrifty people, too, these buyers of Roma wines. What else could offer so much enjoyment for so little cost? Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now, that doesn't leave much for me to add, except this, perhaps... If you are not already one of the millions enjoying Roma wines regularly, make your own taste test of any of Roma wines' many different taste-delighting California wine types, such as the delicious tangy Roma sherry, or the hearty Roma burgundy, or the sweeter, heavier Roma port, and discover for yourself why Roma wines are winning international praise voiced in this phrase. Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name... R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Next week's suspense will, as is its policy from time to time, do the unexpected in the way of casting. Because you're going to hear the country's leading comic juvenile, Mr. Eddie Bracken, as a dramatic actor. I look forward to hearing that. I know you do, too. Insure your baby's future by insuring your country's future. Buy war bonds for your baby today. Don't forget then, next Thursday, same time, you will hear Eddie Bracken in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. 
those better-tasting California wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. For friendly entertaining, for delightful dining. Yes, right now, a glassful would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Robert Taylor, star of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Undercurrent, in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Merry Christmas, Jerry. How's the real estate business? Oh, kind of early with your greeting, aren't you, Sam? Well, I gotta get them in sometime. I may not see you again until next Christmas. If this real estate racket gets any crazy, I'll be dead by next Christmas. <laughs> I'm glad you could get up here, though, Sam. What's on your mind, Jerry? Uh, you, you'll probably shoot me when you hear it, Sam, because I'm probably nuts. But, but doggone it, you're a detective and you're my pal, and I just had to tell somebody. Well, you sound like it's serious. That's just it. I, I don't know what it is, Sam, but... Now, listen, you, you know we're agents for a group of houses up in Cypress Canyon, mm -hmm. those places that were started before the war never got finished. Oh, yeah. All I got in were the foundations, just mm -hmm. concrete and a couple of beams. Well, they've been finished now. In fact, I'm putting up the for rent on the last of them today. What do you want? Police protection from the mob? Yeah. Listen, Sam, this house that I'm talking about, it's got a number now, uh, 2256. But before, when the men went back to work on it about three months ago, well, they just started when the foreman on the job brought me a shoebox that he'd found up on a beam. And this box had a, a what do you call it, a, a manuscript in it, a story kind of, all written out. Yeah. Well, he gave me the thing. I read it. I didn't think much about it. I put it in my desk. But the other day, and I happened to drive by there, I saw the number on the house and what the house looked like. I thought of this manuscript. And, well, I don't like it, that's all. There's something funny about it. What's funny about it? Well, mind you, this thing was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. House that was only just started building. All it's, right. Uh, well, listen, Sam, I want to read it to you if you got the time, and you'll see what I mean. All right, shoot. <clears throat> well, here's how it begins. Uh, to whom it may concern. My reasons for setting down on paper what follows here will be abundantly what follows clear. Here will be abundantly clear to anyone into whose possession it may fall. First, let me say that I'm a very ordinary person. My name is James A. Woods. I'm 35 years old. By profession, a chemical engineer. My wife, Ellen, was a school teacher when I met and married her in Indiana seven years ago. There's nothing in the past life of either one of us to suggest remotely any cause or reason for the dreadful thing that has invaded our lives. Our married life has been in no way different from that of millions of other average, reasonably happy, and congenial families. Three months ago, I was ordered by my firm to take charge of a rather minor project in Los Angeles, uh, Hollywood to be exact. The order was a sudden one. There'd been no time to secure accommodations and... Conditions being what they are, the inevitable result was that until day before yesterday, we'd been living in the cramped quarters of one of those characteristic California motels. Needless to say, most of our spare time had been devoted to a search for something more permanent and comfortable, but the fruits of these efforts had been financially and in every other way a geometrical progression of discouragement. Until last Saturday afternoon, only four days before Christmas... We were driving into town on our way to a movie when Ellen saw it. Jim, look. What? That sign in front of that real estate office. Oh, yeah. But yeah. don't you see what it says? For rent, furnished, two-bedroom house, close in, immediate occupancy. Yeah, uh-huh. Aren't you going to stop? Oh, Ellen, you know a sign like that. It mean right out in plain sight in front of a real estate office. Oh, yeah, but Jim... Either they want $600 a month... We'll that... never know until we ask. But if it's any good at all, there are probably 50 people fighting for it right back there now. Well, honey, there's no harm in trying. Now, is there? You really want to go back? Oh, it's probably foolish, but what can we lose? Okay. Oh, darling, come on, cheer up. How do you know? Maybe our luck's changed. Maybe fate's going to give us a nice new house for a Christmas present. Come in. Oh, uh... We're sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I hung it outside just this minute. Is... is the house available? Why, sure, sure it is. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How to do? Wow. Looks like it's fixing to rain. Yes, so it does, doesn't it? Well, 
it was one of those things. The real estate agent had just been authorized to rent the place by mail that morning, and he'd hardly had time to look at it himself and put up his sign when we drove up. It was just an ordinary little California house about halfway up Cypress Canyon, number 2256. Just an ordinary, undistinguished little house. The agent didn't know much about it. Construction on it had been stopped by the war, and it had just been completed and furnished lately. It had been vacant while somebody's estate was being settled, and... Now it was owned by a bank in Sacramento. Of course, we didn't... We didn't Got care this about key in the mail along with the authorization to rent. Only one there is. Of course, you can have duplicates made. Yeah, seems to stick a little. No, oh, no, there it is. It doesn't sound as though that door had ever been opened. Well, a little oil on the hinges will fix that all right. Oh, sure. Now, now here's your living room. Furniture's a little dusty, of course. You gotta expect that. It's good furniture, though, you see? Benson Brothers. Yes, uh huh. Now, over here's a little den. Panel, you see? Radio, fireplace. Really a very attractive little room, particularly for a man. Uh huh, yep. Now, the, the bedroom's off the living room here. Everything's all on one floor, you understand? Uh huh. It's uh, quite nice, I think. Yes, uh huh. You can see you get the morning sun here. There's a view of the canyon through these front windows. We got cross ventilation. That's about all there was to it. It wasn't the best place in the world. It was small and badly built, but what would you have done? We took it with as little inspection as that. It was the Saturday before Christmas. And the very same evening, we were struggling up the steps from the road with suitcases and boxes and armloads of clothes and all the endless bric-a-brac that people collect and never know they have until they move. And Ellen began unpacking, and I began moving things around and taking the worst of the pictures off the wall, doing... All the little things that everybody does when they move into a new place and try to give it something of their own. Don't be such a sour puss. You know, it's a roof over our heads for Christmas. That's more than we ever thought we'd get, isn't it? Now, what in the world are we going to do with those two pictures? Well, why don't we just leave them where they are? Jim, we can't. They're too awful. Well, all right, put them in the closet then. I can't. Both the closets are jammed full. No, I mean the other one in the little alcove off the den. At least there's a door there. I suppose it's a closet. Yeah. I don't know. If that isn't a commentary on the housing problem, huh? A woman moving into a house without even knowing where all the closets are. Take the pictures down, will you, honey? Bring them in here. Okay, okay. Oh, I guess you'll have to help me with this door. I can't get it open. Let me see it. Well, of course you can't, silly. It's locked. Where are those keys we found on the desk? Mm. Here they are. Uh, no, not this one. I'm sure this one won't work. No, feels like an awful solid door for a closet. Oh, and that's one solid door in the house. No, this one won't do it either. Well, we'll just have to get a locksmith up here on Monday. I'll put the pictures behind the desk, okay? Yeah, yeah, all right. Jim, if you could just help me move this armchair, huh? Oh, Ellen, will you let it go until tomorrow? You know what time it is? Oh, but honey, I'd like to get the place looking just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, but it's bit. almost midnight. In fact, it's, it's exactly... What was that? <laughs> Tomcat, I guess, out in the brush somewhere. Sounded near. <laughs> oh, hope that doesn't go on all night. Well, there's much we can do about it. Come on, Ellen, I'm dead tired. All right, Jim, all right. Where'd you put the toothpaste, honey? It's right in the medicine cabinet. Oh, yeah. Jim, we ought to get some firewood tomorrow. You know a fire in that living room would make all the difference Make's in the world. Cab, Sunday. Well, Monday, then. Jim, I think red curtains are what we need, don't you? Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. You know, just at least for the living room. Anyway, the ones in there now have just got to come down. Yeah, I suppose they do. What do you think of red? Well, I guess it's all... Jim... Some tomcat. Jim, it, it sounded in the house. Oh, now, how could it be in the house, Ellen? We've been over every inch of the house. Except the closet. Now, how could a cat or anything else be in the closet that's been locked up for over a year? Oh, I don't know. It's... Uh, it's probably under the house. A wild cat or a mountain lion or something. I hear they have them in California. Jim, I don't like well, it. Well, neither do I like it, but there's nothing we can do about it tonight. Well, maybe we ought to call somebody, the police or oh, some neighbor. Oh, don't neighbors. be silly, Ellen. You act like a kid. Come on, let's go to bed, huh? Well, all right. I suppose it is silly. Jimmy, did you lock the door? Yeah, yeah. Can I turn out the lights now? Yeah. All right. Good night, Ellen. Sleep tight. Good night, Jim. <laughs> I don't know what time it was, perhaps an hour, perhaps only a half hour later. 
My mind was in that hazy borderland between sleep and a dream that's still part of consciousness. <coughs> then I was awake. <coughs> Helen, are you all right? Yes. Did you have a nightmare or something? No. I heard it too. Well, that didn't sound like any cat. Put on the light. Yeah. It, it seemed to be out there, Jim, in the house somewhere. I'm going to look into this. Jim, you be careful. Come on. Where's, where's my shotgun? In the den, I think. Jim. What? There, there's something wet. What? Wet? Running from under the closet door. Sticky. Uh, Ellen, don't. Don't touch it. I had to. Jim, it's blood. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Robert Taylor in the house in Cypress Canyon. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. These days before Christmas are busy ones indeed, yet smart hostesses everywhere find time for shopping and distinguished home entertaining later. The secret? Magnificent Grand Estate Wines. Presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, Grand Estate Wines add distinction to your hospitality on a moment's notice. Make your holiday welcome, effortless, and in perfect taste. The brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate wines please discriminating people everywhere. For Grand Estate wines, limited bottlings by Roma, are born of choicest grapes, then patiently guided to superb taste richness by Roma Vintner skill, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources. Delight your guests with Grand Estate California wines for entertaining medium sherry, ruby port, or golden muscatel. For dining, burgundy or sauterne. So insist on grand estate wines and enjoy the crowning achievement of vintner skill. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Robert Taylor as James A. Woods with Kathy Lewis as his wife Ellen in the house in Cypress Canyon. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. It cannot be too difficult to understand from the foregoing why I've taken the pains to set down in writing the events related here. To find in one's newly rented house a closet which cannot be opened is in itself certainly no great cause for alarm. But to be awakened in the stillness of the night by unearthly cries within that house, to find oozing from under that closet door something that is unquestionably blood, that's another matter. Perhaps others might have been braver than we. Suffice it only to say that we got out of the house in something very close to a panic and only returned when we had the moral support of two stalwart Los Angeles policemen. You uh, just moved in here, you say? That's right, officer. You can, you can see we're still unpacking. And the place has been empty right along before that? Yeah, I, I don't know much about that part of it. You could check all that with a real estate agent, though. Well, uh, <clears throat> where is this closet? Oh, it's it's right in here, officer. And and the blood, the blood is... Where? Where's the blood? Jim? Officer, I, I swear to you, there was blood on the floor less than an hour ago. I, I saw it. Uh-huh. It, it was running out from under that door. We heard that noise, and we got up, and then we saw it. The, the door was locked. Locked, huh? Oh, no, I... Well, it seems to be all right now. Hey, uh, you folks aren't trying to be funny, are you? Is, isn't there anything in it? No, ma'am, there is not. Look, officer, we're reputable people. You can call my firm. They'll tell you all about me. There's nothing wrong with this closet. Walls are solid, no trap doors. If you think I'm lying... You... I didn't say that, mister. Oh, you probably did hear some sort of a noise, and you got a little panicky, and... What, uh... what about the blood? It, it got on my hand. It isn't there now, is it? Yes. Where? I, I feel it. <laughs> now, you folks, just take it easy. You know, you're liable to hear all kinds of noises up in these canyons at night. 
You're uh, from the East, you say? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, officer. Ah, oh, that's all right. That's all right. If you have any real trouble, call on us any time. All right. Well, good night. Good night. Good night. Hey. <laughs> you ought to have this door fixed. That's enough to scare you. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to have it fixed. <laughs> say much about it after that. There wasn't much that could be said. The next day I went down to a lot and bought a little Christmas tree and some trimmings and we tried to pretend we were cheerful, but there was an uneasiness between us that had never been there before. Ellen seemed tired and listless. Several times during the day I noticed her washing her hands with a, with a brush, scrubbing the one that had touched the blood. That night we each took a sleeping pill and went to bed. sometime after midnight when I was suddenly wide awake and staring into the darkness. In some way, I, I knew at once and instinctively what had awakened me. Ellen was not in her bed nor in the room. The nameless thing I feared gripped at my heart until I could scarcely breathe. I opened the bedroom door and started through the house, putting on every light that I could find. There was not much to search, but I searched thoroughly. The, the living room, the kitchen, bathroom, day, and even the garage... And all the time, the dread of looking where I knew at last I must look. For I think I knew from the very first time where I'd find her. It must have been a full minute that I stood before that closet door. Then, I opened it. She stood there rigid, her arms at her sides, the fingers extended like claws. Her hair was over her face, her eyes stared out of it. Her lips were drawn back in a grin like an animal at bay. For a moment, I was frozen with the horror of it. And I stretched out my hand. Mm. Very deliberately, she turned her head and sunk her teeth until they met into the flesh of my forearm. I'd raised my hand to strike at her, but already she'd relaxed her hold and gone utterly limp. She would have fallen unless I'd caught her. I carried her into the bedroom and laid her on the bed. Strangely, at that moment, my only thought was how I might revive her. Until I saw that it was... It was not a faint, but a sleep that she'd fallen into. A sleep as deep and heavy as though she'd been drugged. And so I left her. But for me, that night, there was no sleep. Jim? Yes, Ellen? Oh, I, I got a little restless. I'd make some coffee. Oh. Oh. I had the most wonderful sleep. And I feel so rested. Do you? Mm-hmm. Jim. What? What's the matter with your arm? Oh, I I just heard it. Well, honey, it's it's terribly swollen. Let me see it. No, it, it's all right, Ellen. Oh, it isn't all right. You've got to see Dr. Wesley right away. Sure, I, I will. No, I now, will. you promise me, Jim, that you'll go the first thing this morning. How'd it happen? Oh, I, uh, th there was a dog. A dog? Yeah, I, I heard him trying to chew through the screen door. I went out to chase him away, and he bit me. Well, you mean there was all that racket, and I didn't even wake up? No, Ellen, you, you didn't even wake up. It was clear to me that Ellen knew nothing of what had transpired the night before. I went to my office that morning and made a pretense of going over routine business, if only to restore my mind to some semblance of calm by the sight and sound of common, familiar things. Pain in my arm had become a persistent, dull throbbing. I made a late appointment with Dr. Wesley. He treated my arm with something of an arched eyebrow, and he said, Well, I've never seen anything quite like it before. That is such a rapid onset of infection. It was dark when I left his office. I hadn't realized it was so late. Driving home, my car seemed, seemed sluggish until I saw the needle on the dashboard and realized that I was pushing it to the utmost of its speed. That I was racing home to prevent, prevent something before it was too late, before the darkness had conspired against me. 
for somehow I already knew with certainty that it was the darkness and the night that I had to fear. The curves of the canyon seemed endless. And then the cold fear leaped up inside me. My house, too, was dark. I went slowly up the stone steps from the road, looking, praying for some sign of light or light. There was none. The house was empty. Ellen was gone. I, I looked with the same self-torturing thoroughness, and in that closet first of all, knowing as I did so that it was hopeless. And so, alone in that empty house, I waited, powerless and helpless now, deadened in thought and will, empty as the house itself, save only for the overwhelming sense of a terrible foreboding. For some time in the early hours of the morning, I snapped on the radio, shortwave. Why? Surely a minor question now. I only know that I did. And then I heard it. Car 58, car 58, go to Laurel Canyon, the 4,000 block. A report that a man has been injured or attacked. Condition thought to be critical. Ambulance will follow. That is all. I was there almost before the police, edging my way through the little crowd, staring down at the man lying there in his white uniform under the street light. Yeah, the milkman, poor guy. I heard him scream, but when I got here, just like this, there's All nothing right, around to talk. Stand back, stand back. Please, please stand back. Well, you again. I, I heard it on the radio. I, I live just down the road. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, what happened? Well, take a look. Maybe you can tell us. He was dead. And he was lying on his back. And his throat had been torn out, as though by the fangs of some wild animal. It is now Christmas Eve, or rather Christmas morning, for it's a little after midnight. I've been waiting here, here in the stillness of this empty house for nearly 24 hours, waiting for the end. Already once tonight, I've heard that dreadful wailing cry somewhere in the hills. I've nailed up the closet door, but that I, I know is childish and useless. My arm is horribly swollen and turning black, but that's nothing. It's another end that I foresee, as, as surely as other men foresee the rising of the sun. I hear the cry again. It's nearer now. I shall leave these notes in a sealed envelope and put it in a shoebox in the hope that someone will give credence to these dark and terrible events if indeed such nameless horrors can ever yield to mortal understanding. As for myself, I feel no longer any fear or even sorrow. Only a desire that the end and the thing that I must do may come soon. And it will be soon, I know. Yes, but there is someone at the door. Someone at the door. Huh? What do you make of it, Sam? <laughs> it's quite a yarn. But what of it? That's what I thought. Now listen, that's not quite all of it. Huh? Clip to it's a newspaper clip. Listen. Hollywood, December the 26th. Police reported what was apparently a case of murder and suicide in Cypress Canyon sometime in the early hours of the morning. The victims were James A. Woods, a chemical engineer, and his wife, Ellen. Preliminary investigation indicates that Mrs. Woods was killed by the blast of a shotgun in the hands of her husband, who then turned the weapon upon himself. That she fought desperately for her life, however, was evidenced by the disorder of the room and the severe lacerations inflicted upon her husband about the neck and arms. This is the second tragedy to be reported in Cypress Canyon within 24 hours, the other being the unexplained death of Frank Polanski, a milkman. Well, no such murders or whatever they were ever occurred, if that's what's worrying you. The clipping, one. Have those things printed up, you know. No, no, it's not that, Sam. That story was found in an unfinished house in Cypress Canyon. No number, no nothing, just a framework. Uh-huh. Now that house is finished. When I drove by it today... But that's what stopped me, Sam, because it all fits. 
Now that it's finished, it is the house in the story, the same construction, the same vines and creepers on the lawn, even the same number. So what, a guy who knows roughly what this house is going to be like writes a yarn and loses it or something. Did he know the place was going to be listed for rental today, the Saturday before Christmas? <laughs> oh, Jerry, coincidence. Two bits you find the guy next door is a ghost story writer or something, and he's been wondering for a year what happened to that thing he wrote. Okay. Okay, coincidence. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sorry I bothered you, Sam. <laughs> Don't be silly. I liked it. It's a good yarn. Uh, that the uh, for rent sign you were talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put it up outside now. Uh-huh. Well, so long, Jerry, and Merry Christmas again. No, well, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I guess I was kind of silly, all right. Huh? <laughs> Listen, when a guy named uh, whatever it is, Woods, with a wife named Ellen comes in to rent that place from you, then you can start worrying. <laughs> yeah. Well, so long, Sam. So long, Jerry. Come in. Oh, we're sorry to bother you, but we just happened to see that for rent sign outside. Well, yeah, I hung it out just this minute. Is... is the house available? Oh, sure, sure it is. Let me introduce myself. My name is James A. Woods, and this is my wife, Ellen. How do Wow. Looks like it's fixing to... Yes, it does, doesn't it? Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Tonight's show marks the third birthday of Suspense on the Air, and this is Ken Niles asking our star of the evening, Robert Taylor, to help us celebrate. Why didn't you tell me before, Ken? If I'd only known, I'd have baked a cake. Well, Bob, all suspense parties are surprise parties. As an old hand on suspense, uh, you know that in our plays, the tables are usually turned on the star. So tonight, although it's our birthday, we're going to give you a present. Here it is, a gift basket of Grand Estate California wines from Roma, America's greatest vintner, to our distinguished anniversary guest, Robert Taylor. Thanks, Ken. You turn a nice table. And you can set a nice table with Grand Estate Burgundy in your basket, Bob. For Grand Estate Burgundy means rare dining pleasure adds memorable distinction to holiday dinner. Even everyday meals are outstanding in taste when Grand Estate Burgundy is served. Yes, all Grand Estate wines presented by Roma are limited bottlings of outstanding taste excellence. Well, that I know about Grand Estate wines, Ken. But did you know that for Grand Estate wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes? Then the ancient skill of Roma master vintners, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources guide the cuvee of this grape treasure to rich taste luxury. That's why discriminating wine users everywhere look to grand estate wines as the crowning achievement of vintner skill. Reason enough. And now, Ken, who's all set to star on Suspense next Thursday? It's that very wonderful actress and wonderful girl, Miss Susan Peters. Susan will appear as a young lady in straitened circumstances who finds herself mistaken for a very rich young lady and who is forced into continuing the deception with murder as a result. I'll certainly make it a point to listen. And uh, before I go, I'd like to thank this really great company of actors who have played with me tonight, and particularly Kathy Lewis, who played Ellen. Thank you, Bob. Tonight's original suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Susan Peters as star of Suspense. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight...
Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Ralph Edwards in Ghost Hunt, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, replace worn-out narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of those new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Your motor will idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save gas. These winning benefits are all made possible by a newly developed Autolite 10,000 ohm resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug, making practical a wider spark gap setting. And that's what does the trick. What's more, Autolite resistor spark plugs with this exclusive Autolite resistor have greatly increased electrode life and cut down on radio and television interference. So folks, see your Autolite dealer and have him replace old worn out narrow gap spark plugs with a set of the new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And also remember, the Autolite suspense show is now on television. Every Tuesday night in many parts of the country. And now, Autolite presents Ralph Edwards in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yeah, didn't that leave you high, huh? Left me feeling treetop tall. That was Louis Armstrong's I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And that's all we have time for on the Hot and Mellow Hour tonight. Yes, 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 this is Smiley Smith, your favorite disc jockey. I hope, I hope, booting the Hot and Mellow Hour home for this evening. I'll be back again tomorrow night, minus the music, but with a little surprise for you. Tomorrow night, Friday night, as you know, is stunt night here at station WXP. And have I got a stunt for you. Last week, if you remember, I planted my wire recorder in the steam room at a lady's Turkish bath and let you listen in on the playback, remember? <laughs> well, tonight, as soon as I leave the studio, do you know where I'm going? Hmm? Your friend Smiley is going to spend the night in a haunted house on a spook hunt. You heard me, a spook hunt in a haunted house. I'm bringing my little old wire recorder along with me, and if you tune in tomorrow evening at this time, you'll learn what it's like to spend a night in a haunted house. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah. A real haunted house. No kidding. Four people are known to have committed suicide there. So tune in tomorrow night and share a real thrill with your old pal Smiley, I must be crazy, Smith. Good night. <laughs> Care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? I got some cigars in the dash there. No. Well, no reason for you to carry a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Thorpe. Oh, really? Well, I don't like this fool stunt. Well, I don't see it as a fool stunt at all. I really don't. I think it's the only way you're going to unload this house. Ordinary selling methods won't work in a case like this. I don't forget the reputation saddling this house. Four suicides since 1939. You know what people call it. The death trap. Yes. It's a lot of nonsense. Sure, but try to convince people of that. Anyway, when this disc jockey offered me this chance to kill all the rumors about the death trap... About the property, I just naturally jumped and took him up at it. Especially since it don't cost a cent. You sure about that? I'm not liable for a penny. Not a cent. We're doing him a favor letting him use the place, he said. Thank me for the chance last night when I drove him out here. So one hand washes the other, as the feller says. He got a chance to pull off a stunt, and the wire recording will prove the people the property is A number one, and we increase the chance of selling the place. Well, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Not a thing. He's using his own recorder, and I'm paying for the rental of a couple of walkie-talkies he hooked up to it. Well, uh, what about this, uh, Reed? Does he charge anything? He comes gratis, too. Dr. Reed is a, uh, whatchamacallit, a psychic investigator. Belongs to a couple of societies that do nothing but hunt ghosts. <laughs> he showed me articles he's written about it in their magazine. Uh -huh. Well, here's the house. Yeah, looks real nice in the sunshine, don't it? Yeah, man, smell that sea breeze. You don't have to sell me. Well, let them know we're here. Yeah. Probably asleep up all night and everything. Why don't they come out? Do you think they've gone? Well, I told them last night I'd pick them up around 11. Uh, Smith! Smith! Hey, Smiley! 
Dr. Reed! Yeah, fast asleep, I guess. We better go in and wake him up. Of course, they may have taken the bus back to town. Oh, no, no. It's a two-mile hike to the main highway. Uh, Smith! Hey, uh, Smiley. Where are you? Wake up. You don't suppose, uh, do you? Oh, no, no. Uh, Smith! Uh, Dr. Reed! What's that, that, uh, clicking noise from in there? Well, it's his wire recorder. He left it running. These machines cost a lot of money. Doesn't he care if he uses up his batteries? Well, where is he, and where's this reed? Maybe they're upstairs. Uh, Smith? Hey, anybody home? They must have walked to the highway and taken the bus. Well, he wouldn't have left these machines. Well, where are they, then? Where are they? Now, now, don't get excited, Mr. Thorpe. Don't tell me not to get excited. If something's happened to them in my house, I'm liable. Well, you try this side. I'll try that one. All right. Uh, Smith. Hey, Smiley. Smith. Smith. Oh. McDonald. Come here. No, what? What it? Oh, no. Ree. Dr. Ree. No, no, don't touch him, Mr. Thorpe. You'll get your hands off. Look. Blood. Is he dead? I can still feel his pulse. We better get him to hospital fast. Uh, care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? No, no, thanks. Oh. Why not try to relax? The nurse said Reed would be all right as soon as he's had a blood transfusion. You told the radio station to be sure and call us as soon as they had any word about Smith? Yes, I told him. Uh, why don't you sit down? No, oh, I'm all at sixes and sevens. What do you suppose happened out there last night? Uh, we're going to know in just a second, just as soon as I can get this, this recorder set up. You don't suppose Smith and Reed got into a fight, do you? Yeah, there. Huh? A fight? I don't know. Well, what's wrong? Won't it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, take it easy. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. There. Testing. Listen. One, two, three. All set, Dr. Reed? Mr. McDonald? Hey? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is Smiley Smith speaking. Smiley Smith, the ghost hunter. I don't know whether to hope this will turn out to be a success for the sake of the program or a failure for my own sake. Anyway, all the preparations have been made now, and it's up to the spooks. I better tell you where we are. Right now, we're standing on the lawn of a house about 12 miles above Malibu Beach. The ocean is 100 feet away, straight down. The house is perched on a cliff, and there's a sheer drop of about 100 feet right into the old Pacific. Maybe you can hear the surf pounding. I'll turn up the volume. You hear it? Now, I'm going to have you meet two gentlemen who are here with me. Incidentally, we're the only people around for miles and miles. First, I'd like you to meet Dr. Clarence Reed of the British and American Psychical Research Guilds. Dr. Reed is a famous investigator of uh, psychic phenomena, and I'm very honored to be associated with him on this ghost hunt. He's smiling in an embarrassed sort of way. You're much too kind, Mr. Smith. Dr. Reed has conducted experiments in this field with such great believers in spiritualism as Oliver Lodge and Arthur Conan Doyle. He looks a bit like Santa Claus. He's short and stocky. You don't object, do you, Dr. Reed? Hmm? <laughs> no, 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 indeed. And he has a magnificent white beard, a truly great beaver. Dr. Reed is so enthusiastic about ghost hunting that he got out of a sick bed this evening to be with us. <laughs> Excuse me. My lungs. Mm -hmm. I was uh, gassed in the First World War. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Dr. Reed and I are here on the lawn looking at the house. Can't see much. It's around, oh, 11 p.m. now. Seems to be a rambling sort of house, two stories high. Since it was built, there have been four suicides here. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Now, in, into the mic, please. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> four suicides since 1939. I better tell them who you are so they won't think you're a ghost. Eh? Standing with the doc and me is a real estate agent, Mr. Charles McDonald. He handles his property, and he can tell you a lot more about it than I can. 
Well, the house was built by a man named Marcus, Toby Marcus, an orange grower. Built the house as a wedding present for his wife. A month after they moved in, she took her own life. On the day of her funeral, he committed suicide the same way. There have been two other cases since then, and did, I... Did they all uh, jump into the ocean? Yeah, yeah, all four of them, right over there. Yeah. The last one was actually seen doing it about three years ago. He was seen running like all get out the edge of the cliff, and he was shouting and laughing and yelling as though there was people at his side running right along with him. You kidding? No, it's a fact. He was laughing and yelling and running, and when he got to the edge, uh, right over there, huh? he jumped and never came above water. <laughs> as good an argument against cold baths as ever I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, people just refuse to live in this house. Silly, I call it. Anyway, if you and Dr. Reed find any sign of a spook, I'll advise the owner to pull the house down and rebuild. But if you don't find anything, I'm hoping this will convince folks that here's a real buy. Yeah, okay, Mr. Smith, you and the doctor on your own. I'll be by in the morning to pick you up around 11. Goodbye, Mr. McDonald. I hope yeah. there's something left for you to pick up in the morning. <laughs> well, it's almost pitch black, folks, and I guess Dr. Reed and I ought to begin. I don't believe in ghosts, never have, but what I say is this. If you're dead set on looking for them, this is a dandy place to do it. So long! Mr. McDonald just checked out, and then there were two. Well, three. Oh, my dog, yeah. Uh, folks, I have my dog, Jeff, with me. He's a wire-haired terrier, three years of age, and he can talk. Yeah, say hello, Jeff. Come on, Jeff, say hello. Come on. Well, uh, anyway, he's a wire-haired terrier, and he's three years old. Uh, shall we go inside now, Dr. Reed? I was about to suggest it. Now, uh, how do we hunt ghosts, Doctor? How do we do it, huh? Well, we don't really hunt them. If there should be any in the house, they will come to us. Now, how cozy. And please, uh, not ghosts. Do not refer to them as ghosts. We know them as apparitions. I'll remember. I've no desire to hurt their feelings. Where ghosts are concerned, I say live and let live. <laughs> well, we've opened the front door now. Maybe you heard the hinge squeak a little. Now we're standing here looking in. Can't see much. <laughs> Smells sort of musty and damp. The... What's the matter, Jeff? What's the matter, boy? Jeff. Oh, come on now. Come on. My dog seems to object to entering this house. He has all four feet braced and he's straining against the leash. Perhaps he senses something we don't. Like apparitions, maybe? Perhaps. It's not unusual. Animals lack the veneer of sophistication we humans possess and are more sensitive to such ammunition. Yeah, come on, Jeff. Now, stop this nonsense. He probably smells a mouse or rat or something. Come on, Jeff. We're going in whether you like it or not. Well, there's a short entrance hall, and over there at the end of it is a flight of stairs leading to the second floor. Jeff! And uh, over here at the left is what seems to be a large reception room. We're entering this large room now. There are windows over there, French windows, and through them I can see the ocean. The electricity hasn't been turned on, so all I have to see by is a flashlight. Not a very powerful one at that. Dr. Reed is now adjusting his walkie-talkie. It's hooked up to my recorder so that he can cut in while he's hunting and tell us what he's found. Here's a few words from Doc before he sets forth on his investigation through the house. Ladies and gentlemen... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Smith has introduced me as a ghost hunter. He spoke, I think, in a spirit of skepticism and, and levity... I'd like to assure you all that my purposes here are serious. I have spent my entire life seeking reliable proof of the appearances of apparitions. Mm. Have you ever seen any, ever? I have seen phenomena which lead me to believe in the possibility of their existence, although I have never seen any. I account myself sensitive to the evidence of their existence. This house, for example, affects me profoundly. It doesn't seem to affect you in the same way. I'm not too happy about all this, if that's what you mean. You are not psychic and therefore not sensitive to these matters as I am. I imagine the question in the minds of those of you listening to us is, shall we find apparitions? I don't know. But I feel they are here and that they are evil. I sense danger. I shall soon know. Dr. Reed's leaving the room now to make a tour of the house. First thing I'm going to do is open the windows and let some fresh air in. Ah, it feels better already. Cooler anyway. I know that. Out! What was a bat? A, ba a bat just flew flew into the room. I I think it's a bat, not a bird. I didn't actually see it. Just its its shadow as it fanned my face. There it is again. It touched me as it passed. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff, 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 come back here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Doctor Reed. Doctor Reed. Dr. Reed! For 
Suspense. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ralph Edwards in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, oh, uh, I'm reading a letter about the new Wide Gap Autolite Resistor spark plugs, Hap. Oh. It's from Mrs. Clark Perry right here in Hollywood. She says, our 1948 station wagon has given constant trouble. Finally, the garage man said all the difficulty was spark plugs, and he installed a set of Autolite Resistor spark plugs. Now the car runs beautifully. The very first time my husband has been really pleased. Well, smart garage man. Smart people to take his advice. Hap, you know, as more and more people learn about wide gap, auto light resistor spark plugs, and how they make an engine idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save on gas, why then more people will replace old, worn out, narrow gap spark plugs with sensational new wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs. Any more letters like that, Harlow? Plenty, Hap, plenty. Why, here's another one from New York City. Oh, uh, read it to me later, Harlow. We haven't time because here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ralph Edwards as Smiley Smith in Ghost Hunt, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff, Jeff, come back here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Dr. Reed, Dr. Reed, Dr. Reed. Reed speaking. What is it, Smith? Uh, Jeff has run off. My dog, he, he jumped through the window and ran off. Oh, so? I told you he sent something about this house, didn't I? Yeah, you want to come and see if you can determine what it was exactly that set him off? Uh, soon. I'm making my way slowly up the stairs toward the second floor now. I'm halfway up. I'll be down with you soon. Uh, folks, my dog's run away. You probably heard him howling. He jumped through the window and took off. Never did anything like that before. Frightened by the bat, I guess. Personally, alone here in this big room, I can understand how he must have felt. This isn't a cheerful spot by any means. I may not be psychic, but I sure have a feeling this house doesn't want us here. Read again. <coughs> Excuse me. I have something of great interest to report. I'm now standing in an alcove on the second floor trying to recover my breath. As I reached the head of the stairs, I felt what I think is a definite psychic manifestation. I felt suddenly as though I had been punched in the solar plexus. That's the only way I can describe it. At the same time, I began to perspire. Uh, my head is still swimming slightly, uh, and I have difficulty in swallowing. My pulse rate is around 110 in a minute. The sense of evil is very strong. I feel very, uh, what shall I say, profoundly depressed. Do you want me up there? Uh, no, I prefer to remain up here alone. The presence of a disbeliever such as you might interfere with my investigation. Folks, I'd like you to get a picture of what it's like here. Very quiet, for one thing. I've never been in such a quiet place. And it's pretty dark. No light except my flashlight. Tell you what, you go now and douse all the lights you have on. Go ahead, put out the lights, and that'll give you a clearer feeling of how it is here with me. Go ahead, put out the lights. Hey, did, did you hear that? <laughs> Real estate agent told me I'd probably hear rats and mice in the walls. Well, I can certainly hear them now. Even you can hear them, I think. It's as though... Dr. Reed speaking... I've been working my way toward the front room, the one directly above the one in which Mr. Smith is now. The vibrations have become stronger and more and more pronounced as I approach it. I think I am on the verge of an important discovery. Important discovery. Did you get that? Now I can hear Dr. Reed moving about in the room above. I don't suppose you can. Have a try anyway, huh? Hear him? I hope he finishes his investigation soon because... Quite frankly, I'd like to get out of here. I can well imagine people becoming unhinged in this place. Right now, I find myself pretty jumpy. Not being very brave, am I? It's being alone in this room down here that does it. This, this darned old house, it's, it's a very, I mean, you know, the atmosphere, it's so very... I wish only to make this hurried report before continuing with the investigation in this room. I have carefully sounded out all the parts in this room, and the emanations are most strong from what appears to be a closet before which I am now standing. As soon as I open the door to this closet, I will have, I think, a thing of great interest to communicate. I find no key to the lock, and so I will attempt to remove the hinges with my penknife, and I will tell you what I find when I open it. I'll tell you what it would cost to get me to open that door. In the basement at Fort... Ah, there's that 
bat again. It seems to like me the way it, it keeps... Each, each time it passes, it touches my face or my neck with its wings. <laughs> Smelly things, bats. I don't suppose they bathe very often, if at all. I wonder how... Get the way you bat! That bat'll be the death of me. It's like a jingle, isn't it? Bat'll be the death of me, the death of me, the death of me. Bat'll be the death of me. It isn't far from London. No, that isn't the way it goes. It's uh, come down to um, Q in lilac time, in lilac time, in lilac time. Come down to Q in lilac time. It isn't far. I haven't thought of that since I was a kid in grammar school. Gee, I had a lonely childhood when you come right down to it. I mean, uh, oh, that's my affair, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It well, certainly is. I have succeeded in removing the hinges to the door, and I find inside it is not a closet, but much larger. It is, I think, a dressing room. I have not yet been inside, but I am about to enter. Uh, what was I talking about? Uh... Oh, yeah, bats. Well, the bat flying back and forth in this room is... Did you hear that? Did, did you hear it? Dr. Reed must have knocked something over in the dressing room. A chair, a chair, yeah, a heavy chair by the sound of it. The chair, or whatever it was, must have fallen right, right over my head. That's the way it sounded. I, I, I can see a small stain forming right on the ceiling, right, right over my head. <gasps> Something ran across my foot just there. A rat, I think it was. I've always hated rats. Most people do, of course. That stain up there bothers me. It, it's gotten so big so soon. I think I'll take a chance and bother Reed and ask him what it is. Dr. Reed. Reed, can you hear me? Are you all right? Hello? Well, he didn't answer. I, I, I think he's just a little bit deaf. I think so. What do you suppose he's found, huh? I'm afraid this is rather dull for you listeners. I, I'm not finding so, of course. There. Hey, I, I heard him cough. Did you hear that cough? Hope he's all right. He's, he, he got out of a sick bed to come here this evening, you know. He was gassed in the First World War, and this place is beginning to get on my nerves a wee bit. Just a teensy-weensy bit. <laughs> Reed, speaking, I... Hello? He switched off. That's a bad cough he's got. I feel so lonely. I've been alone so much in my life. Not so much now, of course, but when I was younger, I was alone so much of the time, you know, struggling to get ahead, living in a hall, bedroom, wondering where my next meal is coming from. I get the blues just remembering it. Seem sad, young people having to spend so much time alone. Sad for old people, too, of course. I'm saying of course a lot. Of course I am. Hey, that stain on the ceiling, it's grown amazingly. It, it, it's actually beginning to drip. I mean, form bubbles. They'll start dropping soon. Colored bubbles, they seem to be. Odd-shaped stain, like a, a, a body lying on its back with its arms stretched out. <laughs> it's cheerful. <laughs> oh. I'll certainly advise Mr. McDonald to have this place pulled down. I'll go upstairs in a minute or two to see how Dr. Reed's making out. You know, listeners, I, I really believe I'd go completely crazy if I had to stay here much longer. Wears you down. That's exactly what it does. It wears you down. It's so close and musty in here. I feel sort of trapped. <laughs> Don't know why I said that. That's, that's what they call this place, you know, the death trap. There, what did I tell you? That stain started to drip drops. Drip drops, drip drops, drip drops. Drip. I'll catch the next one in my hand. Let's... <gasps> Reed! Dr. Reed! I'm, I'm going upstairs now, listeners. I'm, I'm afraid something has happened to Dr. Reed. I'm not kidding now. I mean, this is on the level. I, which room could it be now? Right? Left, no, right, right. This is it, I think. Well, <laughs> oh, evening, gentlemen. And, and madam, I'm so glad to see you. I, I, I was just aching to see somebody. Anybody. I, I've been so lonely down there. Uh, what have you done with the doctor, huh? I know, I know he's been hurt. See the color of the bubble on my hand? What have you done with him? Make way, please, gentlemen, make way. Well, <laughs> well this isn't the, the funniest darn thing. <laughs> this can't be Dr. Reed lying here. He didn't have a red beard. Now, don't crowd me, gentlemen. Don't, don't crowd me, please. Huh? You want me to go where with you? You want me to do what? Speak up, gentlemen. To the cliffs. Down to the cliffs? You mean right now? <laughs> well, well, all right, if you'll come with me. I don't want to be alone anymore. You will come with me? All of you? All four of you? You too, ma'am? Oh, good. Come on, then. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the... He jumped over the cliff. He jumped over the cliff, McDonald. He jumped over... The... Mr. McDonald, Mr. Thorpe, you may come in to see Dr. Reed now. What? Uh-huh. Dr. Reed is conscious. You may see him now. 
Is is he able to talk? Just for a few minutes. In here. Come in. Come in, gentlemen. How are you, Dr. Reed? We've been waiting to see you. Yes, and I must apologize, gentlemen. I had a most unfortunate accident. Hemorrhage. A hemorrhage? Yes. My lungs, you know. Now, gentlemen... Hemorrhage? Dr. Reed, what happened in that house? What happened to Smith? We've just been listening to a playback of the recordings you made out there. Smith? Well, isn't he with you? We've just heard the recording, Dr. Reed. Smith jumped over the cliff, into the ocean. Oh, that poor boy. Dr. Reed, will you please tell us what happened? We heard on the recording there were ghosts in that house. Ghosts? I didn't see any ghosts. But Smith, what about him? If he went over the cliff, it was fear that drove him over. But, Doc... Gentlemen, I didn't see any ghosts. As for that unfortunate young man, who can say now what he saw? Or thought he saw? <laughs> Thank you, Ralph Edwards, for displaying your versatility by appearing as guest star on Suspense. Say, Harold, that Edwards does everything. Uh Uh-uh, half. No does. Don't use that word on our Autolite show. Oh, come now, Harlow. I can make you use that word, as you call it. How? (laughs) Now, don't you say that Autolite resistor spark plugs make your car engine idle smoother? Yes, but... And your car gives better performance on leaner gas mixtures. Saves gas. Sure does. I mean, do. (laughs) I mean, does. (laughs) Aren't we devils? (laughs) Ah, Ralph, you tricked me. Well, anyhow... It does my heart good to tell people that Autolite resistor spark plugs are ignition engineered by Autolite, which makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, spark plug wire, battery cable, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly Work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. The lifeline of your car. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now here again is Ralph Edwards. I want to thank Tony Leader and his great cast of actors for helping to make my appearance on Suspense a very pleasant consequence. (laughs) Like all of you, I'm a great suspense fan, and I'm looking forward to next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died, another gripping study in Suspense. Tonight's suspense play was adapted for radio by Walter Newman from an original story by H.R. Wakefield with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Make it a point to listen next Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Remember next Thursday, same time here, Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Burt Lancaster in The Long Wait, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Over the river and through the woods to Grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh. Hey, that's not the way hurrah for Thanksgiving Day goes. What do you mean? Why, I wrote it. No matter. The 1950 version is different. Listen. Over the river and through the woods, the snow is soft and white. 
Grandpa is happy with his jalapy. His spark plugs are Autolite. Over the river and through the woods blow high, ye winds blow low. The car is as snappy as Grandma and Pappy. Because Autolite resistor spark plugs get it going faster in cold temperatures. Give smooth, even spark all along the line of fire. Let your engine idle smoother, run better on leaner gas mixtures. Save gas. Wait a minute. These last lines don't rhyme. Why, sure they do. Your car and Autolite resistor spark plugs are always in rhyme. In fact, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the long wait and with the performance of Burt Lancaster, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. When I stepped off the train at Grand Central, I spotted Len Bush waiting for me. All the heat of my body sucked into my head. I knew that feeling. I felt that way every time I wanted to kill a man. He waved to me. I turned my back and I started up the ramp to the upper level in the street. He caught up to me and he kept pace with his long, shuffling loaf. Don't get me wrong, Jan. I don't want to hound you. Then why begin, Lieutenant? Something you said to the warden before you left. You want to repeat on it? I told him I'd be back for the limit. In this town, we don't even like guys to steal apples off push carts. So when it comes to you murder... You can't touch me. I served my full time. I'm clean. We just got to sit back and wait for it to happen. Your brother died two years ago. Oh, everybody's cooled off. Why don't you let it lay? I don't cool so easy. If Richie could come back, he'd say, forget it. Don't tell me what my brother would say. All right, all right, I won't. I don't know why I butt into other people's affairs anyway. It's not my job to worry about things before they happen. You'll be the first to know, Lieutenant. You're a jerk if you put your neck in a noose to rub out a dame like Lois Williams. So long, Dan. I waited until he was swallowed in the crowd. Then I went across and down Park until I made the Coronet Hotel on 40th Street. Dan Vettel? Oh, yes. Mr. Thompson reserved a room for you. Yeah. 423. The elevator was an old cage that pulled itself upward, like an old man with asthma climbing stairs. I caught the reflection of my face in the panel mirror of the cage. Three years housekeeping with the state had left a mark. A little paler, maybe. Serene was the word for me. That's the way the reporter put it. The serene countenance of an alabaster saint showing no trace of the killer rampant under the shell. Only I hadn't killed anyone. Yet. I got out of the elevator and I found 423. Inside, I made for the bathroom. I felt under the wash tank. The gun was there. Shorty Thompson had it taped neatly in place, just like he'd promised. I pried it loose. I heard someone at the door. I yanked it open. Lois Williams came in. Not exactly came in. She sort of slithered in along the wall and hung there like a busted balloon. The little rat was as beautiful as ever. The scared look in her eyes made them brighter, greener. She was wearing one of those curved gowns that she used to design for herself and was pointed up neat and tidy. She stared at the gun in my hand in a kind of a, a, kind of a glad, hungry way. Or I'd save you the trouble of coming for me. I'd have found you. But thanks anyway. What are you waiting for? I don't know. Go ahead. Kill me. Don't hurry me. Go ahead. You want me dead and I don't want to live. You want to die. That's why you came to me. There's one thing, Dan, about Richie. I didn't think he'd kill him. You figured he'd enjoy looking at his wife and kids through bars for the next ten years, huh? I've lost every friend I had because of that. Nobody will speak to me, have anything to do with me. I can't get a job either. No club will hire me. They're all afraid of me. Well, what do you expect? They all knew how I felt about my brother. By the way, how is Tim Grady? I'm going to look him up, too. That's a kick. I ratted on Richie to save Tim, and then he shook me loose. He didn't want anything to do with a squealer, he said. And you still love that dirty... It took him to make you miserable enough to want to die, huh? All right, so now you know. No job, no friends, no Tim. I got nothing to live for. My brother had everything to live for, and you... He killed himself. That saved the postmortem till after you do the job. This was the dame who caused my brother's death. But she wasn't scared. She was begging for it. Something was wrong. She came closer to me. She looked up at me with that... that haunted thing all over her. Desire for an end of life. I thought of her suddenly dead, still looking like that. I couldn't do it. It wasn't right. I put my gun back in my pocket. She saw me do it. Even when I try to get myself killed, I fumble. I'll take care of it myself. Hey, watch it, you crazy little... Come here. Oh, I... I'm allergic to people jumping out of windows, especially out of a room registered as my name. Come here. Why? 
Why did you stop me? <laughs> you always were a high-strung game. Now go on, go home. Go home and sleep it off like it was a jag. I don't have a home. <laughs> You really don't, huh? I've got nothing. I told you, I've got nothing. No. No, it's no fun this way. Oh, well. Wait a minute. I'll take you to a room in the hotel. Here. Here, have a drink. You'll feel better. Hey. Lois. Lois, I'd like to help you. You help me? Why? To tell you the truth, I don't know. But I know what Richie meant to me. I was with him when he died. I, I heard the way he called your name. Oh, Dan, listen to me. Before I... you became a singer, you were, uh, you were a dress designer. Oh, what does that prove? Well, it proves your troubles are over if you want them to be. The only way my troubles will be over is for you to use that gun. There's a way that doesn't hurt so much. The nerve doc says there's nothing like starting your own business or cracking a safe to get your mind off trouble. What do you know about psychiatry? Nothing. But I know plenty about cracking safes. And I understand business is almost the same thing. Go into business. I haven't got a dime. I'll supply the coin. We'll be partners. Yeah? And what? The dress business. Dress business? <laughs> the boys would laugh you out of town. Nobody laughs at Dan Verrill. Well, come on. What do you say? Partners? I haven't designed a dress for you yet. Oh, it'll come back to you. Once you're in business, you're sure to make a lot of new friends. Get a new slant on life. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll talk to the old gang into giving you a break again. If things are going smooth, you'll be happy again. You think so? I looked at her a minute. And then I put across the clincher. Lois, I'll bet even Tim Grady comes back. I was always baffled by the effect a guy could have on a dame. I watched Hope push some of the unhappiness off her face. Mentioned the guy and the dame's heart changes places with her brain. She hesitated a second. I'll give it a try. Now, do you think you can make it past bridges and open manholes, or do you need protection? I'm all right now. After all, we're partners. I raised 20 grand, and Lois went all out spending. She threw herself into the job with all she had, and she had plenty. She was going to open on Madison Avenue. I spent a lot of time with Lois, talking dress shop. She took me to spot to, well, you know, to check style. The dog show, the art galleries, the opera. She was beginning to show signs of wanting to live again. A month after we became partners, she told me. Well, we can open tomorrow, Dan, except that, well, I... Let's have it, Lois. The money's all run out. And, Dan, we have to advertise and get a sales for it. What'll it take? Five thousand. Oh, three thousand. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, Dan. She kissed me. And I fought down the chill that sent along my spine. I said, I want you to be happy, Lois. I went over to the Emerald Club on 60th to raise the money. I stayed away from the old spot till now. Lou Henry, who owned the place, glad-handed me when I walked in. Hey, Dan Farrell. Where you been, boy? Oh, round and about. Yeah, you're awful early, Dan. Tables don't open until 10. I need five grand, Lou. Five grand? Without even a hello to soften me up? I need it, Lou. I figured you'd let me have it. The past favors. Oh, sure, Dan. Don't mean no more to me than my right arm. <laughs> Thanks. Be seeing you. Hey, Dan. What are you? Your brothers is out there at the bar. Shorty Thompson. Oh, thanks again. I'd like to see Shorty. Another one, bartender. Hello, Shorty. Huh? Oh, you, huh? Hey, you're in business, Dan. Something real imaginative, huh? Yeah, legitimate, too. Ladies gone. Ain't that a riot? <laughs> Shorty was drunk. I don't like to talk to drunks. I was going to leave when I saw who the guy was on the other side of, the sh of Shorty. It was Lieutenant Len Bush. Shorty turned his back on me and spoke to him. This guy is Richie Varrell's brother, as though you didn't know. A few years ago, the joke was on you, Lieutenant. You put Dan away for sticking up a jewelry store. You didn't really believe Dan Varrell had pulled anything as crude as that. It was Richie who'd done it. But Big Brother here took the rap. Shut up, Shorty. Used to be sort of a gag with the boys. If Richie got shot, Danny Boy would do the bleeding for him. <laughs> everybody knew that Richie was one in a million. Everybody knew that Danny Boy would die for the kid. Yeah, I'm going to let you in on the secret, Bush. Danny Boy's partner is the dame who killed Richie Varro. You're drunk, shorty. Get away from me, you rat. 
turned back to the bar and I kept my temper in my pocket. If Shorty kept talking like that, it wouldn't be healthy for him and I didn't want to do anything to him. He was Richie's best friend. Two more of Richie's friends walked in while I was downing my drink. Gus Manning and Tommy Algo. I put my glass down and I started to leave. Just a minute, then. What's on your mind? The way I get the news, you and Lois have teamed up. Yeah? That's all I want to know, you fake. Hey, hold it, Gus, hold it. Maybe Dan's got it scrambled. Lieutenant, Lois Williams is a dame who pinned the rap on Richie, ain't she? Any newspaper morgue will give you the answer. Look, I know she testified against him. And you know she lied about your brother to save Tim Grady. I know. Well? All right. Lieutenant, the boys and I want to have a little talk. Okay, Dan, it's your funeral. We all watched Len put on his hat and walk out. I put my back up against the bar so none of them could get behind me. Well, what are we waiting for? Right, right. 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 Cut it out, you guys. Cut it out. Dan, you okay? Yeah. What happened? Boys don't like me just now. They want to keep me from making a girl happy. Yeah, yeah, the girl responsible for your brother's death. Yeah, that's right. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Burt Lancaster in The Long Wait, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now it's time for my Thanksgiving fairy tale. Last night, my car called me out to the garage. Harlow, I don't feel good. I think you ought to do something about it. Well, open your hood and say, ah. Ah. Ooh, your spark plugs need replacing. I'll buy you a new set of Autolite resistor spark plugs with the exclusive Autolite 10,000 ohm built-in resistor. Gosh, Harlow, would you? That's better than turkey on Thanksgiving. Just think how I'll run. Yes, you'll start faster in cold temperatures with Autolite resistor spark plugs. Give smoother idling and better performance on leaner gas mixtures, which means you'll even save me gas. And the neighbors will be thankful because they know Autolite resistor spark plugs reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. I know all that, so why? Well, I hustled up a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs, and those eyes, I mean those Autolite bullseye headlights, lit up with joy. You're a good boss, Harlow. Now, the moral is, if you want your car to thank you for helping it run better, see your Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace old, worn-out, narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of the sensational new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage... Our star, Burt Lancaster, with Betty Lou Gerson in The Long Wait, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I sent the five grand to Lois so that she could open the doors while I went after business. And I knew where to get it. Nobody spends dough on a dame like a hood when he's loaded. On Thursday, the Third National Bank was held up. Friday morning, I, I knocked on a door on 8th Avenue. Who is it? Me, Dan Varrell. Uh, busy now, Dan. Some other time. Hello, t- hello, Tony. Oh, hello, Glenda. Hello. What do you want, Dan? You knocked over the Third National. What is this, a hijack? No. Your dame looks like she needs a lot of clothes. Up till last night, I figured on getting plenty of touch. What are you two talking about? I'm in the dress business, Tony. Tell the other boys, too. I want all the dames buying their clothes from Lois Williams. <laughs> sure. What do I care where they buy them? <laughs> The next day, I ran into Numbers Johnson. He ran the policy racket on the east side. I don't have a dame, Dan. You know that. Yeah, I know. It's about time you gave your wife a break. Yeah, about buy her clothes now. She'll expect me to every time I hit. That's the idea. Do you see it my way, or do no, I... I don't figure it. You, in the dress business. Well, if I keep happy in the dress business, I'll stay out of the numbers business. Which way do you want to play? Uh, the doll will get some new duds. <laughs> Once the ball started rolling, it became a mountain. Lois knew all the angles on female frills. Her clientele was strictly 10th Avenue, but she turned them out on a Long Island, and they loved it. One dame tells another, and in no time at all, the shop is jammed with customers. It was a crime the way the dame spent the dough the hoods go to to make so much trouble to collect. Lois glowed like a firefly. She was a complete businesswoman. She loved being surrounded with dolls who bounced in and out with business of the shop, business that must have Madame's attention. I asked her during a lull. You happy, Lois? 
Yes, sir. Almost completely. I do miss the old gang, though. Oh, come in. Pardon me, Miss Williams. There's a Mrs. Verrill outside. Oh. She wants to see Mr. Verrill. Mrs. Verrill? Oh. Richie's wife, June. She was supposed to be in the mountains with the kid. That's why I sent her money. I didn't want her to know about this. She was waiting for me on the street. She had a roll of bills in her hand, and she threw it at my feet. The roll bounced against the storefront. I saw the rubber band snap off it, and the bills unwrap like a... Like a sigh of relief. You think I'd take your money now? Now? Well, what do you mean? You and Lois. Okay, so it's tainted money. But you got a kid, you need it. You thought a lot of Richie, didn't you? As much as you did. Oh, no, much more. When Richie had pneumonia, I remember how hard you took it. During the crisis, you wouldn't eat or drink or talk. I remember thinking if Richie dies, Dan will die too. Take the money for the kid. You loved Richie. And now you're sponsoring that woman with his blood. Uh, uh, June, wait. Nobody was going to keep me from doing what I wanted. Not Len Bush following me around, or Shorty Thompson hating my guts, or Richie's wife itching to kill me. I'd given Lois back an urge to live. I swore I was going to make her happy, and I was on first base. She had a going business. Lois's old gang hung out in the village, the bolo room. Richie, Lois, and Tim Grady used to pal around with the musicians who played the spot. They used to wait until closing time, and then huddle with the jive artists until morning. When Lois and Tim double-crossed Richie, the, the other kids cut Lois out of their hair, and Tim Grady left town. That night, I went down to the bowler room to get Lois's friends back for her. I walked in just as the last paying customers left. The kids were getting set for a jam session when they spotted me. The place became full of hush. They glared at me, hating me, but not daring to open their mouths. I picked a menu up off the table and I laid it on the bar. I pulled a pencil out of my pocket. I said, I'm giving a party for Lois Williams. You're all invited. Saturday night, Gold Room, Carnet Hotel. Whitey Jones? Yeah? I'm putting you down, plus your dame and three guests. Suppose I can't make it. (laughs) Throw away your piano. You'll never play it with broken hands. Phil Blass? You, your dame, and three friends. And your horn. Well? Okay, yeah, sure, Danny, sure. Jerry Barton, Mel Foley. What? Joe Ward, mm-hmm. Les Seltzer. Your dames and three friends. Okay. okay. Right. And make sure that Lois knows that you're all tickled to death to see her. I'll be checking you off as you come in. I'll be seeing you at 7 o'clock. It was Friday, the day before the party. Hello? Hello, Dan. Yeah? This is Lou Henry, down at the Emerald Club. Yeah. Look, I don't want you to think I'm buttoning into your affairs, Dan, but well, knowing how you feel about Lois. Yeah? Well, June, your brother's wife's been down here talking to Shorty Thompson. So what? She talked Shorty into rubbing out Lois. What? He's on his way now. Remember who told you, Dan? As I dialed, my body caught on the flash. If Shorty touched Lois now, being a buddy of Richie's wouldn't help him. The same went for June. Give me Miss Williams. I'll connect you with her office. Come on, snap it up, snap it up. I'm ringing, sir. Come on, Lois, answer, come on. Miss Williams' office? Put Lois on. She's not in. Who's calling me? It's me, Dan Varrell. Where'd she go? Mr. Varrell? You just called, Mr. Varrell. What do you mean, I just called? Well, someone called, said it was you, and spoke to Miss Williams. I wonder why they do that. Well, never mind that. What did he he say? Uh, Miss Williams always goes to the Museum of Art at this time of day to copy designs. She made an appointment to meet you. I I mean, the man who called at the museum. She just left. I didn't wait for the elevator. I took the stairs three at a time going down. I came out on the street. A cab was idling on the other side of the avenue. I cut through the traffic to get to it. I hopped into the cab, and for five bucks, the hacky crashed lights all the way. I was at the museum in nothing flat. When I entered the building, it was quiet as a mall. I cursed myself for not asking what room Lois would be in. Here, here, you can't run here. Uh, did you see a girl with, a, with drawing papers and crayons, tall, beautiful, well-stacked? I see hundreds of them. Well, where would she go to, to draw designs? Well, the armor room, maybe, the Egyptian room, or the famous paintings. Second floor. I had visions of a dead in some corner. I thought of her all twisted in the heat. I hit the Egyptian room in a run, and I stopped short. Lois was standing at the other end. She was behind a mummy case. And on the other side of it was Shorty. He had a knife in his hand. They didn't see me. I sneaked up on them, and I watched Lois fighting Lord, to move her lips. Please. Ain't fit to live. Please, please, Shorty. Lois, run. Run to me. Dad! Dad! Here it is. I hate to do this, Shorty. 
Lieutenant. Dad, he tried to kill me. He Tough to keep to up me. with you, Dan. Still with me, eh, Lieutenant? I always keep an eye on my friends. <laughs> Who's this laying here? Oh, Shorty oh, Thompson. Dad. You better take him in. He tried to kill Miss Williams. Yeah, I guess it better. Come on, Lois. Oh, by the way, Bush. Huh? You better pick up June Barrel, too. She was in on it. In case you don't know who she is, she's my sister-in-law. With June and Shorty out of the way for a while, nothing was going to upset things now. The party Saturday night in the gold room was a big success. Every time somebody tried to make a break for home, I, I beat them to the exit and insisted they stay. The place was full of smiles and how to do. And only Lois didn't know they were phony. She was a dream in a green, backless evening gown. Held up by a deep breath and an anxious look. She bubbled around, greeting people. Hey, thank you. I enjoyed it. Lois. Dan, where have you been hiding? No place. Tell me, Lois. You happy? Dan. Just be happy. That's all I ask. Just be happy. I'm doing my best, Dan. Is there any guy here you like? Anybody? Uh, there's just one guy for me, Dan. He's not here. But he is. He's back what? in town. He's at the Sphinx Hotel. Tim. Yeah. Lois, I think I'll drop over and see him now. Dan, you're not going to do anything? Don't worry, Lois. I'm going to fix everything. She had her job, her friends. Just one thing more. Just Tim Grady to make the picture complete. The Sphinx Hotel was over in 6th Avenue. I walked. I wanted time to cool off. I wanted to do things right. Yes? Mr. Grady's room? One moment, please. Yeah? This is Dan Barrow. Uh, Dan? Yeah, remember? That's 3 a.m., Dan. I won't take much of your time. Won't tomorrow do? I'm coming up now. Come in. I pushed open the door and I went in. I was standing by the bed. He was wearing a monogram black robe over some fleshy yellow pajamas. He glad-handed me. Come in, Dan. Come on in. Have a cigarette? I took one and I watched him going through hard times trying to light it for me. I let him Get sweat on. for a while and then pulled out my light, lit my cigarette and shoved the lighter under his face so I could light his. I couldn't stand still. He moved around the room like a, like a cat on hot coals. He was a big, good-looking chick, broad shoulders with all the trim, curly hair, dimple on his chin. I just got back, hot on the coast. That's the place to be, Dan. You never saw anything like it. Boy, the things that go on in L.A. <laughs> Someday... You... Light someplace. And you say, Dan... Lois is a great dame. She sure is, Dan. She sure is. Anybody says different should get slugged. Yeah. Listen, Dan, there never was anything between me and Lois. Anybody says different, they're no good liar. We were just good friends. We hardly ever even wanted. Relax. Here, you and Lois are partners. Yeah. She must be pretty near the happiest girl in town. Pretty near. Huh? You know, when I first saw Lois a few months ago, she was all set to kill us. Oh, wait a minute, Dan. I tell you. Sit I just... down, Tim. You make me nervous. Nobody's blaming you for the way she felt. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow I pull out of the partnership, and Lois will be alone again. I don't want her to be alone. It's not good for her. Anything I can do, you know. She's in love with you. I'd like to see her get married. A woman with, with $75,000 business, well, she needs someone to look after her interests. The mention of the 75 grand, his eyes lit up like Broadway after dark. Reading his mind was like looking through a dirty window into a filthy room. It hurt to think a foul ball like Tim Grady could make a girl do anything for him. Well, Dan... It's about time she got a proposal for marriage. Yeah. Why don't you call her up, Tim? Yeah. A good idea, Dan. I mean, right now. Stuyvesant, 1541. Now? Well, sure, sure, if you think... <laughs> I won't know what to say. It's been so long. Say you want to marry her. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Lois? Hello, baby. Well, well, so you knew the old voice. I closed the door. I didn't know if I'd be able to control myself, if I'd listen to anymore. I got to the dress shop at 10 o'clock the next morning. Lois was floating around like a... like a waft of loveliness. She touched the inkstand on her desk, moved a chair, straightened a picture. Wasn't conscious of what she was doing. She talked fast and happy about things that didn't mean a thing. She flung open a window and hugged the inrush of air. 
She spoke with her back to me. Oh, Dan, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Isn't life beautiful? You're happy, huh, Lois? Tim was waiting when I got here this morning. He proposed. He said you wanted it that way, too. I guess I'm the happiest woman in the world. <laughs> Can I use your phone? Sure. Sure. Call Paris, Bombay, Shanghai. <laughs> Imagine it's Tim. I'm assigned Lieutenant Bush. Dan Verrill talking. I'm at Lois's shop. If you get here in five minutes, it'll be about right. Yes, Dan, I... I'm the happiest woman in the world, and I owe it all to you. She turned from the window and saw the gun in my hand. <gasps> now you're worth killing! <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Burt Lancaster, with Betty Lou Gerson. Oh, boy, am I happy. Thanks again, Harlow. That's my car talking, folks. I ran great today, didn't I? With those new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Like a charm. Friends, if you want your car to run better, switch to White Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. The spark plugs that get you off to fast starts in cold temperatures. Made by Autolite, they're one of more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats produced in 28 Autolite plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlight units. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. Don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and get Autolite, original factory parts, at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, James Stewart will be our star. The play is called Mission Completed. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Long Wait is an original play by Fred Freeberger. Bert Lancaster is the star of The Hawk and the Arrow a Norma F.R. production, soon to be released by Warner Brothers. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Mickey Rooney, Lana Turner, and Eddie Cantor. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring James Stewart. Meanwhile, see the very informative story about Suspense in the current issue of Quick Magazine. Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Nancy Kelly and Miss Kathy Lewis in Dark Journey. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis in the premiere of Lucille Fletcher's radio play for two actresses, Dark Journey. Tonight's study in... Suspense! Today I am going on a journey. I am going to see Anne Brody again after 15 years. When the news came yesterday, terrible as it was, it was as though a shadow had lifted from my life, a secret horror that I could never quite forget. I have been afraid of Anne Brody now for 15 years, but there is no need to be afraid of her anymore. Anne's 
secret has been locked in my heart together with all shameful, horrible things. Yet I've never gone on a journey like this one but what it comes back. There have been times when I couldn't bear the whistle of a train flung out long and mournful over the lonely countryside. I couldn't bear the smell of a day coach, the feel of the plush seat, the rattle and bustle. Only because everything came back. Every detail of that long and terrible weekend we spent together 15 years ago. I don't think anybody saw us, do you? No. Uh, only old Mr. Hodge is the station master, and he's no gossip. I wouldn't want anybody to know. Not that I care, but you know how the tongues wag in this town. Well, it's much better to be perfectly sure of your plans before you pass the word around. Then if you and Clyde don't settle things, well, nobody will be any the wiser. <laughs> if we don't settle things? Well, there's no if about it. But Clyde and I are practically engaged. Did you get his letter yet about us coming to New York? Uh-huh. Well, for goodness sake, why didn't you tell me? What'd he say? Oh, nothing much. He's, he's no letter writer, just that he was glad and that he's been busy and he's going to call us at the hotel. Oh? He can't meet us at the train? No. Uh, it seems it's his mother's birthday and he promised to take her to lunch in town. We'll be getting in just around that time. He's terribly devoted to her, you know, has been ever since his father died. Oh, I see. You're very much in love with him, aren't you, Anne? Terribly. Yet you really see him so little. How long has it been now? Three months? Three months and six days. But it doesn't really matter. No. I know Clyde loves me and I love him. There's a bond between us. And nothing will ever break it. Well, as long as you feel that way, it's a wonderful way to feel. But I don't think you ought to let it drag on like this much longer, Anne. I really don't. (laughs) Don't worry. We'll settle it this time once and for all. You'll see... When we get on this train again, I'll be wearing his engagement ring on my finger. He's probably tied up with his mother. Come on, let's go down to the drugstore and have a sandwich. Aren't you just stop? No, no, I, I don't feel hungry. You go, though. I'll wait. Oh, come on. The clerk will take the message for no, you. No, no, I I want to be here myself. Well, why don't you call him? I can't if he's at a restaurant. Well, maybe he didn't go. Maybe he's home, sick, or, or at the office. No, no, it, it wouldn't look right. He's got to call me. I... I, I don't know why he doesn't. I don't know why either. In fact, why couldn't we all have had lunch together at that restaurant? I mean, he, he's not exactly poor, is he? Uh, don't you want to take a bus ride or see the sights or anything? Later, Alice. After he's called. Hello? Yes? Oh, yes, this is Miss Ann Brody. What? He, he left a message. Oh... Thank you. What is it? He stopped by and left a message. He has a previous engagement. A previous engagement? When he knew I was coming to New York this weekend only to see him. Well, maybe it was something he couldn't get out of. Maybe on account of his mother's But he already gave her today. And after all he knew I was coming, he knew I'd want to be with him every possible minute. Well, maybe that's the trouble, Anne. Maybe he doesn't want to be pinned down... Maybe you expect too much. But he was right here in the hotel and he didn't even... Oh, he's grown away from me. He's not mine anymore. Alice, Alice, you know what Clyde has meant to me these three years, how I've lived for him and worshipped him. It's... Oh, it's just as though my, my world has been cut away. It's like... It's like having a lump of ice for a heart. Alice, Clyde is my heart. Oh, I... I've got to see him. I've got to tell him. Oh, Anne. Dear, wouldn't you like to lie down? No, no, I can't lie down. I'm free to sit here in in this chair by the window. I wish you'd go, Alice. I want to be quiet and think and think about him. Anne, I wouldn't. Something's happened to him. There's some barrier. I've got to wish it away to break it down. 
What are you talking? I can do it, you know. Anne, please go. Please. Don't tell me it's nine o'clock. I didn't mean to sleep so late. We better get up and get breakfast. Alice. Alice, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He hasn't called me. I haven't slept. Why don't you call him, Anne? Call him and have it out with him once and for all. No, no, I, I couldn't. Well, maybe there's something bothering him. Maybe it's some family situation. After all, his mother didn't have lunch with you yesterday. Maybe, that, maybe there was a reason. What reason could there be except that she didn't want to meet me? She doesn't want him to marry anybody. She wants him all to herself. Well, isn't that enough to upset any fellow? Oh, come on. We'll get to the bottom of this thing. What's his number? I'll get it for you. I, I haven't his number. I never called him at home. But his address is 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Hello. Uh, hello, operator. This is room 351. We want to put in a call to Riverdale, New York. Uh, 3254 Sunset Drive, Riverdale, New York. Uh, the name is Dexter. Mr. Clyde Dexter. Will you get it for us, please? What did she say? She's looking it up. Uh, there it is. She's ringing. Here, you better take it now. Oh, no. No, just one minute. One minute. Let me get my breath. Let me think of what I'm going to say. Hello? Is this the Dexter residence? This is Miss Ann Brody speaking. I wonder if I might speak to Mr. Clyde Dexter, please. Thank you. Clyde? Oh, Clyde, this is Anne. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Oh, Clyde, I've been waiting here at the hotel for you to call, and Alice and I have to spend the morning out, and we thought we'd better let you know we wouldn't be in just in case you wanted... Oh, yes, Clyde, I, I know you said you had a previous engagement, but I thought... Well, you see, Clyde, I'm only going to be here today, and... We get to see each other so little, I was wondering. What's that, Clyde? Yes? Yes? When, no, I, I didn't. What did you say, Clyde? I, I didn't understand. You know what? You... Oh, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, it's not true. It, it can't be. But, Clyde, we... But, Clyde, you can't do this to me. I've, I've considered myself engaged to Anne, you. I... Anne, give me that phone. No. Oh, no. I just want to say goodbye to him, please. No. Anne, don't, don't look that way. What did he say? He, he told me he's engaged to marry a New York girl this September. Oh, Anne. Well, he, he just isn't worthy of you. He couldn't have been if he treats you like this now. I love him. I love him. I love him till the day I die. <laughs> Anne, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm... Oh, please, Alice, please don't talk. Don't come near me or go away, will you, just for a little while? Oh, no, I won't leave you. I can't leave you when, when you look like oh, that. Oh, no, wait, I said. How do you hear me? Go away. I want to be alone. I want you to go away. I have work to do. Work to do? I'm, I'm going to will him to come back to me. I'm going to make him come to this hotel through heaven and hell. And they're dragging him away from me. Oh, Anne. I can do it. I've done it before. I've made him write to me. I've made him call me up out of a clear sky after months and months. I willed him to speak to me the very first time I saw him when he was just a stranger. I willed him to give me his fraternity pin last year at the spring dance, and I can do it. I can do it. If only I try hard enough, and, and if you're absolutely quiet. Clyde. Clyde. Oh, it's no use. He's too far away. Uh, I'll have to come closer to him. We're going out. Going out? Where to? To Riverdale. Riverdale? I want to look at his house to see where he lives. There's something there. Someone who's holding him back. Anne, let's go back to Denford. Let's take a train tonight, any train, and get out of here for good. No, I can't go home. 
I told you that before. I can't until I have his engagement ring on my finger. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Nancy Kelly and Kathy Lewis in Dark Journey by Lucille Fletcher. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a little domestic drama. It's happened to you before and will happen again. You're relaxed in your easy chair, coat off, contentedly reading your evening paper. Your wife is probably tidying up after dinner. The doorbell rings. Sure enough, it's guests who just dropped in. Now, famed hostess Elsa Maxwell tells us how she handles these surprise visits. She says... I always keep Roma California Sherry on hand to welcome unexpected guests. Serving Roma Sherry is so simple, you just pour and hospitality reigns. And because Roma is America's favorite wine, you know your guests will enjoy it. Yes, there's no easier way to gain a reputation for gracious hospitality than by keeping Roma Sherry ready for guests. And Roma, America's taste favorite... The wine more Americans prefer costs no more than ordinary wines. So make a note to get mellow, gold and amber Roma Sherry tomorrow. Once you try the tempting fragrance and intriguing nut-like taste of Roma Sherry, you'll always ask for Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Kathy Lewis as Alice and Nancy Kelly as Anne in Dark Journey, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. I don't think we ought to be wandering around here like this. There might be strange men. Here's the street. Sunset Drive. And there's the house. I've seen pictures of it. I'd, I'd know it anywhere. Anywhere. Oh, Anne, please. This is doing you no good. Oh, hush. I've dreamed about that house. Dreamed of myself and him living in it together. I've dreamed of our children playing on that lawn and the sound of music inside and our car standing outside. But it wouldn't mean a thing to you, Anne, if Clyde didn't love I've you. I've dreamed of the years we'd spend together. Why, well, I, I even named the children. Clyde Jr. and Peter and Charlotte. That's his mother's name. I never liked it, but I was going to call one child that just to please him. And now, what have I got? Nothing. Nothing is gone. Come on. Come on with me, Anne. Oh, there's a light going on upstairs. Do you suppose it's his room? I wonder if he's home. Clyde. Clyde. Think of me. Come back to me. Oh, love me, Clyde. Love me. Love me. Don't, Anne, don't. Somebody <laughs> might hear you. Oh. There's a shadow at the window. Oh, it's Clyde. Oh, no. No, it's someone else. It's a woman. A gray-haired woman. Oh, it's his mother, Alice. Clyde's mother. I don't think he's home, Anne. Let's go back to the hotel. No. No, I want to see her. I've heard so much about her. She always turned her nose up at me. He never admitted it, but I knew. He was the only son, and she thought there wasn't anybody good enough. And, and he was always under her influence, just believed everything she said. I could tell the way he talked. It was always mother says this and mother says that. I bet it was she who turned him against me who picked out that that New York girl. Oh, Anne, please, come on. You're just tearing your heart out. She's up in his room now. She's straightening his things. She's happy up there. She doesn't care that she's made me miserable. Oh, I can feel it now, Alice. I can feel the barrier in my heart. Shh, something's coming. Let's go. We're doing no harm. We can stare, can't we, if we wish? Come on. Come on, we'll walk past the house. We'll defy her. We'll go up and ring the bell. And, and then when she comes down to answer it, we'll ask, Is Mrs. Clyde Dexter at home? 
And then when she asks us who we mean, we'll laugh at her face. Oh, Anne, you're, you're just beside yes, yourself. Yes, I am. I am beside myself because I feel it, Alice. He's lost to me as long as she's up there. Oh, I can stand here, out here under the trees, trying to reach him with every bit of soul I possess, but as long as she's there, as long as she's alive, he'll never be mine again. This is terrible. You've got to pull yourself together and get some rest. You've been sitting in that chair now for three hours. Please, don't talk. Just let me alone. You're... You're working on that willpower thing still, aren't you, Anne? And it, it makes me awfully nervous. Be quiet. It's coming. Something's coming. Something's going to happen. I feel it all around me. I'm going to get a doctor if you don't stop. Shh, shh. I feel it. I feel something. But you're just as white as a sheet. You're shaking all over. I absolutely refuse to let this go on. Do you hear? Now, you, you get into bed. No. Let me take off no, your shoes. No, no, no. Leave me alone. It's as though there were a big lump being moved off my heart. As though the ice inside me were going. As though I, I could cry at last. Oh, it's happened. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. All right. I'll lie down now. I'll go to sleep. If you could sleep, you'd feel better. If you just relax. I've done it, Alice. You'll see. He'll be here in the morning. You lie down now. There he is. Didn't I tell you? There's Clyde now. Hello? Yes. Yes, this is room 351. Yes, this is Ann Brody speaking. Yes. It's Riverdale calling. Riverdale. Clyde? She didn't say. Oh. Hello? Yes. Yes, I'm Ann Brody. Why, yes, I'm a friend of Mr. Clyde Dexter. Who did you say this is, please? The, the police. The police? Oh, something hasn't happened to Mr. Dexter, has it? Oh. What? Yes. Yes, my friend and I were out to the house late this afternoon, around six o'clock. Well, yes, I, I did wear a white hat and a green dress, and, and she... W oh, but we took the subway, the White Plains Express, on the Interboro line from our hotel. We came back around seven. We, well, we just walked past the house two or three times, but... Well, what's the matter? Why are you asking me these questions? No, I haven't seen them. I... What? Give me the phone, Anne. Let me speak to them. You're in no condition Keep to... Away. Talk. You know what they're saying, do you? That Clyde's mother has been murdered. What? Oh, no. No, I haven't. Yes? No. No, we didn't. We just came right home. We didn't even ring the bell. Is Mr. Destica there with you? I see. Well, I'd like to speak to him, please, when he gets through. Will you ask him to call me? Yes. We'll stay here in the room. Oh, Anne. It was a hammer. At eight o'clock tonight. She was struck from behind by an unknown assailant. Oh, how awful. Well, why did the police call us? What have we got to do with it? Clyde was home when we walked by the house. He saw us standing there. I'm going to tell him, Alice. I'm going to tell him the truth. Truth? What truth? There's always been that power inside me. I've known I had it, and sometimes it frightened me. Things have happened. I've been afraid sometimes to use it, afraid it would turn against me. And tonight it did turn against me. And what do you mean? By an unknown assailant. Murdered by an unknown assailant. You know who that assailant was? It was me. Anne, are you crazy? You, you were up here in, in the room every minute. I was up here in the room, but I was wishing she were dead. I was willing him to come to me. I was trying to destroy the barrier. Surely you can't believe that, Anne. It was, it was only a coincidence, a terrible coincidence. I was trying to bring him back, 
to touch his heart, but the power didn't touch his heart. His heart's like steel against me. It struck his heart and glanced off and struck her dead. Anne, please, you're talking like a little... But you don't understand. People like you can understand. People like you... But there's violence to will. To store it up takes years. To send it out of yourself is like like sending a powerful hand with fingers. Will can't kill somebody, Anne. Not pure will. The body is one thing, the mind's another. Mrs. Dexter is physically dead. Her heart stopped beating. There was a blow. Somebody real, somebody human did that. She was struck from behind. She was alone in the house. They said the doors were locked. She had no enemies. It came out of nothing, and it went away again. Oh, I, I never dreamed. I didn't want it to happen that way, but but it's getting beyond me. It's assuming forms and accomplishing ends I don't plan. It's, it's turning against me, Alice. Turning against me. Do you think a police court will believe you? You'll only confuse the testimony. You'll only hurt Clyde. I will. Will, you talk about the power of your will. Did you have any real power these last two days? Did it bring Clyde to this hotel? Did it make him love you or even call you up? Yes. 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 Don't you touch him. I won't let you speak to him. Get away from that phone, Alice. Do you want to get us in trouble? Do you want us to go to jail and spend weeks in court? He'd put you there. He wouldn't care. Get away from that phone, Alice. I don't believe you, do you hear? I think you're mad. You're mad as a hatter. Get away from that phone. No! Anne, you'll ruin your life. You'll fall into suspicion, and people will always think you had something really to do with it. You'll, you'll end up in an asylum. The whole world will know he jilted you. What, what are you going to say to him? He must be half beside himself as it is. He'll, he'll never believe you. What? All right. Thank you, Alice. You see? It is there, isn't it? I made you do what I wanted. <laughs> and I can make anyone. Hello? Hello, Clyde. Oh, Clyde, darling, I just heard the terrible news. How terrible for you. I'm so sorry. Yes, Alice and I were out there this afternoon. We came by to say hello, but we got cold feet and came home. No, Clyde, no, we didn't, not a soul. Oh, yes, my darling, I I understand how terribly broken up and, and my heart goes out to you. Oh, I will, Clyde, dearest, I will. I'll be right over. I'll help you in any way I know. Goodbye, Clyde. Anne, you didn't tell him. You're not going to tell him at all. No. Why should I? He's mine now. And so Anne Brody walked out of my life. Walked from me wrapped in her new and terrible strangeness. Somehow I didn't want to play any part in her life again. I didn't go to her wedding when she and Clyde were married one year later. To me, there would have been something evil in hearing her voice repeat the sacred word. I, am take thee, Clyde. There has been for me a nameless horror in the slow, steady way Anne Brody fulfilled her plans. The house in Riverdale, the car, the three children, Peter, Clyde Jr., and Charlotte. Her happiness. Her triumphant motherhood has somehow been hideous to me. I've never heard a train whistle crying through the dawn but what I've thought of her and shuddered. I have been afraid of Anne Brody now for 15 years. Today, I know I've been a fool. Today I know that it was a real murderer who murdered Mrs. Dexter with a hammer from the service porch. Today I'm going on a journey to Riverdale. I am going to see Anne Brody again, lying willless and struck down in her coffin. 
Lying innocent and pathetic. Lying murdered. Not will, nor nameless monsters of a mind could save her from the truth at last. Yesterday afternoon, the weak, long, brooding creature who could not brook domination from mother or wife flung pent-up death against the mistress of his will. Yesterday afternoon, Clyde Dexter struck again. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines with a tip on how to win praise and increase dining pleasure. Today, millions of clever homemakers are enjoying dinner table compliments by giving everyday dishes tempting new meal appeal. Here's the secret. A glass of red Roma California Burgundy at each place. Try it yourself. Serve robust Roma Burgundy with tomorrow night's piping hot savory pot roast, tender juicy steak, or baked fish. Roma Burgundy brings out tasty new flavorfulness from every morsel, wins grateful compliments for your cooking, and notice how the warm, glowing redness of Roma Burgundy adds richness and beauty to your table. Yet, the gracious custom of serving Roma, America's favorite wine, is as inexpensive as it is delightful. Enjoy exciting new dining pleasure tomorrow with delicious Roma Burgundy. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Nancy Kelly. I'm sure you want to hear next Thursday's suspense when Joseph Cotton will star as a famous New York criminal lawyer in one of the best-known suspense stories of our time, Ben Hecht's Crime Without Passion. Thank you. Nancy Kelly will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Follow That Woman. Next Thursday, same time... Roma Wines will bring you Joseph Cotton as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Next week, part of the country goes on daylight saving time. If your area remains on standard time, tune in Suspense one hour earlier. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. in black. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our stars this evening are three. In the order of their appearance, they are Walter Hempton, one of the theater's proudest names for two generations, and Susan Hayward and Lee Bowman, two of Hollywood's brightest younger stars. The story called The Dead Sleep Lightly by John Dixon Carr is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the dead sleep lightly, and with the performances of Walter Hemden, Susan Hayward, and Lee Bowman, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Meadowvale Cemetery. Not far from New York. Meadowvale Cemetery. On a dim gray morning in early April, when rain forms a mist across leafless trees and white gravestones. You see, over there, 
the group of silk-hatted gentlemen, each with his protecting umbrella, gathered around an open grave. You see the clay soil freshly dug. You can hear, perhaps, the creaking of support as the coffin is lowered into its everlasting house. And the droning voice of the clergyman. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Live? Quiet, Mr. Templeton, please. What's wrong with old Templeton? Please, sir, remember where you are. She's not alive, I tell you. She's not alive. It might seem a long distance that from the Cosmopolites Club in Gramercy Park on the following evening, when that same well-fed man, as hard and unemotional as the diamond pin in his tie, hurries up the steps into the club then. What, what? Uh, yes, Mr. Templeton? Tell me, Mr. Wil- Wilmot in the club, do you know? Uh, yes, sir. Don't you see him? See him where? In the lounge over there, sir. Sitting by the fire. Yes, yes, of course. I, I'm a little upset. You're a good fellow, Henry. I won't forget you. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir, but uh, aren't you going to take off your hat and overcoat? Never mind my hat and coat. Just tell me one other thing. When I came into the club, was there anybody following me? Following you, Mr. Templeton? Yes, a woman. A woman with a long skirt and a heavy black veil. (laughs) There aren't many women who wear that kind of dress nowadays, sir. Look out into the street. Do you see anybody? No, sir. There's just a... What's that? Oh, that's only the old street musician, sir. He doesn't mean any harm. I won't have that tune played, you hear? I'm used to getting my orders obeyed, and I'm going to have this one obeyed. Here's the money. Go out and tell him to go away. Yes, sir, if you insist, but... Uh, Do as I... you're told and don't ask questions. If anybody wants me, I shall be with Mr. Wilmot. Very good, sir. <laughs> Good evening, Wilmot. Mind if I sit down for a minute? Oh, not at all. Pull up a chair. Have some coffee? No, thanks. I'll get down to brass tacks right away. Yes, you you always do. I've noticed that. Well, I'm a pretty self-sufficient kind of a fellow, Wilmot. I made a name for myself, even if I do say it myself. But, well, the fact is, I need advice. Hmm. A successful publisher asking advice from one of his own authors. That's something new, isn't it? Now, look here, Wilmot, I'm serious. All right, all right, I take it back. What's on your mind? Well, you've studied what we'll call the supernatural, haven't you? I've lectured and written books about it, yes. And did you ever meet a, a ghost? No, I can't say I ever did. Have you? It might only be my own imagination. Yes, that's what scares me. You get on in years, and your arteries harden, and you don't take enough exercise, and you think something ought to be done about your waistline, but you never bother. You see, Wilmot, I went to a funeral yesterday. You did? Whose funeral was it? The person who died has nothing to do with this. It was old Simpson of Harley and Sons. We thought it was only decent to make up a party and go to the funeral. And I took my secretary along, a girl named Molly Carroll. I'm leaving for Washington tomorrow. Besides, I'm moving house. So there was a lot of work to do. What I couldn't stand was that infernal cemetery in the rain. We must have gone in by the wrong gate because we were in a neglected, desolate part of the cemetery where the rank grass grew over the grave. You'll oblige me, Miss Carroll, if you first find out the proper directions of our places. We've come in the wrong gate to the cemetery. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Templeton. I thought you What you thought doesn't matter now. This is the wrong part of the cemetery. My shoes are absolutely ruined with wet clay. Well, it isn't doing my own shoes and stockings any good either, Mr. Templeton. If there's been any damage to them, Miss Carroll, I'll replace them. You never found me ungenerous, now, have you? Well, not exactly ungenerous, no. Well, I'll pay you the compliment, Miss Carroll, saying that you're the best secretary I ever had. Thank you. Yet you want to leave me. Y- yes, I... I want to get married. That's what Mr. Barnes is telling me. And who is this paragon of yours? What does he do? Does he make any money? Well, Frank's a radio technician. He's not very wealthy, I'll admit. Wealthy? A radio technician? 
I bet he doesn't make as much as I pay you. Yet you want to get married. Well, is there anything very strange about that? Yes, if it interferes with your career, if it... Good Lord. Look at that. Look at what, Mr. Pendleton? Over there, where I'm pointing. You mean that? That's only an old gravestone covered with weeds and brambles. I haven't seen that grave in years. It looks rather neglected. It is neglected, isn't it? Will you go closer, please, and read the inscription? Mr. Templeton. Do as I tell you, please. And it says... Let's see if I can get some of these weeds aside. It says... Sacred to the memory of Mary Ellen Cleaver. Born September 5th, 1892. Departed this life, March 25th, 1919. Thou should still be adored as this moment thou art. Let thy loveliness fade as it will. If you lower that umbrella, Mr. Templeton, you'll get soaking wet. Sentimental trash. But she always liked it. She always liked it? Mary Ellen Cleaver. Did you know her? Very well indeed. She was my wife. Your wife? But I never knew you were married. Neither does anybody else. Where's my flask of brandy? What have I done with it? It's in your hip pocket, Mr. Templeton, but do you think that's very wise? You've already had more than enough. Whatever I do is wise, Miss Carroll. Well, we were married very young. She was a nice little thing. I was fond of her, yes. But, but she couldn't have helped me. I'm not a snob, but she wasn't in my class. No style, you know, no manners, no, no education. Indeed. Could I have introduced her to the friends I was making? No. Wouldn't have been kind to her. She didn't even want to go to the places where I was invited. She'd sit at home and say, What was it like? Did you have a nice time? What was Mrs. So-and-so wearing? And she loved me. I'll put that to her credit. But... You left her? I thought it was the kindest thing to do, yes. She went away. Then I heard she'd had... Had what? Nothing. Doesn't matter. Well... There was a war on. I attended the peace conference in Europe. Never even knew she was dead until I heard some friends had buried her. I always promised to call her up. And she said she'd come back to me if I did. Well, you couldn't call her up now, Mr. Templeton, even if you wanted to. No, I suppose not. But I was fond of her. I wish there was something I could do. Well, you could have a grave cared for. Have some flowers put on it. That's it. That's an idea. She'd have liked that. Can you take care of that for me? I'll look after it tomorrow morning, Mr. Templeton. But how will they ever be able to locate the grave? There must be thousands in this cemetery. Oh, each grave has a number, you know. Cut into the stone so you can identify it. This is number 1212. 1212. Two, one, two. Sounds like a telephone number, doesn't it? Yes, doesn't it? Meadowvale 1212. Two. Poor girl. I was fond of her. Oh, please, Mr. Templeton, come along and... And please, no more brandy. You've got a funeral to attend. And then, Wilmot, the night came. And the horror. What horror? Oh, take it easy, man. There's nothing to worry about. You were sitting here in the Cosmopolites Club. Yes, but I wasn't sitting in the club last night. I was on my way home. And why should that scare you? I don't know, but it did. I'd been jumpy all day. That infernal number kept running through my head. Meadowvale, one, two, one, two. Have you ever seen my house? Yes, it's that big sham gothic place on Riverside Drive, isn't it? Yes, big and dark and drafty like a mausoleum. I told you it was moving house to an apartment downtown. But there were some papers there. I had to get out of the safe in the library to take with me to Washington tomorrow. I knew the servants would be gone, of course. But I hoped Mrs. Bloom, that's my housekeeper, would still be there. Then, when I went up the park, about 6.30... Meadowvale, one, two, one, two. 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 Mr. Templeton, this is a surprise. Sorry to trouble you, Mrs. Bloom. I seem to have mislaid my key. The other could have sworn I had another key ring this morning. 
It's no trouble, Mr. Templeton. Only, I hope you're not planning to spend the night here. No, I'm going to a hotel. Why do you ask? Because they've disconnected everything except the electricity and taken away most of the furniture. I haven't touched anything in the library. No, sir. I told them you said to leave that. Uh, but it does seem a pity in a way. What seems a pity? To break up a lovely home like this after all these years. Home? This big, ugly picture gallery? It's been a home to me, sir. Well, I've treated you generously, haven't I? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I've got several hours' work to do, Mrs. Bloom. A whole safe full of papers to sort over. I'm going to the library and... What's that you're hiding behind your back? I'm not hiding anything, sir. All the same, what is it? It's only a music box, sir. I found it in the attic when the moving men were here. If I hadn't known there were, well, no ladies in your life, I'd have said it belongs to one of them. I love to hear them, sir. May I? Mrs. Bloom. Yes, sir. If we don't want me to smash that music box, turn it off. Yes, sir, I'm sure I never... I'm going to the library. If we can find any sandwiches and coffee, bring them. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Same old library. Same old claw-footed desk. There's the Venetian mirror she bought for you. Look at yourself in the mirror, Templeton. Admit you can't face it. Admit you can't work here tonight. Admit you've got to have lights and music and... That's it. Go out for dinner. Telephone Wilmot. If they've left the phone... Oh, yes. Good. Here it is. Hello, hello. I, uh... Uh, number, uh, please. I want, uh... Meadowvale 1212. Meadowvale 1212. Wait, what the devil's name am I saying? Change that, I want... Hello, my darling. I knew you'd call me when you needed me. Who's that speaking? Who are you? It's Mary Ellen, dear. Don't you recognize my voice? You're not Mary Ellen. This is a trick. Mary Ellen is dead. Yes, dear. But the dead sleep lightly. And they can be lonely, too. And now that you do need me... I don't need you. I don't need anybody. I'm coming back to join you, dear. It's not easy, but I'll be there by the time the clock strikes seven. I'll wear a veil, because I don't look very pretty. I won't have this. I won't listen to you. I, I won't... Goodbye, my dear. Remember, when the clock strikes seven... Mrs. Blue, Mrs. Blue! Mr. Templeton, what on earth is the matter? Who's been playing tricks on me? Tricks, sir. I don't understand. Who spoke to me on this phone? But, sir, nobody could have spoken to you on that phone. Nobody could have? What are you talking about? That phone's disconnected, sir. Disconnected? Yes, sir. The man came here this afternoon and took that little metal box off the wall and rolled all the wires up and put everything on the desk there. Said he'd be back tomorrow to take it away. Mrs. Bloom, that's impossible. Look for yourself, sir. You're standing in the middle of the room holding that phone, and the wires don't lead anywhere. I think that's true. So you couldn't very well have talked to anybody on the phone that wasn't connected? Now, could you? I tell you, I got the operator. I heard it ring. I talked to... to someone else. Oh? And what did that person say? She said she'd be here to visit me when... And so, Wilmot, that's what happened last night. The phone was disconnected. It was Mary Ellen's voice. There's no doubt about that. Am I out of my mind or, or what? Before I say anything about that, my friend. Well, let's hear the end of your story. What did happen when the clock struck seven? I don't know. You don't know. No, I lost my head. Ran out of that house as though the devil were after me. Maybe he was. And since then? I spent the night at the hotel. Today, I've walked past that house 50 times, 100 times, trying to muster up enough nerve to go in. I couldn't do it. But I've got to go in there. Why? It's those papers I've got to take to Washington. Send somebody else to get them. I can't do that, Wilmot. It's confidential information for the government. I, I've thought of everything. I... I've even bought a revolver, see? For the love of heaven, man, put that gun away. Do you want the other club members to think you have gone insane? Then I thought of you. You know all the tricks of fake spiritualists. You've written about it and lectured about it. 
Uh, which reminds me, by the way, that I'm lecturing before the Acropolis Club in about 20 minutes. You've got to break that engagement, Wilmot. Why? Because you're going with me to my house tonight, now. Oh, that's impossible, old man. Now sit quietly and listen to me. I'll go with you willingly, tomorrow morning. That's too late. I'm taking an early plane to Washington. Well, then wait until I can get away from the lecture. Say, uh, around midnight. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take a taxi and join you as soon as I can. That won't do. I've got to know. Know the answer now. Do you understand? Aren't you being a little unreasonable about this? Unreasonable or not, I usually get my own way, and I mean to have it now. Well, then I'm afraid you'll have to go to the house alone. Besides, you know, Wilmot, you worry me. You sit there puffing at that pipe and looking at me out of those queer eyes of yours like a, like a young Satan. I've often wondered what you were really thinking about. Didn't you flatter my intelligence so much? I was wondering whether you'd been quite frank with me. Frank with you how? About your late wife, Mary Ellen Kleber. What about her? Well, after she left you, something happened that, uh, well, you don't like to talk about. Was there by any chance uh, a child, a son, for instance? Did, or... you, did you say a son? Yes. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then let's agree not to understand each other, shall we? Now, are you coming with me or aren't you? I tell you, man, I'll get there as soon as I can. All I can think about... There's the wet red clay in that cemetery. And the dismal grave in the rain. And what her face might look like if she raised the veil. And what am I going to see in that house? What am I going to see in that house? So the clock Time. The hours dwindle, and the traffic roar of the city sinks to a low growl behind twinkling lights. It is midnight, when a taxi moves along a certain street towards a certain house out of a bygone age. Lightless, black against the stars, surrounded by iron railings and with a path bordered by fir trees leading to the front door. Look, too, with the face of Mr. Patrick Wilmot. When that taxi draws near. All right, driver. This is the place. I'll be in a wait for you, sir. No, you needn't wait. Keep the change. Thank you, sir. Good night. Hmm, so the front gate is open. And he did go in. And <laughs> I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to bump into you. Mr. Wilmot. You know who I am. Oh, yes. I've seen you several times at our office. I'm Molly Carroll, Mr. Templeton's secretary. What are you doing here? Well, it's Mr. Templeton. What about him? Well, that's what I want to know. I was out with Frank, that's my fiancé, and when I got home, the girl I room with said that Mr. Templeton had been phoning and phoning all evening. She said he sounded drunk or something. He... He wanted somebody to go with him to this house. Evidently, I wasn't the only person he applied to. Shall we go in? Yes, but the whole house is dark. Suppose he isn't there. He's there, all right. You don't know men like Bert Templeton. But I... I'll push the gate wider. Now, straight up the walk to the front door. I've got a flashlight. What are we going to find? Something rather unpleasant, I'd better warn you. How do you know? I have my ways of knowing, Miss Carroll. Oh, look. What is it? That, that French window to the left of the front door. Yes. It's partly open. Well, there's nothing in that, necessarily. Templeton said he'd lost his key. He might have had to open a window. Oh, that's true, but... So you see it, too, do you? See what? There's a footprint across the sill of that French window. A footprint made in wet clay. Like, like the clay of the cemetery. So I should imagine. Will you go in first, or shall I? Into that dark room? I will not. Well, then stay here, please, until I get some lights on. No, wait. I'll go. Let me take your arm. All right, be careful now. Hmm, yes, I thought so. This room is the library. And there are more footprints of somebody or something walking in. They lead... Who's there? Who's there? It's only me, sir, Mrs. Bloom, the housekeeper. 
Then what's the idea of standing in a dark room in the middle of the night with what sounds like... It's only a music box, sir. I left it behind along with some other things and came back to get them. I've got my own key. I thought I heard a noise in here. But why aren't there any lights? The electricity's cut off, sir. It was cut off today. I see. Now, if Templeton is here or was here, he must have had some kind of light. If I turn this flashlight on the desk, maybe... <laughs> Be quiet, Miss Carroll. What is it, sir? I'm as blind as a bat without my glasses. It's Mr. Templeton. He's lying on the floor beside the desk. Oh, he isn't... No, he isn't dead. His face is the color of putty. I think he's had some kind of stroke. We'd better not take any chances. Mrs. Bloom? Yes, sir? Get outside to the nearest telephone and call for an ambulance. Tell him it's an emergency case. You're Mr. Wilmot, aren't you? But, but what happened to him? Ask a dead woman. I beg your pardon. Never mind. Hurry. Of course I'll hurry, Mr. Wilmot. What are we going to do? Well, let's have a look around. Templeton seems to have been working at his papers by the light of a couple of candles, which somebody's blown out. We'll relight them. Ah, uh, there's the desk. There's all the papers scattered round Mr. him. Mr. Wilma, please! What happened to him? I'll tell you. As he sat there in the dim light of two candles, a ghostly figure appeared at that French window. It wore a long, old-fashioned skirt and a heavy black veil to hide the face. It walked toward Templeton, tracking graveyard clay. It stretched its arms to him like this. Keep away from me, please! Templeton couldn't stand it. He collapsed. And now, before the old housekeeper returns, would you care to hear how the whole trick was worked? Trick? What trick? Have you heard about the ghost voice that talked on a disconnected telephone? Oh, yes. Yes, he, he said something about it this morning, but... I, I thought he wasn't himself. He wasn't, but he heard it. Remember Mrs. Bloom's story about the telephone man? Yes. They don't send a man round to yank the whole apparatus off the wall, put it on the desk, and say he'll be back for it next day. This man from the telephone company was an imposter. The man from the telephone company was an imposter? Exactly. Oh, oh look, he's moving his hand. He's trying to open his eyes. Isn't there anything we can do for him? No, there's nothing we can do till the doctor arrives. In the meantime, listen to me. All right. What did this imposter do? He took away the real phone and substituted a spirit telephone. You don't know what a spirit telephone is? No, of course not. It's an old device used by fake mediums. You see a telephone without wires standing on a desk like that one. You pick up the receiver and talk to the dead. Of course, you never really talk into the phone at all. But if you don't talk into the phone, then... Fix Underneath the desk is a tiny microphone with hidden wires leading to another room in the same house. That microphone picks up every word you think you are saying to the phone. Is that clear? I think so. Well, the dummy telephone is really a low-power radio receiving set. Somebody in another room can talk back to you after hearing what you say on the wired microphone. Then, Mr. Templeton... If Templeton hadn't rung Meadowvale 1212... Then rest assured, that same number would have rung him. Well, then the scheme couldn't fail either way. But, you see, there's one thing in this matter I haven't got quite clear even yet. And what's that? Tell me, Miss Carroll, just why did you work this whole trick? Why did you try to scare your father to death? My father? Templeton is your father, isn't he? That might be rather difficult to prove, Mr. Wilmot. By George, I admire you. Thanks very much. I'm flattered. Expressionless as ever. Eyes as hard and cold and blue and, and handsome as... Well, make your own comparison. But I knew you were guilty, of course, when I heard your fiancé was a radio ticket. You can leave Frank out of this. Oh, you have scruples. Have I touched you? Nothing can touch me. Not since my mother died. Your fiancé installed the ghost mechanism and took it away today. He probably thought it was only a joke. He did. I swear he did. And the rest of it was plain enough. Who led Templeton to the wrong gate in the cemetery past that woman's grave? You did. Who was the only one who could have stolen the key to this house off that key ring he took to the office? You were. You needed that key to come and go as you liked and impersonate the two voices on the phone. Is there any need to go on with this? He killed her, you know. You mean Templeton killed your mother? Oh, not with a knife or a bullet or poison. All he did was break her heart. And that's no offense in law. Oh, steady now. Well, I've done what I wanted to do. I've torn his whole rotten life to pieces. And there he is, gasping for breath on the floor. And I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm gl Oh, God, forgive me. He is my father. Does he know you're his daughter? No. No, of course not. When I went to work for him as a secretary, 
He hadn't even seen me since I was a child. Well, I got near him. I worked for years to get near him. No. I wish I hadn't. Now, look here. You've got to pull yourself together. Why? Who cares? That's the ambulance coming and maybe the police. What do I care? Tell the police what you like. My dear girl, you don't think I'll tell them anything. I'm merely an onlooker. An amateur Satan who doesn't believe in ghost voices. Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. What's that? Templeton, his eyes are open. He's trying to get up. Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. Mary it's Ellen. As though, it's as though he, he could see something that we can't What's see. What's that he's got in his hand? It's a revolver. He had one at the club. He's putting it against his oh, chest. No. I'll stop him. Look out. Look out. Oh. He did love her after all. And now he's tried to join her. Oh, don't let him die. He's all right, Molly. You grabbed a gun just in time. If he doesn't die, I'll make it up to him. I swear I'll make it up to him. I tell you now, he's not going to die. But... Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. What? Mary Ellen. But what? But what? Mary Ellen. I was... I was just wondering. Is there a ghost in this room tonight? Lightly, starring Walter Hemden, Susan Hayward, and Lee Bowman. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday. Miss Hayward appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. And Mr. Bowman appears with the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor Studios. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's suspense. Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud! Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you the distinguished actor who has just won the New York Film Critics Award for his performance in Watch on the Rhine, Mr. Paul Lucas. The suspense play which stars Mr. Lucas and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called A World of Darkness. And so with the performance of Paul Lucas as the musician named Anton Rijak, to whom the world was a world of darkness, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. All patrol cars in J area, J for Johnson. All patrol cars in J area go to 325 West 52nd, 325 West 52, a theatrical rooming house, Homicide. This is Homicide. A young woman stabbed. That is all. Okay, okay, okay. Is everybody here now? Yes, I think I've got all of them. Uh, There's Mrs. Collins, Mr. Farrell, Miss Walker, Mr. Gunther. Yes, they're all here, Lieutenant. Uh, 
You're the landlady, Mrs. Washburn, right? Well, if you want to put, be blunt about it. I'm afraid I'm a blunt man. Maybe it's the business I'm in. Last night, a girl was killed in this house. According to the coroner, it happened about two in the morning. She was killed in a particularly cold-blooded manner. Stabbed. And that's murder. There's no two ways about it. Now, you're intelligent people. You're all connected with the theater. No, I... not all. Not all. Franz is my sort of uh, caretaker, handyman. Yes, handyman. But not to do with that theater, that place of sin and abomination. Don't mind him. Franz has always been a little prejudiced. I know when the sword of righteousness is ready to strike. Where were you at two o'clock in the morning? I was in my room waiting. What were you waiting for? Now, look, don't you people realize what you're up against? Till you can account for your actions last night, you're all under suspicion of murder. What makes you so sure one of us did it? Oh, you were Miss Nancy Collins' fiancée, is that right, Mr. Farrell? Yes. What were you doing last night? I was out walking. Anybody see you? I don't know. I, I don't think so. How do I know? What were you doing out walking around at 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, after what happened, I... Oh, uh -huh. what happened? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was upset, that's all. Why don't you tell him the truth, Daniel? The truth? What's the use of all this talking? It's not going to bring her back. What did you mean by that, Mrs. Collins? What truth? It's not my place to say. Daniel considers it a personal matter. It couldn't have had anything to do with what... Oh, I'm sure no one is concealing anything of the slightest importance. Everyone loved Nancy. Everyone. Please. Please. I know what you're getting around to. Why, Kay? That everyone loved her but me. That I hated her. But I didn't. Well, not enough to... to do a thing like that. Where were you at two this morning, Miss Walker? In my room. Can you prove that? No, of course I can't. That's the whole thing. Don't you see? No, listen, listen. Who's playing that piano? That's Mr. Reject in the room across the hall. He's a musician. Does he live here? Yes. Well, why didn't you tell me? I thought you said everybody was here. No use talking to him. He doesn't even know about it. Will you please let me handle this? Really, Lieutenant, he couldn't tell you anything. You see, You he... get him in here, Haggerty. Go get him. Okay. Now, listen, you, you people have got an awful lot of explaining to do. None of you can prove where you were or what you were doing or why you were doing it. What about you, Mrs. Collins? You don't think... After all, I am poor Nancy's mother. Mrs. Collins, I'm just trying to get at the facts. You have the room next to Nancy's. Didn't you even hear anything? No. I've had insomnia for years. I have to take a strong sedative every night. Here comes Mr. Rejack. Oh, Mr. Rejack, I... I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. I didn't realize that, uh, uh, that I was blind. Oh, it is no matter. I was waiting for you to send for me, officer. You... You knew the police were here? But of course. Oh, uh, Mrs. Washburn, has anyone seen anything of Carl yet this morning? No, not yet. Uh, uh, who is Carl, Mr. Rejay? My Belgian police dog, who guides me. He has wandered off somewhere. <laughs> Although I cannot say I blame him. It is not much fun being a companion only to a blind man. Oh, well, he'll come back. That kind always does. Oh, I'm not worried. But now you wish to speak of the terrible thing that has happened to poor Nancy. Oh, you, you know about that? Unfortunately, yes. By the way, here is the key to her room. It was locked and you were obliged to force it, were you not? Oh, why, yes, but how, how did you... How do I have the key? And how do I know... You see, I'm a blind man. But there are many ways for a blind man to know many, many things. Yes, I, I see. Poor Nancy. Poor child. How much do you know about that? Quite a bit, I'm afraid. I know how she was killed. I know why she was killed. And I know who killed her. <laughs> Tonight in our suspense theater, murder was unseen in the dark, but the crime was witnessed by a single human being with the eyes of night. Roma Wines is bringing you Paul Lucas as star of suspense in the Robert L. Richards story, A World of Darkness. You think it is a great affliction to be bind? Yes, in a way it is. If he yields to it, it can make a man bitter and distort his mind. But if he struggles against it, there are merciful compensations. In time, he reaches out into the world again 
and finds he can perceive the meaning of the life around him without his eyes. A world of darkness becomes to him a place of utmost sensitivity to other things, to touch, to, to smell, but above all, to sound. The ticking of a watch, the, the, the rustle of clothing, the sound of breathing, or even the beat of a heart. I have only to focus my attention on a sound so distant or so slight as to be utterly imperceptible to anyone else. And to me, it is magnified and amplified a hundred times. Last night, though sitting in my room and confined in my eternal darkness, I heard what I could not see. And I was witness to a murder. The bells of Trinity had just run the three-quarter hour. They are at the lower extremity of the city, but I always like to listen for them. It was a quarter to midnight. I was about to go back to my piano. I had been working on a little composition of my own when I heard Nancy coming down the street from the direction of the theater. She was walking very fast. It was clear to me that she was disturbed about something, so I knew she would want to see me. I waited for her knock. Yes, Nancy, come in. Oh, you are troubled. What is it? How did you know? You know I can always tell these things. <laughs> See, even Carl knows. Oh, hello, Carl. He's so nice. You're both so nice. Carl and I. Huh? <laughs> you know he loves you, Nancy. I think he really does. Almost as much as he loves me. I know. Oh, I'm going to miss you both terribly. You are going away? Anton, I'm going to marry Danny Farrell. To marry? Yes, he's quitting the stage and he's going into the army. I'm going with him. That's what I want to tell you about. I see. Anton, you've always been so good to me. You've helped me so much and I... I've always felt that you liked me. More than that, Nancy. I'm very, very fond of you. Oh, Anton, you're the best friend I've ever had. But I'm nearly twice your age and blind. Oh, that doesn't matter. We've had some wonderful times together. Yes. And now you wish to talk to me because you are still not sure you have made the right decision, hmm? Yes. Now, to leave the stage now, just when you are having the first time such a wonderful success. Oh, it isn't that. I, I've always hated the stage. Hated it. Now, Nancy, now... You have a very great talent. You, you can't have a talent for anything you don't like. And you can't like anything you've had crammed down your throat ever since you were barely able to talk. Oh, it's your mother. She's counted on it all these years. She sacrificed everything for my career. Oh, mother loves me in her way, but sometimes she's so strange. When I told her about Danny tonight, I, I thought she was going to have a stroke or something... I've seen her angry before, but never like no, this. No, it will pass. Anton, for a minute she... She looked insane. I was frightened. Really frightened. Listen. What? Anton, what is it? Your mother leaving her room. She will be coming down here to look for you. How do you know? The rustle of her satin, satin robe. I hear it often. Perhaps you better not speak any more just now of your little trouble. Oh, I shouldn't have bothered you. I know it must seem childish and no, silly no, to no, you. No, 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 Nancy. It is not for me. But perhaps your mother will not like it that you confide in others. But how could you know that Nancy? she... Nancy! You see? She is coming. Nancy! Yes, Mother? Oh, there you are. I thought you might be here. Good evening, Edna. Nancy, you really must come upstairs now. If I'm going to have your new dress ready for the equity party, I've got to cut it from the pattern tonight, and I want you to help me. Mother, I'm not going to the party. Why, Nancy, of course you are. It's very important. Mother, do we have to go through it all again? Nancy, dear, I'm sorry I lost my temper this evening. 
I know this seems like the only thing in the world that matters just now, love and all. But you simply can't walk out of the lead in a hit play and ever expect to be successful. I don't want to be successful. Can't you get that through your head? After I've slaved and skimped and planned all these years. You'll be all right, Mother. There'll be enough. I'll be all right. I'm not thinking of myself. I've never had a chance to think of myself. Only last week I drew every penny of my own savings and took it out an insurance policy on you. A hundred thousand dollars. So that you'd have something for your old age. You shouldn't have done that, Mother. And now you want to throw away everything I've done for that harebrained boy. But, Edna, if Nancy's in love... You keep out of this. Mother, please. Oh, I've watched you too, Anton Rejack. But I knew she wouldn't have anything to do with a blind man. Mother, you couldn't see her. But you could touch her, couldn't you? You could be in love with her. <laughs> well, I hope you see now what a fool you've made of yourself. You fool. You blind fool. Fool, fool, fool! Down, Carl. Quiet. He struck me. I'm sorry. You deserved it, Mother. I think you'd better go on, Edna. Nancy, I want you to come upstairs right away. We're going to cut out your new dress tonight. Oh, Anton, forgive me. No, it is nothing. I'm sorry I did what I did, but I was afraid she would become hysterical. Anton, I didn't know. Believe me, I didn't no, I know. No, it is nothing. You had better go up to her now. Yes. Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, but there is nothing to be afraid of. Yes. But I'm afraid. I could not sleep, although it was late. I tried to go back to my work, but my attention wandered. I could not keep from mind from what was going on in that room upstairs. I heard each sound as clearly as though the cause of it were there at my very side. Nancy was weeping. And against the sound of her tears, like an inexorable counterpoint, the scissors, deliberate mechanical snipping and crunching of heavy dressmaker's shears, cutting material on a table. Then there was an interruption. Footsteps running up the stairs. The footsteps of Danny Farrell. I knew what would happen then. Mrs. Collins, you've got to listen. So I did not want to listen. Up here. Nancy, but for a moment, I did. Danny, I don't know what to do. Well, it's about time you found out, isn't it? I shut my mind to it. I didn't want to hear anymore. There was to be another quarrel, another agonizing scene. And then presently, I heard the steps again. Slow and heavy this time, coming down the stairs. They went towards the front door instead of to his own room. He was going out. I did not know what he might do. I went to my own door, and as casually as I could, I opened it. Oh, hello, Anton. Why, hello, Danny. Were you going out? For a little walk. It's late. I guess it is. I am sorry, Danny. You know about it, do you? Yes, Nancy told me tonight. There was a scene with her mother again. It will come out all right. Oh, no, it won't. But why? Nancy's changed her mind. Or rather, her mother's changed it for oh, her. The poor child. Anton, Nancy's a lovely girl. She's the loveliest girl in the world. But she's weak. Oh, but we are all weak in one way or another. But she doesn't know what she does to people. She doesn't know the torture she puts people through. No. And I can't stand it any longer. If I can't have Nancy, I'll, I'll do something. I'll... Danny, now, it will be all right. It can't be all right. How do I know it won't go on like this after we're married? Oh, I'm crazy, I suppose, but... I... I know how these things are. Two young people in love cannot be kept apart by anyone or anything in this earth. No, Anton. I thought it over and over every way there is. It won't work. Oh, come in. Anton, I... Oh. I didn't know you were here, Danny. Okay. I just heard the news. Over at the theater. Congratulations. Thanks. I suppose I had to say that. You know I don't mean it, Danny. Please, Kay, I... I don't think you love her, Danny. 
I don't see how you could. Kay, I don't want to talk about it tonight. Are you afraid to talk to me, Danny? Are you? I'm sorry, Kay. Good night, Anton. Danny. Danny, listen to me. Danny! Oh, let him go. He's upset tonight. He's upset. He's upset. <laughs> Kay, Kay, stop it. Get hold of yourself. <laughs> I love him. I love him. I can't let him go. Oh, but you must, don't you see? He's going to be married. Before she came along, he couldn't even think of anyone but me. Well, she planned it very nicely. Just the way she's planned everything else. She doesn't care how many lives she wrecks, including his. But it won't be so easy this Kay, time. Kay, Kay, you are talking foolishness. Listen, Anton. Before I'd let her get away with this, I'd kill her. So help me, I'd kill her. <laughs> She left me at last. I paid no heed to where she went. I was disturbed and troubled. I sat in the darkness of my mind, thinking. Then I heard steps again. Those odd, dragging steps coming towards my door. Franz? Yes, Mr. Rejack. Did you want to see me, Franz? No. No, I was only listening. Listening? To what? Don't you hear it? The beating of the wings? They've been close about the house all evening. Oh, oh, have they? The time is very near. Are you a good man, Mr. Rejack? Now, I don't know, friends. I, I try to be. The black angel with the bright sword of righteousness and vengeance. Do you think we can escape him? Well, I, I hope so. No, no. Don't you know what goes on in this house? Haven't you seen them with their painted lips, the tinkling rings and bracelets, and the vanity and the scoffing? Yes, yes, Franz. Uh, 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 what have you in your bag there? Oh, here's my, my tools. Always I work, work day and night. There's a dripping faucet up in Miss Collins' room. I have to fix it. Dripping faucet? Oh, yes. What's the matter, Mr. Redek? Did you think of something? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was thinking that I must take Carl out for a walk. <laughs> oh, 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 no, Carl, down, down, Hello down. Hello there, Carl. He's a fine dog, eh? Franz. Yes, yes. Go along, do what I told you. It's late. Yes, yes. I do what I'm told. Remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans. For this city will I humble to the dust. And this house will I make a place of weeping and desolation. The moment the old man called my attention to the faucet, I had heard it. When I back, went back into my room, I, I still heard it. I heard the old man tinkering with the pipes. And the dripping grew less and stopped. Then the shears began again. Those long, sharp scissors cutting the dress. I forced myself to return to my work and for a while I heard nothing more. And then I heard it. The dripping had begun again. But this time, it was no longer water that was dripping. It was then that I knew. I sat frozen with horror. It was the most terrible sound I had ever heard in my life. At last, I got up and took my cane and went to the door. Carl wished to go with me, but I closed the door on him. It was later, somehow in my confusion, that he slipped away. I started up the stairs. That terrible sound grew louder. It came from Nancy's room. I had just reached the top of the stairs. There was no way for anyone to leave Nancy's room except in my direction. It was then that I heard the telltale whisper. The murderer had passed me in the darkness. I went to Nancy's door. There was no need to go in. I knew what was there as surely as though I had seen it happen with the eyes I no longer have. For I could hear the steady dripping of her blood. 
I closed the door and locked it. I put the key in my pocket. I wished to make certain that the criminal would have no chance to return and cover up any evidence of the crime. Then I returned to my room to wait for you officers of the police to come. And now you would know as I knew why Nancy Collins died and who killed her. <laughs> Do all you people here confirm what Mr. Rejack says about your movements last night? Wait. What did you mean about the telltale whisper? Oh, what is the use of any longer pretending, Edna? You killed her. Now you must pay for it. No, no. Now, doubtless you have already found her fingerprints on the scissors with which Nancy has stepped. Oh, naturally. They were Mrs. Collins' scissors anyway. And I have a suspicion that you will find the insurance policy she took out on her daughter's life only last week that makes Edna Collins the beneficiary in the event of Nancy's death. No, no, I didn't do it. You better take her along, Haggerty. All right, come on. No, please, wait a minute. Maybe I've been selfish, but I loved her. He's lying because he hates me for what I said. No, no, please. Well, Mr. Rejack, I guess several people owe you their thanks for this. And you owe me nothing. If it could only bring her back to life. Come in. We found Mr. Rejack's dog, ma'am, down in the cellar. Been there all night. Here, Carl. Carl, my poor old Carl. Here, Carl. <laughs> Carl, what's the matter now? Where are you? <laughs> Grab him, somebody. Grab him. Pull it back. Back, you. Here, Carl. Kill him. Back. Carl, what's the matter? Don't you know me? Uh, Mr. Rejack, you, you say you shot your dog in your room before you went upstairs last night. Yes. Yes, you're certain? Well, but of course. And you say you did not go into Nancy Collins' room after you discovered the murder? No. No, I did not. Well, that's very strange, Mr. Rejack. Because your dog did. His coat is matted with her blood. I realize now that the dog must have followed me. I heard him whimper when I struck. Then somehow he disappeared. But before I locked the room, the beast must have fawned on her where she fell. Yes, I... I killed her. It is no matter now. She will marry no one now. Nor will I. Yet it is true I heard those things. Yes, most of them. You would be amazed what I can hear. Now, even from where I sit, I can hear the men at work at the place where they will take me. Although that place is many miles away. They are hammering and the scuffling in preparation for me. And now they are clamoring up, up on the platform. And now they are about to test that ingenious device that will snuff out my life. Listen. They spring the trap. Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight... Drive-In, starring Nancy Kelly. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant... As Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a star, Miss Nancy Kelly, in the suspenseful narrative of a Hollywood working girl who, one rainy midnight, found death sitting beside her on the ride home. And so with drive-in and with the performance of Nancy Kelly, 
We again hope to keep you in suspense. I wish I hadn't let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came to the drive in that rainy night. It was late. And I was tired. I'd been on my feet all day carrying heavy trays, hopping to it when impatient people glared their headlights on and off in my eyes. And heaven knows there are a lot of impatient people in Hollywood. These car hops don't have an easy time of it. Talk about your mail carriers. Well, we're the same. Raining or blowing or boiling hot, we've got to get through with that tray or know the reason why. Tired, hungry people who sit back in their car and expect a million dollars worth of service for a ten-cent tip. Why do we do it? Oh, sure, there are other ways of making a living in Hollywood, but not many that hold that glittering promise that maybe someday, somehow, maybe someone will say... Why, that girl looks like Lana Turner. Yeah, at least her hair's done up that way. You know, I think I could use her in that new picture of mine. I think I'll ask her to come out of the studio. Yeah, I know. Well, here we go again. Well, maybe it doesn't happen often, but there's always a chance. And there's always that hope. That's what keeps us going, I guess. But there are other things that can happen in a drive-in. Things that aren't on the menu by any manner of means. Like, like the rainy night I was telling you about when I let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came in. Take his order. I've got three other cars, and I'm waiting for French fries. Oh, look at the clock, will you? It's near midnight. I'm off duty. Oh, please, Miller. Just as one more, will you? I'll do the same for you sometime. But Ruth, I... Oh, what's the matter with him? Can't he read? Please do not honk your horn. That looks clear enough to me. Well, it's the doctor's car, see? He's probably going to rush. Anybody you got... Anyway, you've got nobody waiting. Oh, all right. Gee, thanks a lot. Well, it was true. No one was waiting for me. Only the bus that'd take me to Glendale, where I lived alone in an apartment. So I buttoned up my raincoat and I took a menu over to the car. Good evening. Never mind the menu. Just some black coffee, a pot of it, and a ham sandwich. Please hurry it. When I... When I took his auto over to the car, the window was rolled up a little too far, and it interfered with the tray, so I reached in to wind it down. When I touched the handle, it, it felt wet and kind of sticky, too, but I didn't think anything about it, and I got the tray firmly set, and then I looked at my hand. It was as red as, as blood. I looked up quickly at him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Dr. Morgan. I just had an emergency in the car. Oh, an accident? Yes, Sunset and Vine, quite a crash. I just happened by and I took one of them to the hospital. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Yes, it was very unfortunate. I walked back trying to wipe the blood from my hand with a paper napkin. Oh, it gave me a creepy feeling to have somebody's blood on my hand. Then I went in to wash. I was keeping close track of the time and I was a little worried for fear the big drive-in clock wasn't right. It sometimes ran slow. So I took a coin from my pocket. I... I figured it was worth a nickel not to miss that last bus to Glendale. I walked over to the pay phone, and I was just about to drop the nickel in when... And I looked out and was leaning on the horn and beckoning to me at the same time. I put the nickel back in my pocket, and I hurried out to him. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry, and I haven't time for this copy to cool off. I'll take the sandwich with me. How much do I owe you? Of uh, uh, 40 cents. 40 cents. Here you are. I hope I didn't interrupt your phone call. Wasn't important, was it? No, no, no. I was just checking on the time. I didn't want to miss my bus. There was a clock right over your head. Oh, that's usually wrong. I have the time. It's about four minutes to twelve. Oh. Oh, gee, I am going to miss my bus. What time does it leave? At midnight from Hollywood and La Brea. Well, hop in. I'll take you. I'm going right past there. Oh, gee, would you? I'll take the tray and I'll be right back. Okay. I might still make it. In my hurry to unhook the tray from the window, I gave it a jerk. It fell crashing to the ground. Oh, Ruth! Ruth, please help me pick these things up, will you? I'm, I'm going to miss my bus. Oh, all right, Mildred. Okay. He picked the things up quickly and Ruth went off with the tray. I started to run around the other side of the car when I 
noticed something shining on the ground. It was one of the shakers that had fallen from the tray. I picked it up and I started running toward the drive-in when he spoke to me. Why don't you just put that in your pocket? You can return it tomorrow. Come on, come on. You're going to miss your bus. I put the shaker into my pocket and I rushed over to the other side of the car and he opened the door for me. I was just about to get in when I hesitated. I wasn't used to doing this sort of thing. The other girls sometimes let the customers drive them home, but I never did. Still, he, he looked so decent and... Come on, come on, you'll miss it. Then he, he reached out as if to help me in. And I thought then that he was really concerned about my missing the bus for... Well, he seemed to pull me into the car. And the first thing I knew, I was sitting beside him. And the door slammed. And we were driving off. I was a little uneasy, but and then I thought, no, oh, it's only a few blocks and I won't be in the car long. I suppose you're in a hurry because someone's waiting for you. Oh, no, I, I live alone, but I'd hate to walk back to Glendale in this rain. You won't have to walk. Well, this is very nice of you. I appreciate it. Not at all. Would you mind rolling up that window on your side? There's a draft. Hmm? Oh, oh, of course. Um, you, you can let me off at that corner over there. All right. Anywhere along here will be all right. Uh, this is this is fine. Right, right over there by that stop sign. Wait. You're going right through that stop signal. Am I? Yes. But I'll get over there by the other one. My bus... You're turning the wrong way. Am I? Yes. This goes up to Laurel Canyon. Does it? You thought you were pretty smart, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. Please let me out of this car. You went right to the phone. You thought I wouldn't see you. The fu- but I-, I was calling about the time. Honest I was. The time? With that clock right over your head? Oh, but that clock's wrong sometimes. Besides, who would I call? Why should I call anyone about you? You were calling the police. Oh, no. Honest I wasn't. Let me out of this car. You were going to catch a bus. You were going straight to the police. That's where you were going. But why should I go to the police? You know why. No, no, really, I don't. Because you saw it. You saw his blood. I... I... No, no, you don't. Oh, no, no. There. There, you won't need to try to open that door again. Now. Now we'll be getting along. <laughs> For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Miss Nancy Kelly, whom you have heard in the prologue to Drive In by Mel Dinelli and Muriel Roy Bolton. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Haven't you often realized that many of life's finest enjoyments are simple and moderate rather than the opposite? I give you the words of a high and well-loved authority, Miss Elsa Maxwell, international expert on smart entertaining and gracious living. Good hospitality is always simple, genuine, and moderate. That is why I often suggest enjoyment of delicious Roma Sauterne. When you have friends in to dinner or with your everyday meals. Serve this delicate golden sautern well chilled with any food in any glasses you have. Special wine glasses are pretty but not essential to the enjoyment of Roma wine. Now what can I add to such charming good sense as that? Maybe just this. Roma sautern and all Roma wines are the best that California's magnificent sun-ripened grapes can provide in glorious color, fragrance, and flavor, protected for you by the ancient wine skill of Roma's famed wineries. That's why Roma wines and Roma quality do not vary, never fall short, but are always enjoyable. 
unchanging high quality gives tremendous popularity to Roma wines and makes low cost possible. Only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Miss Nancy Kelly in Drive-In, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. After I made that last try to get out and he broke the handle of the door... All the strength seemed to go out of my body. I just sat there as we drove on. We passed a few people and some cars in the next blocks, and I thought of calling out, and... And then I knew why he'd asked me to roll up the window when I'd first gotten into the car. And then... And then we were at the mouth of the canyon, and I could see the road dark and lonely up ahead. The car twisted and swerved. My arm ached from his strong fingers that had dug into it when I tried to jump out. I looked at him from the corner of my eye. He hadn't seemed like a criminal back at the drive-in. And he didn't seem like one now. His jaw was black from needing a shave. And still his face... Well, it wasn't like a criminal's at all. It, it was so tired. Quit staring at me. Look. Look, I, I didn't know anything about you. Honest, I didn't. Please let me go. You know something about me now. I won't tell anybody. Whatever it is, I promise you I won't. No woman's promises. <laughs> Remind me to tell you a story about a woman and a promise. Let me out. Please let me out right here. It's a long way back to Glendale. Well, that's all the better. It'll take me hours to get back, and, and you'll be miles away by then. I'm not taking any chances with you, kid. Please. Oh, please let me out. I've got to get back. <laughs> you said no one was waiting for you. You live alone, don't you? No one will miss you. We both heard the siren then. He looked quickly into the rear vision mirror. Then he took a gun from his pocket. And he turned to me. If that's for us, and we'll stop, remember this. I've used this gun before tonight. I can use it again if I have to. If I'm taken, you'll go first. But now listen, I'm a doctor and you're a nurse. And we're headed on an emergency. If you want to live, you won't try to pull anything. Now remember that. Remember it. fast for a wet night, aren't you? Called you all the way up from Hollywood. I'm Dr. Morgan, and this is Nurse Johnson on an emergency call. Let's see your identification. Well, let's see. He fumbled for his pocket with one hand, holding the gun to my ribs with the other. The motorcycle cop looked over at me. I thought for a moment that I could signal him with my eyes. But then I knew he wasn't looking at my face. He was looking down at my white starched blouse, which he could see under my raincoat. He thought it was a nurse's uniform. Here you are, officer. Okay, Doc. Sorry I stopped you. Well, that's that. Hey! Hey! Hey, wait a minute! <laughs> what? Well, what's the matter? I, uh, I just wanted to tell you. The rain started to slide up there a ways. Better take it easy. Thanks. I will. You're not Dr. Morgan, are you? What do you think? Then we came to the landslide. It wasn't a big one, but it made a terrible mess of the road. He didn't slow down, and the car swerved crazily as it slipped from one side of the highway to the other. Suddenly... It fell as though the whole rear end had slipped out. I looked over at him. He was tense. His knuckles turned white as he clutched the wheel. He, he shoved the car into reverse. I hoped it would never, never move. And it didn't. We were stuck. Hopelessly stuck. Oh, have all the luck. Suddenly, suddenly the car was filled with light. A car had come around the curve behind us. This might be my chance. Remember, 
I still have this gun. Now, don't try anything. Hey! We're stuck here! Could you give us a push? Thank you very much! Well, have some California hospitality. Oh. I'll have to get out. I'll have to put something under the wheel. You stay here. There. There were some bushes by the side of the road. If I could reach them, I could perhaps run up the side of the hill and hide. And then in the morning, I could make my way back down the canyon. I slipped under the wheel and I carefully turned the handle of the door on his side of the car. I could see him in the mirror. He was at the back of the car. I eased the door gently open. I put one foot out. I was just sliding out when I heard him. You're not going any place. Come here. Give me that raincoat. Why? I need something dry to stuff under this wheel. Oh, but I... You won't be needing it. I hesitated a moment, but he practically ripped it off my back. He wound it into a ball and... Bending down, he stuffed it under the wheel. The gun. It stuck out of his back pocket. If I could get it, if I could lay my hands on it. I held my breath. And I, I reached out. It seemed so far. But I finally touched it. And then... And then I snatched it from his pocket swiftly. Uh, give me that gun. I'm going. You can't stop me now. Can't I? No. No, you stay right where you are. I, w I won't hurt you. All I want is to get home. I'm going, but if you follow me, I'll... You're what? I'll kill you. I don't think you will. Oh, yes, I will. You think I'm afraid? Aren't you? No. No, I don't care what happens to you. You're a murderer. You, you killed somebody. I thought you didn't know anything about I you. didn't, I didn't, but I do now, and I'm going to tell the police. Stay where you are. No, no. I'm, I'm not afraid. I'll shoot! It's too bad I used up all of those tonight. You could have filled me full of holes. <laughs> Give me that gun. Now get in the car. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Are you going to kill me? What do you think? We were nearing the top of the canyon now. The road was very steep. The rain had let up. It was just drizzling now. Even though he hadn't answered my question, I knew the answer. He was going to kill me. I wouldn't get back home tonight. Not tonight or any other night. It was funny. I sometimes used to hate that little apartment of mine where nothing ever happened. But tonight... And then, for some reason, I, I thought about Ruth. What would she say tomorrow when I didn't show up at work? And then... And then I wondered where they'd find my body. Well, here we are. Look out, Martin, the top of the world. Suddenly... We came over the crest of the hill, and way down below, the city stretched out for miles, millions of lights glittering in the rain. For a moment, I forgot everything. It was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. Ever been up here before? No. It's nice, isn't it? Oh, yes. I used to come up here with a girl once. We used to sit and talk for hours. Come on. We'll get a better view if we get out. I knew it was foolish to argue. So I followed him. But as he walked over towards the edge, I became frightened. It was such a steep drop. Well, come on. I'm... I I'm afraid to get so close to the edge. You won't fall. That's Los Angeles over there. That, that bright line of lights is Western Avenue. I went to school somewhere along in there. I used to get into all sorts of trouble at school. But I got by. I managed. 
And everyone said I'd grow out of it. And over that way, towards the ocean, that's Wetswood. That's where she lived. This girl I was telling you about. That was the best part of my life, I guess. That's when they said marriage and a wife would straighten me out. Marriage and a wife would straighten me out in Westwood, they said. <laughs> Does your wife still live there? No. She's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. You needn't be. I killed her. Oh, why? Because she couldn't keep her promises. Did... did you kill her tonight? No. A long time ago. The jury said I was insane. But I think it was the sanest thing I ever did. They put me in an asylum. Do you know what it's like being... being locked up year after year when you know there's nothing wrong with you? No. It isn't good. If you do anything to get out, anything, anything... I knew if I could keep him talking, maybe a car would come along. Maybe something would happen. It was, it was my only chance. What are you thinking about? You, you killed someone else tonight, didn't you? Yes. Dr. Morgan? Yes. He was one of the men who thought I was insane. Why did you do it? I wanted his car to get away in. I didn't want to be locked up anymore. Oh, but they'll catch you. No. No, they won't find the doctor for several days. I saw to that. But how can you be so sure? I do things thoroughly. What are you going to do now? First, I'm going to... Oh. Then I guess I'll go south. I knew what he meant by that pause. I started to back away slowly. I'd made a mistake by reminding him of the present. My hands went instinctively to my pocket for something to defend myself with. I knew there was a pencil there. It was sharp. Maybe I could scratch him or hurt him some way with it. But when I reached for it, I felt something else instead. Something cold and hard. I was puzzled for a moment, and, and then I remembered it was the shaker I'd picked up at the drive-in. You can't get away now. And then he started moving toward me. Me, with only a pencil and a shaker to defend myself with. It's too bad I came into that drive-in tonight. Why did you? Because I was hungry. Because I hadn't eaten for a long time. Weren't you afraid someone would see you? No alarm had gone out. How did you know? I knew. Oh, I'm sorry. If only you hadn't rolled that window down. If, if you're sorry, why don't you let me go? It's too late. A car was coming over the top of the hill. With a sudden movement, his arms were about me in a tight embrace. And I started to scream. But suddenly his lips closed over mine. Pushing my head back roughly, he, he kissed me. I could scarcely breathe. And I, I felt the car's headlights on us like a spotlight. Well, just look at this view, will you? You know, I'll have to do this in a picture sometime. Can't you see we're interrupting something? Hmm? Drive on, will you? Where? Oh, well, in all this rain. You'd think people would have more sense. Come on. He held me a moment longer. And when the car had gone, he released me. My pencil had fallen to the ground, and I was left with only the shaker in my hand. I fingered it nervously, and then I felt the top coming off. I felt the content spilling into my hand. What have you got in your hand? Nothing. Give it to me. No. Give it to me. He grabbed my wrist and he pulled me toward me. We were moving to the edge of the cliff, but my other hand was free and I threw the contents of the shaker into his face. Ah! His hands flew to his face in an effort to clear his eyes. But it was too late. The pepper had blinded him. He lunged out for me, but I stepped aside quickly and he, he slipped in the mud. His hands went out to steady himself. He clawed frantically at thin air, and then I... Then I saw him falling over backwards. Over the edge! Ah! And my strength gave away. And I felt myself sinking down to the ground. Ah! Uh.
I don't know how long I must have been there, but when I came to it, it was raining again. I was soaked to the skin, and there was mud caked in my hair. And there was no one in sight. The lights of Los Angeles stretched out in a pattern peacefully below, and I knew that somewhere at the foot of those hills was Glendale and my apartment. I rose slowly to my feet, and I started back toward the road. And somehow, everything that had happened seemed unreal, like a dream. Everything, except the way he kissed me to keep me from crying out. <laughs> And so closes Drive-In, starring Nancy Kelly. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for Roma Wines, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, our stars are Mr. Robert Young and Margot. The suspense play which stars Robert Young and Margot, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, is a tale of ordeal by fire by Cornell Woolrich. And so, with the night reveals and with the performances of Robert Young and Margot, Roma again hopes to keep you in suspense. Tell us the story, Mr. Jordan. It might help to get it out of your system. Yes. Go ahead, Harry. What? Tell it here, Marie, in front of you? Sure, I can stand it if you can. Well, all right. I'll tell it from when I first began to know, for sure, two weeks ago. I should have known before that something was wrong. I should have known by her eyes. There was a queer look in them, staring at me one minute and avoiding me the next. Well, I came home late one Monday night. They were asleep, my son Johnny and my wife here, Marie. I lay in bed reviewing my day's work. You see, I'm an investigator for the Herkimer Fire Insurance Company. And while thinking about the fire on 2nd Avenue, I fell asleep. Suddenly, I was sitting bolt upright, wide awake, with a strange feeling of being alone in the room. I looked towards Marie's bed. It was too dark to see. I called... Marie. Marie. There was no answer. I got up and walked to her bed. The quilt was bunched up. I pulled the covers down. The bed was empty. In the bathroom. No, she wasn't there. And not in Johnny's room either. Johnny was alone. Marie wasn't in the apartment. I put on the light and looked at my watch. It was two in the morning. Got dressed and walked out and, and rang for the elevator. It was nothing. Of course, it was nothing important, but... My heart kept hammering away. Morning, Mr. Jordan. Kind of late for the... Yes, good morning, Steve. Uh, did you see my wife go down? Yes, Mr. Jordan. About half an hour ago, I'd say. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, did you see which way she went? Yes, she went towards 3rd Avenue. Said she was going went to... Went to the drugstore, I guess. Yes, that's right. There's one over on 96th Street. Open all night. Thanks. That was it. She went to the drugstore. I was worried over nothing at all. I didn't know what to do quite. I didn't want to follow her, but the elevator boy was watching me, so I strolled easily along towards 3rd Avenue. I stood on the deserted dark corner and looked up and down the street. Then I saw her coming. She was walking towards me briskly. Harry! 
What are you doing here? Well, I got up and saw you were gone, and I... I couldn't sleep. I, I had a dreadful headache, so I decided to go down for some aspirin. Yes. Yes, of course, the drugstore on 96th Street. But you were coming from 98th Street. I took a little walk. I thought some fresh air would do me some good. Yes, it is a nice night. I've only been gone about ten minutes. Steve says you were gone about a half hour. It was only ten minutes. What time is it now? 2.35. I've been out for almost 15 minutes. Oh, it's more than... It was 15 minutes, no more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Everything seemed all right. Still, I felt something was wrong. We got into our apartment and we both went to bed. For a minute or so, we said nothing. You've been working hard, Harry. Don't you think you ought to take a week off and sort of rest up? Oh, I feel perfectly all right, dear. There's nothing wrong with me. Listen. A fire. A fire. Yes, not far. Over east a couple of blocks. By the river, I'd say. That's my district. A fire. Oh, what the... Hello. Hello, Harry. I'm sorry to wake you in the middle of the night. There's a bad one over near you between second and third. Maybe a total loss. Between second and third, Mr. Parmeter? Uh, an apartment building? Yeah, 98th Street. 340 East 98. I called you because I'd like you to go there direct first thing in the morning instead of come at the office, okay? I'll meet you there. Okay, Mr. Parmeter. Good night. A fire on 98th Street? Yeah. I couldn't see Marie in the dark. I knew she was staring at me. I was very tired. Good night, Marie. Good night, Harry. This is a story of a husband and a wife. In a moment, as the story continues, we shall learn how they came to know that death was living with them. Tonight, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, brings you Robert Young and Margot as stars of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Robert Young as Harry Jordan and Margot as Marie, his wife, in The Night Reveals, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Go on, Mr. Jordan. Well, gentlemen, the... Next morning, I went over to 98th Street to inspect the remains of number 340 and to see if there was evidence of anything uh, suspicious about the origin of the fire. Mr. Parmenter was there. Well, there it is, gutted. I guess we'll be paying off on this one, all right. Yeah, completely burned out. Uh, anyone hurt? Well, a few, but no one dead. Lucky they just installed the new fire escapes. Just the walls left. Hmm. That fire must have been quite a sight in the height of its glory. Yeah, quite a sight. Man, those walls look pretty bad. They might collapse almost any time. Yeah, the building will have to be raised. That fire did a good job. Oh, here's the commissioner. Hello, Palmer. Well, Jordan. How are you, Mr. Morales? You know anything about the fire commissioner? No, not a thing. Well, we'll take a look. I wouldn't go in there, Jordan. Those walls are pretty oh, I bad. I can take care of myself. Maybe you better not go inside, Harry. Don't worry about me. I know fires as well as anyone. You stay outside, Mr. Parmenter. I'm going in. I walked gingerly into the blackened, ruined hallway ashes up to my ankles until I reached the remains of the stairway. Underneath were several baby carriages, just twisted pieces of metal. A burned fragment of something fell nearby. Come on back, Jordan. I'm all right. I poked around the carriages, sifting through the clean, fine ashes. Something caught my eye. A glob of yellow metal. I picked it up, and I worked my way out. She's going through, isn't she? Yep. Clean through. Nothing left of her. Did you find anything, Harry? Nothing much. The fire started in the hallway, all right. Cellar's untouched. Fire works its way up. Uh, what's that in your hand? Well, that is just a piece of metal I found. Here. I just picked it up for my kid. He likes shiny things. What do you think, Commissioner? Uh, probably one of those gadgets they have on baby carriages. No, I guess you're right. It isn't anything. But it was something. I had run my fingernail across this glob of metal. It looked like gold. I decided to examine it in detail at home. Hello, Daddy. 
How are you, Johnny? Mama says I was bad today. Harry, you're home early. Yes, I got through sooner than I expected, and I... What is it, Harry? Your locket. You're not wearing it. You never had it off before. My locket? Well, I... Don't you remember? Daddy, can I go over to see Davy Taylor for a minute? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Johnny. All right. Gee, thanks, Daddy. You shouldn't have done that. I didn't want him to go. He hasn't had his dinner. Never mind, Johnny. Uh... What did you say happened to the locket? Well, I gave it to you. To me? Yes, I I put it in your pocket to have it fixed. The catch was loose. I don't remember. You've been very forgetful lately. Very forgetful. Maybe you thought you gave it to me. No, no, I, I, I put it in your pocket, Harry. I forgot to mention it to you. I wanted you to take it to the jewelers and get the catch fixed. I just put it in your coat pocket while you were shaving. When? Yesterday. Yes. Yesterday morning. Then it should be in my pocket now. I wore this suit yesterday, too. Nothing in my pockets, Marie. Well? Marie. Yes, Harry? Is anything uh, wrong with you? Don't you feel... With me? No, no, of course not. I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. There's not a thing wrong with me. You look worried, as if you've got something on your mind. Oh, it's nothing. I've just been having a headache. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. Oh, no, it really doesn't amount to much. Well, I think I'll take another look for the locket. Uh, Which suit did you say you put it in? Your blue suit, I think. Or maybe it was the gray, though. I I don't... I couldn't make it out. What had she done with the locket? Had she pawned it? Had she given it away? Then I remembered something. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I looked at this shapeless little glob of yellow metal. I rubbed the blackened spots away, all of it until it was gleaming. I studied it, turning it over and over. I noticed a thin crack. It was small, so I took a nail file out of the medicine chest and began to file it. I kept filing until I had enlarged the crack to the full length of a piece of gold. Then I slipped the nail file inside and pried, pried it open. Tiny fragments of glass, and then... Then I saw a piece of scorched paper. It was a photograph. Picture of my son, Johnny. This glob of metal was my wife's locket. I put the locket in the picture in my pocket and walked out. For the next hour, I sat trying to read a book while Marie busied herself, first feeding Johnny and then helping him with his homework. What's the largest continent in the world? Oh, I know. It's, uh, it's Asia. And the next largest? Oh, that's easy. Africa. It's full of jungles. That's where Tarzan lives. Isn't it time for Johnny to be in bed? Oh, yes. I I had no idea it was so late. Run along to your room, Johnny. I'll be in in a minute. All right, Mother. Good night, Dad. Good night, Johnny. Sleep well. He's getting along very well in school, except for arithmetic. He seems to be having a little trouble. Oh, Johnny will be all right. Yes. Johnny will be all right. I know he'll be all right. I watched her. She seemed very uneasy. I walked over to my pipe rack where I kept several books of matches in a jar. There weren't any there. All this time, I knew she was watching me, watching me closely. I looked behind the rack. There wasn't a match around. What the devil happened to all my matches? I I have a match here. Let me light it for you. Did you take the matches out of the jar, Marie? Well, I, uh... Did you? Yes, I, I, I needed them in the kitchen. Shall I, shall I light your pipe for you? No, I'll, I'll light it myself. I picked a match out of the booklet. It was a clean white match with a green head. I struck it against the side. The match sputtered up into a yellow flame, fringed on the bottom with blue. Marie stared at it, till I felt the sharp bite of the flame on my thumb. Would, would you like a cup of tea, Harry? No, dear, I don't think so. I watched her. Her hand casually brushed along the table and picked up the matches. Marie! Oh, oh. Leave the matches on the table. I need them. I'm rather short of matches, and the pilot light isn't working. Is this the only book of matches in the house? I, I, I'll have to get some tomorrow. Where are you going, Harry? Get a drink of water. No, no. I, I'll get it for you, Harry. Never mind, Marie. I'll get it myself. I went into the kitchen. There was a paper bag alongside the gas range. Matches. All thrown in, helter-skelter. Books of matches and safety matches, all mixed together. I walked back and sat down in my chair... She sat a few feet away, torturing a handkerchief. 
She looked so helpless and terrified that my anger passed away. Marie, you've been having headaches lately. Perhaps you ought to see a doctor. You haven't been looking too well. I'm just tired. It's nothing serious. Look, um, how would you like to go away for a few days? Take a vacation. I'll get a maid to take care of Johnny and me. It'll do you a lot of good. No, no, I don't need a vacation. There's nothing wrong with me, but, Harry, there is... Yes? Uh, there's nothing the matter with... You were about to say something else. I... I've got to go into Johnny's room and see that he's covered. He always throws the covers off. I sat there looking at the door. Then I glanced about the room. There was the pack of matches lying open on the table. I closed the cover and my eye caught her purse lying nearby. It was bulging. Harry! Well, what's the matter? My, my purse! Yes. Yes, your purse. Here, look. See, the handle's loose. And it's full of matches. A dozen books of them. And these newspaper clippings. Give it back to me. Why are you saving these clippings? Why do you carry matches with you? I bought the matches in a store. They were a dozen for five cents. And these clippings. Look here. Fire on 112th Street causes severe damage. And these others. Why are you saving these clippings, Marie? But there's nothing wrong in that. I, I'm interested. Interested in your work. I, I intend to keep a file on fires. It'll help you in your work. Well, that's very considerate, Marie. Oh, Harry. You're so good. Why should this have to happen to us? Towards midnight, I went to bed. Marie didn't follow me. I lay in the semi-darkness, wide awake, trying to think what I should do. I couldn't collect my thoughts. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see the flame of the match, yellow and blue, crawling along the matchstick. Then Marie came in with a cup of steaming liquid. Drink this, Harry. It'll help you sleep. Oh, what is it? It's cocoa. It's very good for you. I'm not the one that's having trouble falling asleep. We both couldn't sleep last night. I'm taking some of this myself as soon as I go to bed. All right, leave it on the nightstand. Be sure to drink it while it's hot. Yes, Marie, I will. Good night, darling. Good night, Marie. Coco. Then suddenly I knew. I looked around quickly for something to pour it in. There was a radiator pan. It was empty. I poured the cup of liquid into it. Then I lay back and waited. Waited for her next move. About a half hour later, I heard the door open softly and Marie tiptoed towards my bed. Harry. Harry. Are you asleep? I didn't answer, but breathed evenly. She hovered for a moment over me, then she tiptoed out, carefully closing the door behind her. I dashed out of bed and hurried into my clothes. Quickly, I poured the liquid from the pan into a bottle and put it into my pocket. Then I grabbed my coat and followed her. I rang for the elevator. She had only a few minutes headway. I would catch up to her easily and then... Then we'd have a showdown. Steve looked at me with controlled amazement. Uh, hello, Steve. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Uh, my wife went down a moment ago, didn't she? Yes, Mr. Jordan. Just took her down. She went towards 3rd Avenue, didn't she? Uh, I think so. She sort of stopped me for a minute and then turned towards 3rd. Had to get back to the elevator because you were ringing. <laughs> When I reached the corner, I looked up and down 3rd Avenue, and I saw her. She was walking north. I crossed to the other side of the street and followed her, keeping at a distance. At 98th Street, she turned east. Down the middle of the block was the remains of last night's fire. She paused in front of the gutted building for a long time, just stood there, looking at it. Then she walked inside. I waited for a few seconds and then followed her. It was pitch dark in the burnt-out hallway. Ahead of me, I could see the glow of a match. Then I saw what she was doing. She was collecting the charred debris near the baby carriages. How foolish. There wasn't anything that could burn there now. She lit another match. I watched the flame light up her face. A face so intent upon her work that she didn't hear me approach. Marie? Who's there? It's me, Harry. Harry, why did you... Come along, Marie. We'd better get out of here. The police. I took her hand and without a word she came along. We walked home in complete silence. We both knew. When we came to our apartment house, I stopped and rang for the elevator. In the light of the hallway, I could see her face. My wife's face. Ashy gray. Her eyes bright and painful. Uh, you run upstairs, Marie. I'll be along in a minute. Harry, where, where are you going? I'll be right back. Please, Harry, don't, don't do anything. You run along, Marie. 
You're not going to... No, I'm only going to the drugstore to get something. I'll be back in a few minutes. I came home a half hour later. She was waiting for me. Did you? Did you do it, Harry? Harry, please, please tell me. I've got to know. I had the cocoa you gave me analyzed. I'm sorry. I I had to do it. Don't you see? I couldn't help it. It was very easy for the druggist, especially when I told him what I thought was in it. Sodium amatol. That's the stuff that makes you sleep through an earthquake. Please try to understand, Harry. You must understand. Is the kid asleep? Yes, Johnny's all right. I was sorry for Marie. She looked so haggard and worn. It wasn't her fault. I'm sorry for myself. My head was roaring. I wasn't feeling too well. Kept seeing sparks in front of my eyes. I closed my eyes for a moment. Let's go to bed, Harry. Marie, we can do something. Let's let's burn up every match. Every match in the house. We'll never bring another match in here. No, no, Harry, we can't do that. You don't want to? No, Harry, not now. See, this is the first book. It's turning black. We'll do it with every book of matches. It's no use. It's no use, Harry. Strange, isn't it, that this should happen to me? Me, a fire inspector. That's funny. Give me the matches, Marie. All the matches. No, I can't do it. I won't. Give them to me. Please, please, please don't take them. I'll do anything you want, anything. Where did you hide them? Tell me, where are they? Inside the rage. Behind the paper bag. I dropped her hand and she sank to the floor in a huddle, weeping. (laughs) Then I went into the kitchen and got all the matches. By now, my anger was cooling off. Look, Marie, look up. See, I'll light each book of matches one at a time until they're all gone up in smoke. Yellow flame licked its way down the matches. The cover caught fire and blackened. I watched her look at the flame with dazed eyes. Listen. Listen, Harry, do you hear? Just someone in the hall. Oh, it's more than someone. Something's happened. Something has happened. I'll take a look. Hey, Mr. Jordan, the house is on fire. The house, the house is on fire. Yes, Marie, wake up, Johnny. Johnny, Johnny. We'll have to hurry. The flames are coming up the stairs. There's an upward draft. <sighs> The house is on fire. We've got to get out, Johnny. Come on. It's too late to go down. We'll have to go up through the roof. Oh, I've, I've hurt my leg. Come along, Johnny. Well, mother, wait for mother. She'll come along. No, no, I want to wait for mother. It's all right, Johnny. Go along with Daddy. I'll follow you. No, no, I won't go. I won't go without you, Mother. Hold on to my arm, Marie. Come on. Give me your hand, Johnny. Don't be scared. The fire won't hurt you. It won't hurt you at all. You're safe with me. We made our way upstairs, very slowly, because of Marie's sprained ankle. Finally, we got to the roof. There were some firemen on the next roof, about ten feet separated the two buildings. Don't get panicky! We'll get you off safely! Are we... are we going to have to jump across, Daddy? Because Mother won't be able to jump for her foot. It's all right, Johnny. Don't be scared. Uh, they're putting a board across the two roofs. We'll just walk across. All right, now. One at a time. Tie the rope around you and come across. Johnny, you go first. Don't be afraid. There, now the rope will hold you in case you slip. Mother, you gotta go first. I'll go right after you, Johnny. You, you promise? Go ahead, Johnny. Another will follow you. Uh, don't turn around. Keep walking. All right. Kids safe. Now you, lady. Be careful, the board. Hey, the board slipped off. Hurry, one of you guys. Get another board. Mother! Mother! I want my friend. Your mother's gonna be all right, kid. You pushed the board off, Harry. I saw you do it. No, no, I didn't, Marie. I didn't. All right, lady. Let's tie the rope around you. Don't be afraid. Don't look down. Ready? Okay, boys. She's all right. Now you, mister. That's right. Tie the rope around you. Okay. All set? Okay. On the ground, we stood there, the three of us, watching the fire. Sparks were shooting up through the hole where it had bitten through. Great flames shot out, stabbing at the sky. The top of the roof was burning now. Red flame crawled along, searching out the inflammable spots. A wooden pole caught fire and blazed up in a long, narrow, curving arc. The wind was helping her. All this time, Marie was shaking, shaking violently, not with cold. I pitied her. And then she threw up her hands and shrieked. Ah! Ah! Harry! No, no, darling, don't. I don't. can't. I can't stand it. We can't go on this way. 
Police! Police, come here! Don't do it, Marie. There's no oh. need to. Not the police. You don't know what you're saying. You. What is it, lady? You'd better calm down now. You, uh... Officer, please. No, 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 it's no t- use, Harry. Officer, these awful fires. They're not accidental. There's a pyromaniac, a criminal. What? And I know who it is. You've got to arrest the person. Arrest. So there won't be any more. All right, lady. Now, what is this? Who is the pyromaniac? The criminal is my husband. Hurry, Jordan. This man here. Arrest him, officer. <laughs> That's about all there is to the story, gentlemen. Then I was brought here. Must have sounded kind of, well, painful for you to hear it all over again, Marie. No. It was all right, Harry. I wonder, um, I got a cigarette. Could I... No, I'll light it for you, Harry. You don't have to worry. I won't try and keep the matches here. She's been awfully good to me, gentlemen. You'll take good care of her, won't you? She tried everything to help. She hid the matches so as to keep them from me. She even tried to give me sleeping pills so I wouldn't... It's all right, Harry. I'm sorry about the locket, dear. Must have fallen out of my coat when I was in that building at 98th Street. I... It's all right, Harry. You can buy me another one sometime. You... You can't blame anybody for liking fires. It's not their fault. Fires are beautiful to watch. So bright and clean. They burn up all the filth and dirt. And they're magnificent to watch. Especially the big ones. The way the flames roar and crackle, lighting up everything around you. The beautiful fire. The beautiful fire. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. I'm very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who is tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. We came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story. But I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with the sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. 
I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny. Quite possibly, a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. Doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed, and sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story, The Hitchhiker. I'm in an auto camp on... Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I gotta tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age. Unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it's not me who's gone mad. It's something else. Something utterly beyond my control. I've got to speak quickly. At any minute, the link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, give me a kiss. And I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. Oh, no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Hey, what's this? Tears? I thought you'd promise me you wouldn't cry. I know, dear. I'm sorry. But I... I do hate to see you. I'll be back. It'll only be the... On the course, three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's, it's just the trip. Ronald, I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you're a bit careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Oh, gosh. I think I was still 17 here, you two. Oh, and why, I mean, as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, son? Of course I will. Don't you worry. There's nothing going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads. With a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in fine spirits drive ahead of me, even the loneliness seemed like a lark. I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then late that night... I saw him again. It's on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him. Standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I'd seen quite distinctly the bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hallooed at me this time. 
Hello? Hello? Stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides the coincidences or whatever it was, neither the Willies. Stopped at the next gas station. Uh, fill her up. Certainly, sir. Check your oil, sir? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it hasn't been raining here recently, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh? Oh, I, I suppose that doesn't done your business any harm. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turnpike this season of the year. I suppose not. What, uh, uh, uh what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? What's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Why? Oh, a guy'd be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. Then, you've never seen anybody? No. Maybe they get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Uh, no. Oh, no, not, not at all. It's just uh, a technical question. <laughs> I see. Well, that'll be just a dollar forty-nine with the tax. The thing gradually passed through my mind A sheer coincidence I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh I didn't think about the man all next day Until Until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio I saw him again It was a bright sunshiny afternoon The peaceful Ohio fields Brown with the autumn stubble lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour in front of the barrier. He was standing. Now let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting. Almost drooping a little, the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello? 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 No, not just now, sorry. Go to California? No, not today. The other way, going to New York, sorry. I got the car back on the road again. I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of <clears throat> picking him up, of having him sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. At the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. Fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yeah, we do in the daytime. But we're closed up now for the I night. know, when I was wondering if you could possibly have a cup of coffee, black coffee, just... No, not this time of night, mister. My wife's the cook. She's a man. No, no, don't shut the door, please. Listen, just a minute ago... Uh, <laughs> just a minute ago, there was a man standing here right beside the stand, a suspicious-looking man. I, I don't mean to disturb it. You see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. How was he doing? Well, nothing. You've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. Now, on your way before I call out Sheriff Oates. I 
got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to, to rest a little. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. A few resort places there were closed, only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. next afternoon. I stopped a car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks, leaning against a telephone pole. Perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, bearing the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then. Something went wrong with the car. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell ringing and the cry of its whistle. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. No. I frustrated him that time. The starter worked at last. I managed to back up. When the train passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself alone on the road for one minute. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Oh, uh, well, where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee. Uh, you mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. Have you hitchhiked much? Sure, only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Uh, I should think it would be, though. I'll bet you get a good pickup in a fast car. If you did, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, couldn't you? I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm, I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip about 45 miles an hour. Uh, couldn't, couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for a list beat me to town... Or any town, provided she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. <laughs> Imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Why, I just enjoy myself. Every minute of the time, I'd sit back and, and relax. And if I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey, look out! Did you see it? See who? A man standing beside the barbed wire fence. Oh, I didn't see anybody. I, it wasn't nothing but a bunch of cows and, and a wire fence. No? What do you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed There's wire fence? a man fence? there, I tell you. A thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. And I, I was trying to... Run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? You say you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul. 
as far as watch that's concerned. Watch for him the next time and keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute. There. Look there. Look there. <laughs> this door work. I, I'm getting out Did of here. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't... I... I don't know what came over me, but please don't go. So if you'll excuse me... You Mr. can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No, thanks. Uh-uh. Thanks just the same. Listen, same. please, just... Just one minute, please. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. Please. There. I got it now. Now, you can't go. Please, come Leave your back. hands off me. Do you hear? Leave please. your hands off me. She ran from me. As though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. It was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when I saw him coming toward me. Emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello! Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there. For now he began to be everywhere. Wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for... Drink a pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich. He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. I was sitting near the drinking fountain of a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was... I was afraid to stop now. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried-up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in that pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Your call, please. Long distance. Long distance, certainly. This is long distance. I'd like, uh, I'd like to put a, in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. I'm a, the, the number is Beechwood 200828. Certainly. I will try to get it for you. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beechwood 200828. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It's the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall and white-haired in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. Be enough, I thought, 
just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right, deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello, hello, Mother. This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What? Oh, who is this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie? I, I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beechwood 208828? Yes. Uh, oh, where, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who the... is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Well, what's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this Nervous calling? breakdown? Well, my grandmother never was nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Death of her... Death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what's this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so... So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in... Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to get hold of myself. Otherwise, I am going to go crazy. Outside, it's night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa, mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them, he's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. Ends the Hitchhiker, and to Orson Welles our considerable thanks for his playing of the title role. Mr. Welles, help wanted. Men, women, and children. Nature of work, hard, monotonous, back-breaking labor. Hours, 75 a week minimum. Pay, few cents an hour. Added inducement. Two meals a day, including several ounces of bad bread and a cup of thin soup. Don't delay. Apply at once. How would you respond to a want ad like that, Mr. and Mrs. American working man and woman? You'd laugh, wouldn't you, and throw the paper in the trash basket. Dismiss the whole advertisement as some kind of a joke, but believe me, it's no joke. It's a simple statement of the working conditions that exist today in Nazi Germany and the conquered countries under Nazi rule. It's also an exact statement of the working conditions that will be imposed on you and every member of your family if the Nazis win this war. You yourself personally can stop them from winning, as you know. You don't have to give up your well-paid job to do it. You needn't have to be a soldier or a sailor or an airman or a nurse or a war worker to ensure American victory. Uncle Sam doesn't ask plain, ordinary, hard-working citizens like you to give him anything. All he asks, all this he does ask very seriously and very urgently, 
is that you loan him ten cents out of every dollar you make. That's all there is to it. Lend Uncle Sam a dime to win this war. And he'll pay you back with interest when he's won it. The easiest, most convenient way to lend him these dimes is to enroll in the payroll savings plan. Just tell your boss to deduct ten cents from every dollar he pays you and lend it to Uncle Sam in your name. Sign up for this simple savings plan today, and when victory comes, you will have war bonds in your pockets instead of Axis bonds on your wrists. Suspense will be heard again two weeks from tonight. Next Wednesday night, September 9th, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present over many of these stations at 9.30 p.m. Eastern wartime an address by W. Averill Harriman, the United States Land Lease Administrator in London. Mr. Harriman, as the personal representative of the President of the United States, attended the Moscow conferences between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Next Wednesday's broadcast will be Mr. Harriman's first public address since his return to this country. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Lucille Fletcher. The original score was by Bernard Herrmann. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense, tonight we present Menace in Wax by John Dixon Carr. During the French Revolution of 1793, a Swiss girl copied in wax the severed heads of those who had just been guillotined. She married a Frenchman named Toussaint and came to London, and she founded Madame Toussaint's Waxworks. There it is, still in Marylebone Road, near Baker Street Station. Not the original building. That was destroyed by fire. But it remained untouched when a darker shadow than revolution came to England. They plastered high explosives all along that road and hit the cinema next door. We are going to London under the bomber's moon. Late one night in March of 1941, a young man hurried up to the great glass doors of Madame Toussaint. Hey, open up here. Isn't there a night watchman around this place? There is, Governor, and I'm him. Now, what do you want at this hour of the night? My name is Rogers. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh. If you let me get inside, I'll show you my press card. Didn't you get any orders about me? Well, maybe I have at that. Oh, you're the bloke who wants to see the Chamber of Horrors. That's right. <laughs> All right, you may as well come in. My paper got a tip. There's something funny going on around here. Something funny going on here? Yeah, that's a good one. The raid's not very heavy tonight, is it? No, they're going over. You ain't heard where, Governor. We got a teletype flash that there was the Midlands. Lord Lummy, and I've got a sister in Birmingham. Oh, why can't she come and stop in a nice, safe place like London? There's the Regent's Park guns opening up again. My two teeth rattle and shakes the hats off the dummies' heads. You know, this chamber of ours is getting to be popular tonight. You mean there's been somebody here before me? Yes. A woman? That's right, Governor. About five feet, two inches tall, very pretty. 
If you like them, brunette and big-eyed and a phony French accent. No, Governor, no. This was only an old lady that lost her handbag. Oh, thank the Lord for that anyway. Now then, what is going on around here? Well, I don't know, Governor. You'll have to ask Pearson about that. Who's Pearson? Oh, he's the bloke that's the watchman down there. He's old and he imagined things. He phoned your piper. <laughs> have you got an electric torch? Yes. Then go straight on through the marble hall and down the stairs on your left. And don't speak to the policeman, because he's wax. <laughs> yes, that's the way, Governor. That's the way to the Chamber of Horrors. Thank you. Pearson. Hello, Pearson. Pearson. Yes, sir. Huh? You're looking for me. Oh, uh... I didn't see you there. I must have thought you were one of these wax dummies. Uh, ugly dim light, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Rogers is my name. I'm from the Daily Record. Oh, yes. I'm glad you came over. I phoned your paper myself. Maybe I'm just imagining things, but... Uh... Oh, I don't blame you. This place would make anybody nervous, especially during an air raid. Uh, well, sir, it's all right as long as you don't get to imagine they're watching you. Oh, and do you? Oh, yes. Sometimes. That's the gambling group in the center there. Uh-huh. What's that thing over there? That's the famous guillotine. Oh, wait a minute, old boy. You're not trying to tell me that's the original guillotine. No, uh, that was burnt in the fire. Madame Toussaint bought it from Sanson, the executioner. Let me tell you something, Mr. Rogers. What? Years ago... This is straight. A young French woman came in here. There was nobody else in the place. She thought it would be great fun to say she'd put her neck in the same guillotine as Marie Antoinette. So she climbed up on that platform. She snapped the little wooden collar down round her neck, shutting herself in. All of a sudden, she realized she didn't know which spring controlled the collar and which spring controlled the knife. Oh, good Lord, she didn't... No. But they say she went crazy. They say she screamed and screamed. What's that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you, but... Sweet mama, I'm so scared myself, I cannot help it. Susie. Oh, no, 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 not Susie. Susie, you make it so it rhyme with floozy. That is not nice. Why, you little devil. I ought to turn you across my knee. What are you doing here? And will you forget that French accent? You're driving me crazy. Uh, you know this young lady, sir. Do I? She works for my paper. She's haunting me. Oh, Bert, that's not nice. I like the way I talk. I only try to give you ideas. That's just what I mean. Now, take your arms from around my neck. Uh, she's French, sir. Her mother came from New York, like I did. She's got some funny ideas, accents, and disguises. So, I dress up as an old lady, and I come along, too. That is clever, no? Definitely no. But I go into what I think is the lady's room, and there is Jack the Ripper. I'm so scared, I almost kick the ghost. Whatever else you do, miss, for the love of heaven, put out that cigarette. It is not permitted? It is what they are most afraid of in this place. Fire. If you vouch for this young lady, Mr. Rogers... I don't vouch for anybody. But go on now. What's all the mystery here at Madame Tussauds? You see the group over there? It's called the Gamblers. That three men and a woman in 18th century costume sitting around a table playing cards? Yes. And about once a week, when the lights are out... Yes? Those dummies do play cards... Is this a publicity trick of some kind? Oh, no, sir. Then what's the game? I'm not crazy. I know they don't actually do it, sir. What I want to know is who changes the cards round in their hands and why? Well, could anybody, anybody from the outside, I mean, get in to change the cards? Oh, yes. There's a back door. But why would anyone want to break in here just to change those cards around? Mon cher Ben, écoutez, listen. I have made a discovery. Listen, if you're going to talk, speak English. Or better yet, just keep still. But I have made a discovery. This card game... What about it? It is crooked. Here is a man which has two deuces of hearts in the same hand. Listen, Susie, I don't give a... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Let's have a look at those cards. I give you ideas, yes. Susie, for once you're right. And look here. Two of these players have all the clubs and hearts. The other two have all the diamonds and spades. Susie, how many letters in the alphabet? Twenty-six, no. And twice twenty-six is... Fifty-two. The number of cards in a pack. Give me a pencil, Susie, quick. The War Office, Whitehall. MI5, Headquarters of Military Intelligence. There next morning in the map room, used as an office by Colonel Warrender. Mr. Rogers, I'm a busy man. I appreciate that, Colonel Warrender. Anyhow, sit down. Thank you, sir. Now, what's all this? These cards you claim form a code, is that it? Yes, sir. Now, look, sir. Let each letter of the alphabet represent a card in clubs and hearts. That's 26. And then? And then when you get to the middle of the message, switch the alphabet over to diamonds and spades. Then you won't keep on repeating. Now, will you read what I've got written on this piece of paper? Jack of diamonds, Q. Three of clubs, F. Well, that doesn't seem to mean much. Oh, never mind the cards, Colonel. Just read the letters. Q F A C T O R Y. Yes, sir. Q Factory. Go on. Uh, oh, just a moment. What is that infernal noise? Johnson Burroughs. Uh, don't bother what? with that, sir. Just read the message, please. Oh. Q Factory. 10 p.m., 15th. Today's the 15th of March, Colonel. Uh, all preparations made. Use dive bombers. I see. Uh, this message was left openly. So openly that nobody ever noticed it. Yes, the trick's been tried before. No contacts, no gatherings, no letters that might be intercepted. A whole spy ring could walk through that wax museum and read the message without being seen. You newspaper men trying to teach me my job? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I only... No, no, go on. Well, don't you see? Three or four little boats with portable wireless sets go down the Thames estuary. When they're beyond pursuit, they send that message by radio. Somebody listens. And it's no secret in Fleet Street, sir, that... Q factory is out in the wilds of Glebeshire. Uh, it's no secret anywhere. And that we're making the Shaftesbury bomber out there. So tonight, unless we do something about it, they're coming over and bomb Q factory to blazes. Uh, it's impossible. Why? Or can't you tell me? I can tell you this much. Yes, sir. Q factory is so well hidden that even our own pilots can't find it from the air. That's one objection to this message. Any other objection? Yes, this talk about dive bombers. Dive bombers in a night attack... What's the good of a dive bomber if he can't see his objective? Well, suppose somebody showed a light. He'd be shot dead as soon as he showed it. Every inch of country for a quarter of a mile round the factory. A quarter of a mile, Mr. Rogers, is patrolled day and night. Well, just the same. They're going to have a try at it, sir. How? I don't know how. Then if you'll excuse me, Mr. Rogers... Well, listen, I... Colonel Warner. Will you give me a pass to go down there to the factory? Certainly not. No one's permitted to go there except the workers. How is the place defended? There's a night fighter station nearby, and several batteries of four 3.7 guns. Then give me a pass to the fighter station or to the gun post. That's a legitimate newspaper request. Well, I, I might manage a pass to one of the gun posts here. Then you'll do it. Well, what on earth is that infernal row? It sounds like somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. Yes, as a matter of fact, Colonel, it is somebody locked up in a coat cupboard. A young lady, so-called. A young lady? Who locked her up? I did. And just what the devil do you mean, sir, locking up people in coat cupboards in the war office? Well, she's a bit excitable, Colonel. I thought that uh, she'd better not see you. Oh, thanks for the consideration. Uh, there's just one other favor I'd like to ask. As well? If she asks you for a pass, don't give it to her. Don't give it to her under any circumstances. Well, what's her name? Susie Dubois. <laughs> You're rather too late for that, young man. The public relations office granted her a pass two hours ago. What? Oh... A woman to an anti-aircraft battery? Uh, this is what we call a mixed battery. Women on the guns as well as men. She said it would make a good human interest story for the press. I, mm. I must say, I agree with her. Uh, well, one moment, Mr. Rogers, before you go. Yes, sir. That gun post is fully two miles from the factory. You can go there, but if you take one step further, you'll be shot on sight by our guards. I warn you. I'll be careful, Colonel. I'll be careful. Somewhere in the west country, a yellow moon shines over bare trees. A white mist moving clings to the ground.
Susie, are you sure we're on the right road? Oh, mon cher, they have taken away all the signposts in case there is an invasion. I know that. But I follow the map. The map cannot be wrong. We've been driving for hours. Must be... Yes, it is, nearly half past nine. Half an hour to go. Trees, trees, and still more trees. Look, there's a break in the trees ahead. It will be open country in a minute. Yeah. That's funny. Look how deep the leaves are here on the road. But one thing I tell you, just between you and me and the bedposts... Gateposts, Susie. The term is between you and me and the gateposts. And speak English. I am speaking English very well, thank you. I do not need your help to be pure. All right, all right. Now, this map. Well, what about it? It say we should go through a lot of villages. Mitford, Archardine, and Saffron Weville. I have not seen any villages. Did you say Mitford? Oui, monsieur. Susie, let me have a look at that map. Come on, come on, hand it over. But what is wrong? It is a perfectly good map. Yes, Susie. It's a fine map. It's an excellent map. Only it's a map of the wrong county. I have made a mistake? No? I don't even believe you can read. This is a map of Barsetshire. We should be somewhere in Glebeshire. Now, where in the devil are we? We're at the entrance to some kind of clearing with leaves oh. on it. Oh! What was that? Hello there! Somebody calling us. And if we're in forbidden area... I see him now. Where? He's behind us. He came out of a white cottage back there. It's a big, heavy man. With a mustache. Never mind the mustache. He's wearing some kind of a uniform and he's got a rifle. You think he plug us? No? I think it is not unlikely. Get out those war office passes of ours. Quick. Good evening, my friend. Uh, good evening. Can you tell me... No, we don't mean any harm. Uh, oh, 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 Can no. you tell me what time it is? Oh. oh. <laughs> what time it is? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, 28 and a half minutes past nine. Thank you. I will keep you covered while I set my watch. There. Yeah. My next question is, would you like me to shoot you both? No. Listen, Mr. Uh, Mr. McAllister. Captain. Captain McAllister. That's that right? right. Well, Captain, uh, this girl, uh, she's been reading the wrong map. You see, we don't even know where we are. You're in Hollywood Forest, my friend. Hollywood Forest. Is that good or bad? And you don't know what's just beyond the edge of this clearing? No. There's a big open space of a quarter of a mile. In the middle of that open space... Q Factory. We're right on top of it. Then you have heard of Q Factory, my friend. Captain McAllister, we're from the war office, and we've got passes to prove it. Let's see the passes. We were trying to find gun site number... Uh, I've forgotten the number, but it's here on that card. You've passed the gun site. Two miles back up the road. All right. Here are your passes. What are you going to do to us? Uh, I'm not in the regular army. You can thank your stars I'm not. I'm forestry preservation. Oh. You are not going to chuck us in the cooler, even? <laughs> no. Now turn that car on, get back along this road as fast as you can. If they fire at you, as they probably will... Oh, or... I wish I am home. Pray no, Mao, I wish I am home. Well, then hope for the best. My watch had stopped and you did me a good turn. Now hurry along. Hurry. Begun sight of heavy attack battery. Four 3.7 guns against a moon growing clear white. White as the concrete emplacements, sealed against light where the crews, men and women, sitting, waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, sir, uh, glad to have you both here. But this idea of yours about dive bombers attacking a blacked-out factory in the uh, middle of a forest is uh, rather fantastic, don't you think? Well, I admit it doesn't make much sense, Captain Bronson, but I have a hunch that I'm right. Well, glad you and Miss Susie drove out. Don't see many strangers. Frightfully boring. Nice country, of course. Good air and everything, but dull. Dull as ditch water. What's that? Only some of the lads and lasses inside. Like to uh, walk along the emplacement here? Oh, is that allowed? Oh, certainly, old boy. Why not? 
Bright moon tonight, isn't it? Yes, farmer's moon. We, uh, we nearly get shot on our way here. Quiet, Susie. We're not supposed to have been there. If I nearly get shot, I am going to say I nearly get shot. It was a man which is called, uh, uh, McAllister. Oh, old Mac. Uh, very decent sort, Mac. He's a, a tree doctor. A what? Tree doctor. Got to have wood, you know. The trees start to die. Mac goes round the edge of the clearing and smears him with stuff to keep him well. Uh, how did you come to meet him? Well, the fact is, uh, we nearly got as far as the factory tonight. Oh, <laughs> Then you were lucky to get back alive. There weren't any barrage balloons over the factory, I noticed. Uh, hardly, old boy. They wouldn't advertise, would they? With balloons in open country? And if the Germans did use dive bombers? Oh, they're not coming, old boy. Just make up your mind to that. I wonder if you'll say so at ten o'clock. But it is ten o'clock. It's, uh... Well, it's just ten now. Well, it can't be. We drove here like blazes. It was only half past nine then. Well, then your watch must be very slow, old boy. No, I'm afraid you're wrong. I've never seen it quieter. Cold tonight, very dry for March. Look all around you. Moonlight, open country, not a sign of life in it. Quiet, peaceful, and silent as the great... What was that? By George, I think we've got some visitors. I think we're going to see some fun. Enemy planes approaching south-southwest. Action stations. Enemy planes approaching south-southwest. Now, do you believe me? Better stand back, old boy. Operation crew's coming on. I said, now do you believe me? I want you to watch these girls work. They do everything, you know, except actually fire the guns. Now, 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 keep your hair on, old boy. Susie, he still can't see it. Oh, they'll only be going over. You think so? Oh, yes. We sometimes get a crack at them when they're making for Bristol. Standing by for action. Standing by. Listen. heard that noise a thousand times. But every time I hear it, I get sick. Mm -hmm. They're flying ruddy low, you know. Just what I was thinking. Spotter! Spotter! Any identification? Yonkers, 88. Dive bombers. Right, 5,200. Now, look here, you two newspaper people. Yes, sir? There might be things popping, you know, can't tell. I'd like to get below. Oh, no, thanks. I don't like this, Bert, but I'll stay, too. Range finder. Range finder. On target. Look here, you two. The, those war office passes you gave me, uh, I'm not supposed to keep them. No, I'd better give them back, just in case. Predictor. Predictor. On target. Here we go, ladies and gents. Fire. <laughs> Headquarters message, sir. Fire. Yes, Corporal. Open fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Night fighters taking off. Hold fire. Message understood. What is the matter with them? With who? Those barge planes. They're still a good way off, but they don't come any closer. Hmm. Must be going over after all. They're circling. I think they're waiting for a signal. Anyhow, here are your war office passes. You. Well, you seem to have got them all smeared with oil. Oil? That is all right, mon cher. When we get them back from Captain McAllister, they have oil on them. I think maybe he dropped them on the leaves, because there's oil on the tires of the car, too. Then I think how always in this we meet things that burn. At Madame Tussauds last night, they would not let me smoke a cigarette in case of fire. Fire? That's it, fire. What's the matter with you, old boy? Why did that fella, way out at the end of nowhere, want to know what time it was? Are you scatty? McAllister, you told me so yourself. He goes around the edges of the clearing and smears the trees with stuff to keep them well. well. What about it? Suppose it was crude oil. Suppose between each tree he laid an invisible fuse of dead leaves soaked in oil. I, uh, I don't understand. In 30 seconds, a complete square of fire runs around the limits of the factory grounds. That draws the bombers in. Then as the flames blaze higher, they've got enough light to dive on their target. There. Our night fighters are letting loose. Brunson, I see it all now. Come on. We've got to get to that tree, Dr. McAllister. It's a matter of minutes. Susie, is 
Branson following in the car behind us? Yes. He's following in men with rifles. We've got to get to McAllister's cottage. This McAllister... I'll bet you ten to one. The real McAllister is either dead or tied up in that cottage. The fellow we saw was an imposter. Look out, Susie. Keep your head down. Oh, those fighters. They will chew up every younger in the place. They have not got the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. No, Susie, not a snowshoe in heaven. You mean a... Why, Nam, you are English at a time like this. What I cannot understand... Look out! I don't see why he hasn't set his signal off. What is delaying him? Why don't he strike a match when the bombers come over? Because he's a good Nazi. A good Nazi? My watch was slow, don't you remember? And I gave him the wrong time. He had orders to strike his match at 10 o'clock. And he'll not do it until 10 o'clock if there are 500 planes instead of 20. Bert, I see him. Where? Far up the road. He's running. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Think we can reach him before he gets to the clearing? Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. Signal Brunson to pass us. A long shot with a Bert, rifle might... Bert, one of the Yonkers is hit. Huh? He's right over us. That's not all. He's unloading his bombs. The whole stick's coming straight down in our direction. Keep your head down. I want to see are you all right? I, I don't feel her. This is a dirt road. The bomb sank too deeply before it exploded. We didn't catch the blast. Come on, Susie. McAllister was just ahead of us. Come on, let's get out. Can't drive any farther. This road is full of bomb craters. Wait a minute, Susie. There's McAllister. He. He is dead. Yes, Susie. Killed by a Nazi bomb. Look, on the ground. What are those two white cards? Oh. Hmm. They're all smeared with oil. Must have fallen out of McAllister's pocket just before he got hit. Let's see. <laughs> what do you know? What are the cards, Bert? Two tickets for Madame Tussaud's waxworks. I'm afraid our friend's never going to get to use them. Uh-huh. Not the chance of a snowshoe in heaven. So ends Menace in Wax. Tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these stories of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer. John Dietz, the director. Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor. John Dixon Carr, the author. Our collaborators on... Suspense. Starring Hollywood cast tonight are Mr. John Sutton, who appears as a young English doctor, Jim Norwood, who knew a great deal more than he admitted concerning the strange events which we are about to relate. And Mr. George Zuko, who plays the village curate, the Reverend Arthur Morley. Our story, and it bears none but a coincidental resemblance to H.G. Wells' famous short novel, The Invisible Man, is by John Dixon Carr and is called The Man Without a Body, tonight's tale of suspense. 
If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you. And so it is with The Man Without a Body and the performances of John Sutton and George Zuko. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. A lonely beach of low white sand hills edged by the surf of the North Sea. And back from the beach, drowsing as it has drowsed for ten centuries, lies the village of Aldbridge in Suffolk. There is the seawall now defaced by air raid shelters. And there are the rolling grain fields, the thatched white cottages, the spire of St. Luke's Church above the oak trees. Ancient and bell-haunted, lost among hedgerows, this village could never cause consternation in London newspaper offices. And yet, on that warm night nearly four years ago... This time it's really happened. A man without a body, completely invisible. Tommy boy. Tommy boy, look at this dispatch. Reign of terror in Suffolk Village. Has another of H.G. Wells' romances come true? An invisible man? I can't believe it. Uh, what's the matter with that village? They all gone scatty? Mr. George Wellman, builder, states that as he was returning home along the main road from Bury St. Edmunds... He distinctly saw a man's hat without any head under it, moving towards him about six feet above the ground. Oh, George, must it be full of beer? We can't use this story. Coffee boy! Even more surprising evidence was given by the Reverend Arthur Morley, vicar of St. Luke's Church. Who? The parson? You don't think he was full of beer? One question above all agitates the village. Who is Professor Ansmith? Who is this elderly American, said to be an inventor, who has settled at Aldbridge and leased a part of the house belonging to the local doctor? Out of some terrifying workshop... To strike like a maniac, where least expected, has there at last emerged... A real invisible man? The Church of St. Luke, Aldbridge, on that same Sunday evening. The evening service is over now, though an echo of bells still lingers. In the vestry at the rear of the church, where white surplices hang like ghosts... The Reverend Arthur Morley sits with his daughter, Janice. It is a stone room of painted windows, now many colored in the sunset. And here is the drowsy summer light turns to dusk. Janice, I don't believe it. I know, Father. I saw it with my own eyes, yet I don't believe it. You don't think we were dreaming, do you? No, Father. We weren't dreaming. If this goes on, the whole village will be in a frenzy. But what can I do? We could go to Professor Ansmith and ask him straight out. Ask him whether he's responsible for these... Yes. I wonder, Janice. A man isn't hurting anybody, you know. You couldn't ask for a quieter person or a better neighbor. And yet... What's that? Father, you are upset. It's only Mr. Emmett coming down from the belfry. Emmett? Oh, yes, of course. Is that you, Mr. Emmett? Uh, It's me, all right, sir. And very much in the flesh. (laughs) Did you think I was the invisible man? Mr. Emmett, I forbid you to mention that subject. Very good, sir. But there's others begging your pardon that do mention it. Oh, yes, yes. Forgive me. I spoke too sharply. That's all right, sir. No harm done. No bones broken. Mind you not that I hold with this talk about invisible men. It ain't natural, I say. It ain't hardly Christian. I'm a greengrocer by trade, and I believe in what I can weigh and feel and... uh, What's the matter, Mr. Emmett? Is anything wrong? Excuse me, sir. And you too, miss. Do you see anybody in this room except us? No, of course not. Why? Because I, I could have sworn something brushed past me just now. You're imagining things, Mr. Emmett. Yes, sir, I, I dare say. There's but nobody the... hidden in the belfry tower, I hope. No, sir. I had a look-see. And what's more, there's not going to be anybody up there. Once I've locked the door. Now, let that blighter try and get in. Oh, please, Mr. Emmett. And you too, Father. You're talking about this invisible man as though... as though he actually existed. There's something funny going on, miss. 
You can't deny that. No, none of us can deny it. And what's more, sir, it's getting pretty dark in here. Hadn't you and Miss Janice better get along to the vicarage while I lock up? No, we can't go just yet, Mr. Emmett. We're expecting Dr. Norwood. Dr. Jim Norwood, sir? What does he say about all this? Oh, you might ask him yourself, Miss Remit. I think that's probably him now. Come in. The vestry door's not locked. Oh, hello, Padre. Hello, Janice. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, hello, Jim. You seem a good deal out of breath. I am out of breath, Janice, because there's blue blazes to pay down in the village. Not more trouble. Yes, I'm afraid so. They're holding a mass meeting at the Coach and Horses, and they're ready to murder Professor Ann Smith. If this invisible man cuts any more capers, we may see a real old-fashioned lynching in an English village. Now, look here, my boy. This has got to stop. I know that, Padre, but how are we going to stop it? Sit down there, Jim, across the table from me. Yes, sir. First of all, what do you know about this Professor Ann Smith? Nothing, sir. Nothing at all. But you've been part of your house to him. Oh, my dear Padre, that house is twice as big as I can possibly manage. I was only too glad to get a tenant. He gave you references, I imagine? Yes, but I didn't bother to check them. He's a quiet old boy. Pays his rent on the dot. Never does anything except read and go for long walks. Are you quite sure of that, Jim? The village has war nerves, that's all. With the camouflage aerodrome in the neighborhood, they're apt to imagine anything. True, perhaps, but... Uh... That talk about dynamos humming in the old boy's room and blue lights flashing is rubbish out of a sensational film. They imagine the whole thing. Finally, this crazy story about an invisible man playing the gramophone. Why, it's that's... It's a... not a crazy story, Jim. Janice and I saw it happen. You what? Last night, about half past nine, Janice and I were out for a walk in the lane that runs past your house. On the way, we met Willie Kendrick, and he joined us. Well, sir? Listen, Jim. On that side of the house, there's a little square room with two windows and no furniture except a round table and a couple of chairs. Do you know the one we mean? Yes, of course. Professor Ann Smith uses it. What about the room? It wasn't quite blackout time. The windows were up. The curtains weren't drawn. And the room was brightly lighted. On the table stood an old-fashioned gramophone with a horn and a crank handle. Beside it lay a pair of white cotton gloves, like, like gardener's gloves. The gramophone was playing away for dear life, but there was nobody in the room. Janice thought that was a bit odd, a gramophone going full tilt with nobody there, and called my attention to it. Just then, the gramophone started to run down. We could hear the record slow and go off key. As it did so... Well, sir, go on. As it did so, those white gloves got up off the table. Got up off the table? Got up off the table, took hold of the gramophone, and wound it up again. <laughs> Mr. Emmett, what on earth are you doing? I, I, I dropped some candlesticks. So I see. Please pick them up again. Yes, sir. Padre, are you serious? Perfectly serious. A pair of gloves without any hands inside them? Yes. But what did they do exactly? The left hand glove steadied the gramophone. The right hand glove wound it up. Then they both hung in the air, beating time to the music. It should have been funny. I can only assure you it was not funny. Oh, what happened then? Oh, Jim, it was horrible. Willie Kendrick let out a yell and ran down the lane between the apple trees as though the devil were after him. I can't say I blame him. Father and I just stood there and... and... Stared is the word, my dear. Yes, stared. I can't forget any of it. The three-legged table and the whirling record and the blue flowers on the wallpaper. But there was nobody there. We could see past the table and under the table and all over the room. And there was nobody there. Except the man without any body. Confound the man without any body. Father... Suppose it is true. As a clergyman, my dear, I prefer to remain agnostic. This thing's a trick. Yes, but how's it done, and why? That's the whole point, Jim. What worries me is the effect on our people here. We call ourselves intelligent, and yet, look at us. Even Mr. Emmett there. Hey, hey, what's that about me, sir? A few minutes ago, you thought something brushed past you when you were coming down the stairs from the bell tower. Now, didn't you? Well, uh, yes, sir. You see what I mean, Jim? But I didn't really think so, sir. Not really. It was imagination, just like the doctor said. Because I searched that tower. I locked the door afterwards. Exactly. But the mere force of suggestion, nothing more, might lead you to believe. <gasps> That's not suggestion, Father. Sir, I'll take my Bible oath. There's nobody in that belfry. Bells can't ring by themselves, old man. 
There's somebody pulling the rope up there, and we're going to find out who it is. Now, one moment, all of you. What's wrong, Padre? You're as white as a ghost. This blasphemous mockery, it seems, extends even to the church. Very well. You will stay with Janice, my boy. Emmett and I will collar this invisible man. Why can't I go, too? I don't believe in this, but I should prefer to have someone with Janice. You're not afraid, Mr. Emmett? If, if it's alive, sir, I'm not afraid of it. And if it's dead, well, well, you're not afraid of it. The tower door's open, sir. I'm ready. Don't do it, Father. Don't go. You can't help them, Janice. Sit down here. Take it easy. Jim Norwood, what's wrong with you? Wrong with me? You've got an odd look, too. And the light's fading. And the surpluses look like ghosts. And in another minute, that fell would drive me mad. Suppose he has got in. Who? The invisible man. Oh, don't talk rot. As there are sounds that the ear cannot hear, so there are colors that the eye cannot see. I read that somewhere. He hasn't hurt anybody yet. But suppose he turns nasty and does hurt somebody. He can't hurt anybody. How do you know? Janice, listen to me. Take my hand. Oh, but Jim... I want to tell you a few things you won't understand. I don't ask you to understand. I just ask you to remember. Well, what is it? The first is a question. If you were a government official and wanted to find an expert on camouflage, where would you go? An expert on camouflage? Yes. And the second point is this. I studied medicine in Germany. Oh, I know that, but that's One quite... night on a bet, I hid backstage at the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. I saw the whole show from backstage and... And I learned a great deal. Jim Norwood, what on earth are you talking George about? George Wellman and I have talked the whole thing over. In a way, Janice, there is an invisible man. I can tell you who he is and how he works. But there's no danger, do you understand? There's no danger at all. If... Jim, what was that? I don't know. You do know. I can see it in your face. You do know. I think somebody's Fallen? Fallen? From the top of the belfry. Oh, Stay here, Janice. You can't do any good. Let go of my arm. I'm going up there. Oh, you're not. I didn't think what the danger might be. Besides, there's somebody coming down the stairs now. Stay just where you are and don't move until... Oh, Father. Father, are you all right? Steady, sir. Take it easy now. I'm perfectly all right, yes. But you'd better go into the churchyard and see to Emmett. He... He fell? No, Janice. He did not fall. He was thrown. Oh. Thrown? By whom? There's no time to argue now. You're a doctor. Go out and see to him. Well, is he in... I don't know. Go. Yes, sir. For I will work a deed in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Janice, this is incredible. Why? You heard the bell ring. I saw it ring. Without anybody there? I was as close to that bell as I am to you now. No hand held the rope. There were no strings or wires or any tricks to make it move. Yet it clanged back and forth alone in the tower. And I thought I heard someone laugh. Laugh? Oh, don't take that too seriously. We were both overwrought and the noise of the bell was deafening. Well, what about Mr. Emmett? Emmett yelled some words I couldn't hear and lunged for the bell. Then something caught him. Something caught him and gave him a sledgehammer blow in the back. That bell is nothing but open arches. You heard him scream. I saw his face just before he went over. Lock the door to the tower, Father. Lock it. I can't lock it. Emmett has the key. But why should I lock it? Because he's still in there. He? He hadn't done any harm before, but he's done harm now. There's no telling what might happen if he gets loose. You mean? I mean Professor Anne Smith's protege, whoever he is. The man without a body. Under the red sunset, some quarter of a mile away, a grass-carpeted lane winds between rows of apple trees. The lane is dusky, though lights shine into it from the windows of a large stone house, Dr. Norwood's house beyond the apple trees. Up and down, up and down, a shadowy figure is pacing, an elderly figure, a dejected figure, tall and frail as a shadow among shadows, muttering to itself, shaking its head, now and then raising one fist in bewilderment or anguish. Sometimes the light gleams on large spectacles and a kindly mouth. Up and down. Endlessly up and down strides Professor Anne Smith. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. How can I convince them that I'm not guilty? Who's there? 
I saw you dodge behind that tree. S stand out, sir. Uh, did you call me Professor Ansmith? Yes, I did call you. Who are you? You probably won't recognize me, Professor Ainsmith. Nevertheless, my friend, may I ask what your name is? Uh, my name is Wellman, Professor George Wellman. Wellman, Wellman. I've heard that name. Maybe you have. I'm a builder by trade and a great friend of Dr. Norwood's. Wait one moment. Aren't you the young man whose firm is putting up these air raid shelters along the seawall? And making such an unholy din with your riveting machines? That's me. And come to think of it, aren't you the one who first started this alarm about an invisible man? Yes, because I met him. You did not meet him, sir. This whole thesis is scientific nonsense. And I won't have it. Uh, you won't have what? I'm an old man, Mr. Wellman. I never did anybody the least harm. As God is my judge, I know nothing whatever about this, this... What's that? It looks like the Vickers car, Professor. You'd better stand back. This is a pretty narrow lane. Ansmith! Professor Ansmith! Yes, Mr. Morley, I hear you. We thought you'd better drive over here straight away. I, I think you've met my daughter. And, of course, you know Dr. Norwood. Yes, there was no time for any social formalities. Get into your house, Professor Ansmith. Get in quickly and close the shutters. But why should I do that? Because there's a mob coming, sir, and we can't stop them. Hurry, do hurry. A mob coming here? Why? Haven't you heard the news? I've heard nothing, my friend. The only person I've seen has been that young man there who chews a toothpick and hides behind the trees. George Wellman? What on earth are you doing here? Uh, watching, Janice. Watching and waiting, just as usual. Listen to me, Professor Ansmith. Henry Emmett, the head verger at St. Luke's, was thrown from the belfry window not 20 minutes ago. Not by me, sir, I assure you. I had nothing to do with no, it. No, not by you, but apparently by the invisible man. Oh, Father in heaven, will this never stop? Not till we catch the fellow. No, be quiet, Mr. Bowman, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Padre, I take it back. I myself can testify that no visible person laid hands on Emmett. He was struck, struck as though with a gigantic fist. Uh, what's the matter, Professor Ansmith? Is anything wrong? No, 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 no. I, I, I was just thinking. Is Emmett dead? Fortunately, no. I'm glad of that, my friend, for a certain person's sake. He's not even seriously hurt. The bell tower isn't high and a tree broke the force of his fall. But he's badly shaken up. And that crowd of the coach and horses means trouble. If you haven't anything to say to us, if you haven't a word of explanation to utter... Listen, Padre, don't you hear anything? Yes, I thought I heard voices. Can't be that crowd from the village. We're too far ahead of them. It's a crowd, all right. And they've been here for hours. But where? I don't see anybody. Jim, look, behind the trees. Look behind the trees. Look be beyond the hedgerows. Look for any place where a watcher can hide. And may I ask what they're doing here? They're watching you, Professor Ensmith. Uh, more of your spies, you mean? You can call them anything you please. They're getting impatient and they want a showdown. If I as much as hold my hand up like this... <laughs> Don't throw stones at the windows, you fool! You'll only break the doctor's window! Gentlemen, I can't have any more of this. Be quiet, all of you, and listen to me. Well, sir, we're listening. I'm a peaceful man. I like to live in peace with my neighbors. I have nothing to do with this so-called reign of terror. But you don't believe that, do you? No. Then I must expose a fraud. Now, don't blame me if I expose the trickster, too. I have made preparations to show you the invisible man. The man without a body. Quiet, everybody. Mr. Morley, I believe you and your daughter walked through this lane last night uh, while I was away at the Berry St. Edmunds. I don't know about your being away, sir. My daughter and I were certainly here, yes. Good, good. Miss Janice Morley. Yes, Professor Ansmith. Will you look toward your right, please, at the house? What do you see? It's the same room. What room? The room with the little round table and the gramophone. It's a three-legged table, you notice. Yes, of course. But there's nobody in the room. No, nobody at all. Are conditions exactly as they were last night? Yes, except... 
There aren't any gloves on the table. No, but the invisible man is there. Oh. A living presence, ready to act and breathe and even kill. Even kill? With your permission, I shall now address him. Hello in there. Hello in there. Hello in there. If anybody answers him, Father, I'm going to scream. Quiet, Janice, quiet. Father, look. The gloves are appearing on the table. I call out to him and I speak as follows. Hold the phonograph with your left glove. That's it. Turn the handle with your right. One turn, two, three, four. That's enough. Touch the spring with your left hand. Push the record. Lower the needle with your right and... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the invisible man. Hold him, hold him off! Hold you, please! Don't you see? On the contrary, let them throw all they like. Aim at the table, my friend. Aim at the table. Why at the table? Because then they'll see the trick. I don't follow you. What trick? The trick of the looking glasses. There. You see now, my friend? I think I do. The legs of the table form a triangle with its point towards you. Panels of looking glass are fitted in the two sides facing you. What do you know about that? You think you can see under the table, but what you actually see are the side walls of the room reflected in those two mirrors. Oh, no, no, no. wait a minute. You mean... I mean that my old servant, hidden behind the mirrors, has just been working the gloves to a panel in the tabletop. It's a very old trick, first shown by Colonel Stadare at the London Polytechnic. And that's what happened last night? Yes. And you had nothing to do with it? Nothing, whatever. Nor had my servant. Then who did do it and why? What is the explanation of all this? Well, I can't tell you why. That's what beats me. But I can tell you everything else. This invisible man who's been scaring us all silly? My dear young lady, there's no invisible man. There never has been. I might believe that, Professor Ansmith, if I hadn't seen a church bell ringing where there was no hand to ring it. And poor old Emmett flung out of the tower as though a giant hand had got hold of him. You're not saying that was done with the looking glasses? No, my friend, not at all. That was really clever. Strings? Wires? Ropes? No, they weren't necessary. But the thing's impossible. Oh, no. The same principle was used by my old friend J.N. Maskelyne to make mechanical figures work. Psycho played whist, and Zoe drew pictures. I myself, I... Go on, sir. You yourself. What are you going to say? Uh, the secret I was about to say remains unknown even today. You were right, in a way, when you tell us that Emmett acted as though a giant had got hold of him. A giant had got hold of him. At least, a gigantic force. Oh, before we all go completely mad, would you mind telling us what this gigantic force was? Not at all. It was compressed air. Compressed air? But don't you see it even yet, any of you? No. A compressed air pipe with a thousand pounds pressure behind it was run up into the tower facing the bell. It could be operated from the ground outside. The pressure was turned on and off in bursts. It made that heavy bell swing like a toy. Emmett, don't you remember? Emmett rushed forwards towards the bell. And the air pressure? The air pressure struck him like a sledgehammer and flung him headlong out of the tower. There's your miracle, gentlemen. That's all there was to it. Uh, don't Sir, I can't doubt what you say. It's too circumstantial and too right. But, but what, my friend? The compressed air tanks. The mechanical apparatus to work this trick. Well, what about it? Well, where did it come from? Such things don't grow on bushes. No, but they do grow on riveting machines. Riveting machines? Yes, such as the riveting machine they're using on the air raid shelters along the seawall. Would you care to tell us, Dr. James Norwood, why you and your friend Wellman have been playing all these tricks? <laughs> Well, 
Jim Norwood. Is this true? Why, of course it's true, Mr. Morley. Don't be so gullible. Jim and George Wellman doing all this? I don't believe it. Take a look at their faces, young lady. Did you ever see a guiltier-looking pair? So we look guilty, do we? Frankly, you do. We played the whole game and convinced the village there was an invisible man. Is that it? Yes. You worked the glove trick in your own house. And Wellman worked the air trick with his own equipment. Everything else was nothing but a pack of lies and a lot of atmosphere. Playing conjurers and making a blasted hash of it. Is that all, Professor Ann Smith? Well, remember, you brought this on yourself. I didn't want to expose you. No, Professor. I bet you didn't. Easy, George. Take it easy. Jim, is this true? Before you start pitching into me, Janice, let me have my word first. Do you remember what I said to you at the church tonight? At the church? Yes, I asked you to remember something, even if you didn't understand it. All right. Can you remember what it was? Oh, Jim, please. You're only trying to evade this. I'm so confused now, I don't remember anything. All I can think of is this horrible business and what's behind it. Father can't believe his ears and I'm not much better. We've practically idolized you. All we want you to do is answer a straight question. Jim, are these accusations true? Yes, they are true. Doubtless he had a good reason, Janice. Doubtless he had a good reason. Yes, we had a good reason. The very best reason in the world. You had a good reason for scaring people half to death and trying to kill poor old Henry Emmett? We didn't mean any harm against Emmett. That was an accident. But you dare to defend yourself now? Yes, just that. Before we go home, Father, shall we apologize to Professor Ann Smith? I hope he'll try to think better of English hospitality. Good, Janice, good. I hope he will, too. You hope he will. Listen, Janice, before you act on any belief, you have to be absolutely sure in your own mind. George and I had to prove something, and now I'm glad to say we have proved it. Oh, I can't stand this any longer. If you have anything to say, go on and say it straight out. What was it you had to prove? We had to prove to our own satisfaction that this pretended American who calls himself Professor Ann Smith... Pretended American? Who calls himself Professor Ann Smith? We had to prove that this pretended American was no other than Karl Heinrich von Keis, the celebrated oh. stage magician from the Winter Garden Theater in Berlin. What? Whose real job is to find the camouflage aerodrome near Berry St. Edmund. No. He explained his own tricks very nicely, George. We'll swear out a warrant in the morning. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Richard Dix, who appears as a United States naval officer, who found himself in a remarkable predicament on what should have been an uneventful flight from New York to Philadelphia. As fellow passengers aboard the airliner are Miss Gail Page as a girl named Monica and Mr. Montague Love, who plays that aged and domineering millionaire Silas Naylor. A story by John Dixon Carr called Death Flies Blind is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion, dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Death Flies Blind and the performances of Richard Dix, Gail Page, Montague Love and our other players, we again hope to keep you in suspense. LaGuardia Field, Municipal Airport of New York. LaGuardia Field, vast behind its white buildings. On a gray spring afternoon when rain splashes across the runways, dims the sky, and spatters on the wings of a great silver-painted airliner waiting beyond. Already as the limousine bus from the New York terminus slowly draws up to the waiting shed, you can hear the loud speaker. 72, 
New York to Los Angeles. The big limousine bus decides its driver contains only two persons. One is a tall young man in United States Naval uniform with the stripes of a lieutenant commander around his sleeve. The other is a tall and dark-haired girl, her face a little frightened in the blue. Flight 72, New York to Los Angeles. Plane ready to take off at gate number six. Have your tickets ready, please. Fred, that, that can't mean us. Now, take it easy, Monica. We're not too late. They won't go without us. No, I mean it says New York to Los Angeles. That's right, Monica. We're only going to Philadelphia. You're still right, my dear. I arranged for a special stop at Philadelphia. It won't take long, and then they go on nonstop from there. Fred, that's just it. Who's going on from there? Oh, you'd be surprised. This airport bus must hold 20 people, but there's nobody in it except ourselves and the driver. Who's going on to Los Angeles or, or anywhere else? I uh, was going to tell you about that, Monica. Uh... All right, miss. All right, sir. Hop under that shed and out the door on the other side. Oh, uh, got your tickets ready? Yes, I've got them. All set, Monica? The rain is certainly coming down. Do they take off when it rains like this? Oh, Miss, a little rain don't bother them. What does bother them is the unsettled weather at other places. You mean it's, it's perfectly safe? They never take off, Miss, unless it is safe. You better hurry up now. There's the plane, Monica. Shall we run for it? Fred, I'd rather not run if you don't mind. Aren't getting nervous, are you? No. I know it's stupid of me. I've flown before. It's just for well, those few seconds before the takeoff. You're moving and the motors have been idling. All of a sudden they start to roar. The plane races ahead and the roar gets louder and suddenly you think, am I ever going to get down alive? Now look here, my dear. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Fred. I... There's nothing to worry about, you know. Of course not. I'll be good. It's just this dismal day and a ghostly bus without any passengers. Fred... Look. Where? At the plane. They've got all the windows covered inside with little gray curtains. Oh, that's all right, Monica. It's only a wartime measure. Wartime measure? Yes. You must keep those curtains closed for some minutes after taking off and before landing. And so no one can make maps or take pictures of our airports. Oh. Anything could happen up there, Colonel. No. And what's more, if you're worried about your fellow passengers, look over your shoulder. Well, there are some people coming through the gate. Yes, you see the little gray-haired man with the big fellow on each side of him? The secretary dashing around them like a <laughs> destroyer in a convoy? You know, I've seen that gray-haired man somewhere before. And you've seen his picture? That's Silas Naylor, the third richest man in the world. Those two big fellows are his bodyguard. Does he need a bodyguard? Well, I... Not more than most of us, I imagine. Good. I don't like it. Oh, nonsense, my dear. Come on now, up the steps of the plane. Give your name to the air hostess at the door. That's it. Good afternoon, miss. May I have your name, please? Uh, I'm, um, I'm Monica Vale. You're the air hostess? That's right, Miss Vale. Take any seat you like. And you, sir? Onslow, Lieutenant Commander Fred Onslow. Oh, yes, Commander. We've had instructions about you. Happy to have you with us, even if it's only as far as Philadelphia. Thank you. May I take your overcoat or your briefcase? Only the overcoat, please. I'll keep the briefcase. Friend, look there. What is it now? That man you called Mr. Naylor's secretary. Light-haired man, rather good-looking. He's sprinting towards this plane as fast as he can run. Well, he'd better be careful on that slippery surface. He certainly has. Air hostess, air hostess, air hostess, Look out, man. Look out, man. Watch your step. Look Are you all right? Here, let me help you up. I'm all right, thanks. Perfectly all right. Air hostess. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Michael Shepard. I'm Mr. Naylor's secretary, and I think there must be some mistake here. Mistake, sir? Yes. When Mr. Naylor travels, he's in the habit of booking every seat in the plane to ensure privacy. Yet we seem to have two extra passengers. Well, I'm afraid that's my fault, Mr. Shepard. Indeed, sir. Then would you and the young lady be good enough to take some later flight? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't do that. No, and why not? Maybe I ought to explain, Mr. Shepard, that Commander Onslow had last-minute orders to join his ship. He and Miss Vale have priority as far as Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Must we stop there? Only for a few minutes, Mr. Shepard. This is outrageous. Mr. Naylor is traveling, uh, in a sense, on government business. Well, so am I, old man. The Navy often does. Uh... That doesn't alter the principle of the thing. I, I don't want to seem ungracious, you understand. Mr. Naylor is always glad to help our, our brave soldiers and oh, sailors. Oh, love of my Fred. Now, choir will now sing hymn number 242. Now the gorgeous But this time you've boom. gone too far. I shall appeal to Mr. Naylor himself. Mr. Naylor, Mr. Naylor. Yes, Mr. Shepard, I can hear you. What is it? Uh, 
this naval officer, sir, and the young lady. Oh, I know, sir, but I know. Isn't the plane big enough for all of us? I was only following your orders, Mr. Naylor. You asked for privacy. All right, Shepard. What I'm asking for now is less noise. The lieutenant commander in the Navy, eh? That's right, Mr. Naylor. Off on another fishing trip, I suppose. That's just exactly right, sir. Ever have dyspepsia? No, never. Well, I have. 20000 a year I paid pay doctors. And what do they give me? This stomach. I'm not surprised you got priority, Commander. But I am a little surprised about the girl. She's my fiancée. Mr. Naylor, Miss Vale. Meet the rest of my family. These two bruisers here, including the one with the mouth organ, are my bodyguard. Mr. Cohen. I'm pleased to meet you, Commander. How do you do? This is Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, nice to know you, Commander. How are things going? Hey, Cohen, Kent, don't you ever get tired of playing that mouth organ? They stand away from the door. They want to close it. Will everyone please take your seats and fasten the seatbelts? Are we ready to take off? Yes, in just a moment. Shepard. O'Reilly. Cohen. Come along to the front of the plane. Yes, sir. Oh, we'll sit in the back here, won't we, Ted? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. I, um... Fred, is anything wrong? No. No, of course not. Why, Why what could be wrong? Then you'd better sit down. We're starting to move. That's good advice, Commander Onslow. But I must ask you, Miss Vale, not to touch the curtain on the window. Oh, how soon before we can open the curtain? As soon as we're well away from New York. You see that illuminated sign, no smoking, fasten seatbelt? Yes. What about it? When the lights and the sign go out, you can open the curtain. And smoke as much as you like. Now, if you'll excuse me. Certainly. You needn't try to fool me, Fred Onslow. I saw you. You saw what? I saw you pick up that scrap of paper one of those men dropped. Why, why that wasn't anything, Monica. May I see the paper? No. Why not? Well, because, uh, because I'd, I'd rather you didn't see it, that's all. There is something wrong, isn't there? Look, Monica, let me repeat over and over. What could be wrong? Why, there's Silas Naylor, an internationally famous figure, with a group of trusted attendants. Here's an ACA plane as safe and dependable as the old gray mare. All the same, all I... All the same What? I wish I hadn't brought you along. I wish there was some kind of an emergency cord, like a train, so that you could stop this plane whenever you have We're on our way. Fifteen minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes. The great silver plane throbs against dead quiet. It's warm and stuffy in the cabin, despite the hissing ventilator. Dim white reading lamps shine down on a double row of cushioned chairs along one side and a single row of cushioned chairs along the other. Ahead, above the closed door to the pilot's control cabin, the red glowing sign still warns against opening those curtains. Aft in the plane sits Commander Onslow, his eyes fixed on the clock under that illuminated sign. Monica. Yes? What? It's not exactly... All right. Fred, why do you say that? Because we should have been in Philadelphia five minutes ago. At least we should have been circling over the field. And we're not? No. Well, we're still ten or 12,000 feet up if the pressure on my eardrums count for anything. And traveling like a bat out of Hades. Weather's delaying us, I guess, huh? Maybe it is. It's awfully bumpy, isn't it? Yes, a little. Makes you gasp for breath and your stomach turns. Oh. That was a bad one. Not getting... Airsick, are you? I don't think so. I wish I had some of that chewing gum they give you. A ring for the air hostess. She'll bring you some. I did ring the bell, Fred, and there's no answer. Oh, she's busy in the pantry back there, that's all. She didn't hear you. Here, I'll get you some gum. No, no, wait, I'll, I'll go. Sure you're all right? I want a part of my nose anyway. Besides, you're going to have company. Our Mr. Shepard is weaving along this aisle as though he didn't like air pockets either. Well, thank the Lord one of that party's awake up there. I thought they were all dead. Don't say that. Say what? Dead. A spooky plane with everything so quiet and, and dead itself. Remember how the pilot walked through a while ago and looked around and walked, walked right back to the control cabin again? No, I didn't notice him. Oh, well, that's what I mean. It was like a ghost. <laughs> I'll be right back. I say, Commander Onslow. Yes, Mr. Shepard? Uh, mind if I sit down? Not at all. Go ahead. Fact is, Commander, I want to apologize. Oh, that's all right. Forget it. I'm not such an ill-mannered guy as I must have sounded. It's no joke, you know, taking care of the chief. I've got to go ahead like a cyclone, so 
so that everything would be quiet when he gets there. And it's a great responsibility, too. I can imagine. I go on these long trips. There's the chief, half asleep, and O'Reilly reading detective magazines and coin with his mouth organ. Doesn't that mouth organ bother the old boy? No, he likes it. Especially when Cohen plays the old square dancers. Chief's a great man in his way. I was just wondering about that. Wondering what? Is it true? Stop me if I'm talking out of turn. Go ahead. We can trust the Navy. Is it true he's offered to design and build, at his own expense, a fleet of underwater cargo boats, uh, submersible freighters, up to five or 6,000 tons, that'd do away with the submarine menace altogether? Where did you hear that? Oh, just rumor. Is it uh, true? Uh, yes, it's true enough. You see, Mr. Shepard, I'm one of the few people who believe that that plan is practical. But there must be a lot of people who would like to see Mr. Naylor put out of the way. There are, Commander. Only they can't get at him. You're quite sure of that? Dead sure. Hitler himself isn't better guarded. Why, you could no more shoot or stab or poison the chief than you could... What was that? What happened? Monica? Is anything wrong back there? Well, it's, it's all right, sir. It's only a noise in the pantry. We'll see to it. Monica. Monica, pull yourself together. What's wrong? It's, it's that air hostess, Miss Lee. Well, what about her? She's lying back in the pantry among the broken dishes with her head all over blood. Somebody beat her over the head and left her there to die. Somebody? Yes. But nobody's gone back to the pantry. Nobody's gone past us except... Except the pilot, a co-pilot of this plane, remember? Excuse me, Mr. Shepard. I'm going to open the curtains on that window. Do you think it's wise, Commander? We were told not to. Well, we were told a lot of things. I'll just take the responsibility of... Good Lord! <gasps> there, there, Monica. Mr. Naylor, Mr. Naylor! Yes, son? What's up? Draw the curtain on your window and take a look down. If O'Reilly and Cohen have got guns, they better keep them handy. Is that so now? Why? Because we're not flying west. We're over the Atlantic Ocean now and headed straight out to sea. <laughs> be miles and miles away from land. We are miles away from land. Does anybody here know anything about first aid? I do, Commander. I studied medicine in the old days. And then you better go back and look after the hostess. We'll join Mr. Naylor. Steady, Mike. Well, I'm all right. It's this horrible blind feeling, that's it. Air pocket, look out. See here, Commander. What, we're over the ocean. What the devil's going on here, eh? You're being kidnapped, Mr. Naylor. That's my guess. Kidnapped, did you say? Ah, come off it, Commander. We ain't as dumb as that. The pilot and the co-pilot of this plane are fakes. They've replaced the real officer. Oh. On a dark day like this, with their raincoat collars turned up, they could have gotten away with it. And hijacked us straight off the airfield. Is that it? Yes, I'm afraid so. The hostess must have spotted one of them and knocked her out. Now, what about the Air Force? Wouldn't they know a plane was missing? Well, not until we failed to show up at Philadelphia. The pilot would report by aerial radio telephone about, oh, 15 minutes out of New York. But after that, silence. Excuse me, Commander. You say these two fake pilots are still aboard in that compartment there with the closed door? Yes, that's right. Well, what are we waiting for, Corn? Do we get to work on them? You said it, Barney. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, both of you. You wouldn't be trying to stop us, would you, Commander? The one thing we don't want is a gunfight 12,000 feet up. Can any of you fly a plane? No. Not one of us. Now, neither can I. So if anything happens to those two pilots, how are we going to get down? I see, young fellow. Well, what are you going to do? Now, first of all, we'll try rapping on the door. Have your gun ready. Yeah, you can count on that, sir. Fred, Fred, listen to me. Be quiet, Monica. Has, has this anything to do with the scrap of paper you picked up off the floor? What scrap of paper? Oh, never, never mind, sir. Why, this door... It's unlocked. Unlocked? Now, don't take any fool chances, young fellow. The way I always did when I was your age. Stand to one side when you open that door. Let Cohen and O'Reilly take care of it. Good Lord. Well, the control cabin is empty. There's nobody at the controls. You mean we're... We're flying without a pilot? Yes. See that stick move back and forth? As though a ghost had hold of it? Those crooks do. 
they set the automatic controls. It's a gyroscope attachment that keeps her steady. And then they must have bailed out. And what's going to happen to us? You see, Monica, the fact is... Go on, Fred. Tell me the truth. I'll know if you don't. Well, we'll go on until our gas runs out or until a storm hits us. Then we'll dive into the sea. It's as good a way of killing Mr. Naylor as any. I see, son. Have we got any chance at all? Frankly, I don't know. Wait till I get a look inside of that control cabin. Holy mother. Cohen, stop it. Stop it! Yeah, Mr. Naylor? Stop playing that infernal mouth organ. Or if you must play it, play something cheerful. Yes, yeah, sure, Mr. Naylor, sure. How long do you think it'll be before we... Quiet, Cohen. Here's the commander back again. Well, young fella. The radio telephone's out of order. We can't signal. Fred, what about those patrol ships? You said they're 200 miles out to watch for unidentified aircraft. Won't they see us? They've seen us already, I expect. They'll send for an army fighter plane to investigate, but oh, what can it do? Yeah. Shoot us down, maybe, huh? That's fine. If only somebody could fly the plane. Well, nobody can, Skipper, so think of something else. See, Mr. Naylor, I was wrong. Wrong, son? About what? One of your party, and I can guess which one, dropped a torn piece of paper. There was a line of writing on it, probably the end of some instructions. Well... Those instructions ended. You should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. You should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. But, but that might not have anything to do with this, son. What made you suspicious of it? Because it was written in German. In German? Quiet, Colin. I can't hear myself think. Okay, okay, Mr. Naylor. I'm sorry. I thought the fake pilots were kidnapping you, maybe abroad. There's not enough fuel for that, is there? Well, if there's enough fuel for Los Angeles, then there's enough for Europe. Well, that won't work. They bailed out and left us to crash. Uh, excuse me, sir. But it's getting black as pitch out there. I think there's a storm coming up. What happens when that hits us? Plenty, O'Reilly. Plenty. Yeah, well, I was afraid of that. If only somebody could fly this plane, I could navigate it. Navigate it? Yes. You have to learn aerial navigation in my business. With enough figuring, I might even set a new course and try the automatic controls on it. No, I, I don't dare handle the ship. Wait a minute. I know a way out of this. Well, then speak up, miss. Is a 90-mile wind going to hit us any minute? The air hostess, of course. Miss Lee, what about her? I remember reading somewhere that most air hostesses get flying instructions when they've been with the company for a, well, a given length of time. You know, Miss Vale, that's true. There was a girl of Inter Airways who told me the same thing. And if this one can even make a try at landing a plane, we may get back to New York yet. I thought you said she'd been knocked out. Well, she is and badly hurt, but there's just a chance that maybe she's... There's Shepard, coming back from the pantry. Anybody got a drink? It wasn't very pleasant back there. How is she? You know, we were just wondering whether Miss Lee might be in any shape to pilot the plane. Pilot the plane? Why in blazes should she pilot the plane? There's no time to explain now, Shepard. But we're bound for Davy Jones unless something's done. Could she do it? No. Not even if we, uh, revived her? Not if all the doctors on Earth stood at her side. Why, but I... I but... don't think you understand, sir. Miss Lee has just died. Thin singing of wind above the clouds. Thin storm with a white eye of lightning at the windows. Losing height, gaining it again, blown off her blind course, flung partway back again, always racing forward on a flight to nowhere. Late afternoon, evening, night, the steady throbbing of motors like a pulse beat inside the head. Towards morning, the storm dies away. In that dim cabin, there is exhaustion of nerves. The hands of the clock stand at a quarter of two in the morning. Monica. Monica. Wake up. What? what, what oh, shh, shh, shh. It's Fred. Now keep your voice down. Have I been asleep? Yes, for a couple of hours. They say condemned criminals sleep on the night before their execution. Where are the others? I was a boy back home. The county down. 
father used to say to me, Well, Neil Riley, says he, did you ever see a banshee? A banshee, says he, is the old woman that lets you know when you're going to die. Pipe down, you two. Uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Neil. Uh, no, uh, no offense, Chief. Can the man play a quiet game of solitaire without somebody yapping all the time? Black nine on red dead. Listen, Monica, and listen carefully. My first idea was right after all. What are you talking about? There's somebody aboard this ship who can fly a plane. Shh. There is. I proved it by the automatic controls. Proved it how? If those controls had stayed as they originally were, the side winds would have blown us clear off our course. But we're still on our course. That shows that somebody's been sneaking in there and setting us right again when we do stray. Then you mean... I mean that we're headed for somewhere. We're being taken somewhere. But we may outwit this gentleman yet. Outwit who? Is somebody still talking back there? I'm sorry, Mr. Naylor. Monica's just waked up. None of us can feel very much like sleeping anyway. You're right, son. I admit it. Come up here and join me, will you? With pleasure. I teach myself in this twice in this card game. But I still can't make it come out. Oh, what's the use pretending anyway? We know we're in for it. It's this... Waging that gets you. Yeah. Yeah, that goes for all of us, Mr. Naylor. What I'm dreading is... is the minute when those motors choke and go dead and we start whirling down and down and down. What does it sound like, Commander, when... when motors conk out? I've never heard it, Mr. Naylor, but I imagine it sounds like... Listen. I imagine it sounds like that. We're losing height. I can feel it. Well, Corn, I guess this is the payoff. Yeah, you said it. But look here, Mr. Naylor, we can't be out of fuel. Because it's too early. Look at the clock. It's only five minutes to two o'clock. I beg your pardon, old man. It's five minutes to seven o'clock. Seven o'clock? Are you crazy? No. Haven't you forgotten the cross-ocean changes in time? By George, the commander's right. European time is five hours ahead of our time. If you don't believe me, just notice that it's getting daylight outside. I was thinking of that message... You should land just as your fuel fails at 7 o'clock a.m. Stand perfectly still, all of you. Hey, what's got into little Lord Fauntleroy? I'll show you what's got into me, my friend. Yes, I rather thought you would. I shall go into that control cabin. Follow me if you like. I shall sit down at the controls. And I shall bring this plane safely to the ground. Safely to the ground? Where? In Germany, of course. Germany. Don't pull a gun, Cohen. If you plug him, we're all done for. That is good advice, Mr. Cohen. I might add that we're getting closer to the ground every minute. Ah, uh, for the love of... Do I take control? Yes, go ahead. But, uh, we're following you. Follow by all means. All right. Let's get comfortable here. I take up my position, so... There's fog below. Can you see? Well enough, Miss Dale. Well enough. We must go down rather quickly. And I can't help if it's somewhat rough on your ears. You young swine, what's the idea? The idea, dear patron, is to bring you and your plans for a submarine freighter to a country which will appreciate them. Then those two fake pilots? They were colleagues of mine. Unfortunately, if they had remained, your pug uglies would have started a gunfight, and none of us might have got here. Well? So they left by parachute. And I brought you safely, without blood or toil, into the boundaries of the Third Reich. You're going down too fast, man. Now, take it easy. I am perfectly in command, thank you. Look out! Have... The trees are coming straight up at us! Are you all right, Monica? Are you all right? Yes. Oh, only a bit shaken up. We're all okay here, Skipper. Shall I give this guy the works now before they come to get us? No, don't shoot. Let him alone. That also is good advice. And now, my friends, my mission is ended. I stand up on the pilot's chair. I throw open this glass hatch. And to all Germany, to all the world, I cry. This is das gestohlene Flugzeug im Begriff zu landen auf Feld Nummer 21. Heil Hitler. Well, strike me blind if it ain't another one. Yes, first Rudolf S. and now this bloke. What do you suppose they want over here? English. Why are you speaking English? Why, Cotton? It's an even habit we've got in this country. This isn't England. Oh, yes, it is. 
Better climb out of here and with your hands up. But it can't be. I followed the course laid down on those instruments. Unfortunately, old man, I altered our course last night. Keep back, Shepard, or you may get a bullet in the head yet. Your instructions were all right, but they didn't tell you about the five hours difference in time. When we got to the right navigation point, I let the fuel out of the tanks and made you think we were landing in Germany. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like having a good Nazi for a taxi driver, is there? So ends Death Flies Blind, starring Richard Dix with Gail Page and Montague Love. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, same time, when Mr. Paul Lucas will star in the suspense play called Mr. Markham, Antique Dealer. Ladies and gentlemen, on the following Tuesday, May 18th, Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester will be with us in one of the most famous of Agatha Christie's thrillers, The ABC Murders. William Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Mahowick, the conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Ray Milan in Anton Leder's production of Night Cry by William L. Stewart. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Report to the captain of the Homicide Bureau, Manhattan. From Detective Lieutenant Mark Deglin. You know, we always say that the cat waits for the mouse to run, the dog waits for the cat to run, and the police wait for the killer to run. But if he's a smart killer, a real smart guy, if he doesn't run at all but just stands and laughs, or even walks quietly and easily away, he can really get away with murder. There's a lot of murder around Homicide Squad beside the stiffs we work on. Like the knifing I got when they passed me up and made you, Lieutenant Knight, an acting captain and head of the squad. Funny how a little promotion goes to a guy's head. It was Friday that you got your promotion, and that evening, after you'd sent for me, I had to warm a chair outside until you were ready to see me. Remember? Captain Knight will see you now, Lieutenant. Well, that's sweet of him. Come on over and have a chair, Eglin. Uh, Mark? Sure. Why not? Congratulations, Captain Knight. Uh, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, Mark. You know, I didn't want this. I didn't do anything to get it. Sure. Of course, playing golf with the commissioner's brother-in-law had nothing to do with it. You know it didn't, Mark. The force isn't run that way. Now, look, I've worked with you for a long time, and there's no reason why we can't get along fine. Sure, no reason. I'm the first to say that you're the best man on homicide, Mark. And, well, it's not my place to tell you, but I think you ought to know the reason why you didn't get the promotion instead of me. I'm listening. You know, Mark, the police department has come a long way from what it used to be. Now, take homicide. It's no longer a question of one man going out and sapping some poor devil until he gets a confession. All of us, detectives, identification, lab men, telegraph, the medical examiner's office, 
We're all one big team. You know, that sounds like the commissioner's number two speech for the Rotarians. But it's true, Mark. And that's why the police board didn't give you this job. In an age of cooperation, you're still a one-man force. How many killers did I bring in during the last five years? Every one you went after. I know that, and so does the police board. But a lot of them had marks on them that they didn't have before you went after them. And some of them had to be carried in. Sure, but I got them, and quick. Some of them I even had booked before that team you mentioned got around to deciding what killed the victim. I know that, but there's always a chance that the next time you'll bring in some guy who had nothing to do with it. Yes? He's on his way. It's a call. Now, you and Riley will take it. Now, look, Mark. Yeah? Riley's a good teammate for you. He's proud of the force, you know, and he'll be just as proud of your work as his own. And we'll talk about this later. Sure. After I bring in another killer... Where's the killing, Riley? In the 70s, near Riverside, gambling joint. Some guy rolled a seven the wrong way? Uh, could be. Uh, say, uh, Mark, I was sorry to hear about ah, the... Ah, forget uh... about it, Dan. If I'd wanted a desk job, I wouldn't be a cop. I'd rather bring them in than look at them after they brought in. Come on, let's go. <laughs> And for a minute, I didn't mind not getting the captaincy. There was something about being on a job, about starting out to look for a killer that beat anything in the world. We got to the big brownstone that was the gambling joint. Riley and I walked up the front stairs through the rain. The patrolman on the door let us in. There were three guys in the foyer. One of them was a good-looking guy in a dinner jacket, with a look in his eye that probably came from watching a lot of guys try to make a four the hard way. The second was a patrolman, still writing in his notebook. And the third was a guy on the floor, dead. He was partly on his side, and there was a knife in his back. He was wearing a suit that had cost plenty before he spoiled it by bleeding all over it. The patrolman saluted as we came up. Corcoran, sir, the doorman called me off the beat. The dead man's name is L. O. Morrison. Uh, Mr. Carlstrom here is the owner of the club, and he says... Save it, Corcoran, until we ask for it. Yes, sir. What do you think, Riley? Mm, he's dead, all right. Well, take another look at that stiff. Hmm? He's got a fresh cut over one eye, which he must have gotten before he was killed. Yeah, you're right. He wouldn't be that bruised if he got it when he was killed. Well, let's find out how he got it. All right, you. Yes, Inspector? Not Inspector, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Deglin. Oh, yes, I've heard of you, Lieutenant Deglin. Well, stick around. He'll get some first-hand knowledge. What kind of a joint is this? Well, this is a private club. The members have their own keys and let themselves... Oh, a key club, huh? Yes, that's right. Who'd the dead man have a fight with? Well, I don't like to say this, but he had a fight with Kendall Payne. I asked Mr. Payne to leave. Kendall Payne? Uh, isn't that the guy who was a war hero? Yes, that's right. War hero, huh? And he's still fighting the war. Well, having a key could come back after you threw him out. Yes, he could have come back. Was he alone? No, uh, Miss Morgan Taylor was with him. Where does Payne live? Well, I... here's his address book, Lieutenant. Payne is in here. Thanks. Okay, Dan, you can finish up here. I think I'll look up this war hero. Uh, Mark, don't you think you ought to wait for the medical examiner and the ID boys to arrive? Why? I don't need the ME to tell me this guy is dead, no identification to tell me he had a fight with pain. This murder is tailor-made, and I'm going down and try pain on for size. <laughs> it was a short street just off the Hudson River where a lot of artists and duck wallopers lived. There was a dim light in the hall, and I went up the stairs. The light spilled out from under the door that had Payne's name on it, and I knocked. All right, it's open. He was sitting on the bed. He had an army kit bag open and partly packed. There was a white bandage over his right eye, and the drawers of the bureau were open. Now, what do you want? Little talk. Your name Payne? Yeah. But you're not anyone I know. Beat it. We'll get acquainted. This uh, badge will introduce us. You know what you can do with that badge. You know, I almost forgot you were a hero. How long you been here, hero? Maybe an hour, and I go on. Get out. How'd you get to be a hero, Payne? With a knife? Look, I don't know you or your badge. Now go on, get out. Well, you're a tough little punk, aren't you, hero? Especially tough for a boy who's just killed a man. What, what are you talking about? Where's the dame you were with? Maybe she can tell you about the guy you had a fight with, then went back and killed. Look, you keep her out of it. Look, sonny... You were maybe tough overseas, but back here, you're just another meatball. Now talk. What are you, a tough cop? Well, let's see. How tough? Sure, I'm a tough cop. <laughs> I 
and hit him three times. No more than that. And fell. His head hit in the edge of the bed, then he slumped to the floor. His breathing was heavy for a minute, and then it... And it stopped. I stood looking at him, rubbing my knuckles. Then I reached down and felt his wrist. He was dead. Well, it was another trial the taxpayers wouldn't have to pay for. I got up and went to the phone I'd seen in the hall. Night talking. Daglin here. Look, I just... Oh, uh... wait a minute, Mark. Hey, close that door, will you? Now that the case is broken, Mark, they're talking their heads off. Case is broken? Yeah, it was Carlstrom. He got panicky and started to run. You know, Riley, when they run, he shoots. He nailed him in the shoulder, and Carlstrom thought he was going to die and confess. The dead man was into the gambling house for 50 grand and wouldn't pay, so Carlstrom stuck the knife into him. Hello? You still on? Yeah. I, I, I just dropped some change. Did you find pain? I... I think he's cleared out. Clothes in the bathroom stuff's all gone. He has? Well, he probably saw something. He didn't want to get mixed up in it. Well, we can always put out an alarm on him. Go home and get some sleep, Mark. Sure. I'll, I'll get some sleep. While I hung on, hung up, walked back into Payne's room. I looked down at him. Thought what a lousy time to make a mistake. Well, there was only one smart way out. I had to bring Candle Payne back to life long enough to be seen taking a run-out powder. I needed some good, reliable witnesses. That way, I could get away with murder. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ray Milland in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Nation, do you say so much about Autolite spark plugs in so short a time? Why, that's easy, Hap. Do you want the high points and the low down on these master magicians, these motor marvels, these monuments to Autolite ignition engineers? Well, plug one ear and spark to this. Well, if I must. By Cornelius, I'll plug these Autolite resistor spark plugs anytime, any place. Do you want your engine to idle smoothly as a sultan's harem, purr as contentedly as a Persian kitten, run as tirelessly as a perpetual motion machine? Well, I... Then you want Autolite resistor wide gap spark plugs. Why, that wide gap in these new Autolite resistor spark plugs means as much to your car as Donald Duck means to duckdom, Chessie means to catdom, Lassie means to dogdom. No. Why, by Cornelius, when you replace your old narrow gap spark plugs with the new Autolite resistor wide gap spark plugs, your car refuses to be satisfied just to run better, save gas, and save dough. With Autolite resistor spark plugs, you cut interference with radio and television reception. That's important. Mighty important. And what's more important, you ought to get all your neighbors to march right down with you to buy a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs tomorrow morning. Do it right away, Hap. Don't keep me in suspense. Okay, Harlow. Here is suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage... Mr. Ray Milland as Detective Lieutenant Mark Deglin in Night Cry, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. As I said before, Captain Knight, the cat waits for the mouse to run, the dog waits for the cat to run, and the police wait for the killer to run. Only I wasn't going to run. I stood there and tried to figure how to have Candle Payne seen running away. After that, Payne would be just another guy who got scared and beat it. And I'd still be Lieutenant Mark Deglin, the guy who didn't make mistakes. It took me a while, in the night and the rain, to do what I had to do. Quite a while. But I finally got to my own apartment... I still had Payne's kit bag with his name stenciled on the side, but I could get rid of that later. I tossed it on the floor behind my desk and went to sleep. When I got to headquarters the next morning, it was late. Payne's disappearance had the DA demanding we find him. Dan Riley was already out trying to trace Payne, and I could just imagine him bulldogging along from one witness to another. And then you said... Suppose you go up to Connecticut, Mark, and talk to Payne's girl, Morgan Taylor. Just routine. Just routine? Okay, I'll take care of it. Mm-hmm. 
I found where Morgan Taylor lived from the Greenwich Post Office. It was a low, rambling white house set back from a tree-lined road. The girl who answered my ring had dark hair that came down around her shoulders and wide gray eyes that were sure and young and lovely. Yes? You Miss Morgan Taylor? Yes, I am. I'm Lieutenant Mark Deglin of the New York Police. Oh? You know where I can find Kendall Payne? Oh, the silly fool. He said something about leaving last night, but I thought he was just being dramatic. When was this? Well, I... I went down to his place with him last night after we left the gambling club. I've been seeing a lot of Ken, but I just couldn't keep on. He was always getting into fights and picking arguments. So I told him I wouldn't see him anymore. That's when he said he'd leave. And that's the last time you saw him? Yes. But there's something else. Well, yes. It wasn't time for my train yet, so I walked around in the rain. Then I remembered that I had a date to meet Ken in town tonight, and I went back to tell him I wouldn't be there. But he wasn't in his room. I had no idea he'd really left. You think he might have gone back to the gambling club? Why do you ask that? Well, after you left the club last night, a man was killed. The man Payne had a fight with. And you think he ran away because of that? He might have. Ken was, well, pretty neurotic. You in love with him? Oh, I'm very fond of Ken, but that's all, Lieutenant. But I'd hate to think that anything happened to him. You've no idea where he is now. If you'll wait a minute, I'll go with you. I was just getting ready to leave myself. He might show up to keep that date with me tonight at Morney's on Bleecker Street. We can wait for him there. She rode back to New York with me. And after the first few miles, we stopped talking about Kendall Payne and talked about ourselves. She was really a beautiful gal. And I kept glancing sideways at her profile. Maybe this case was going to turn out better than I thought. When we hit town, I called you, Captain Knight. Remember? I was doing, not, not mentioning what nice work it was turning into. And then Morgan and I went on to the restaurant. Since then, I've just played around, I guess. I know what you mean. Look, it's past eight, uh, Morgan. Uh, what time was Payne supposed to meet you? Seven? Yes. It looks as though I've been stood up. Well, he must be pretty scared to stand you up. If it were me, I'd risk even a murder rap to keep the date. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Want to take me to dinner? Well, it's a good thing you asked me. I was just about to put my handcuffs on you so you couldn't get away. <laughs> <laughs> I got into headquarters early next day. I just finished calling Morgan to say good morning. I'll make a date for that night. And the desk sergeant said that you wanted to see me. I went in and Riley was with you. Well, we got a couple of things on pain, Mark. We wanted you in on them. Sure. Dan, that was a nice job on Karlstrom. Mm, he was certainly a scared guy. You know, one thing about killers, they always make a break for it sooner or later. Yeah, most of them do. What's doing on pain, Knight? I'll let Riley tell it. It's his story. Uh, there's nothing much except I talked to a number of people who think they saw him. I got a couple of them outside. Might as well bring them in, Riley. Yeah, uh, okay. Come on in, Gold. Sure. This is Captain Knight, Mr. Lieutenant Gold? Deglin. Gold. Gold. I... Mr. Gold is a cab driver. He got out of bed to come down and help us. Hey, sure, Chief. Anything to help you guys out. Okay. Gold, tell him the story you told me. Yeah, sure. Well, like I said, I pick up this fare downtown last night about one o'clock. Big guy with a bandage over one eye. He's carrying one of those soldier kit bags, you know? He wanted to go to the station, Grand Central. He was in a bad temper. Now, take a look at these pictures. Oh, now, where did I put that other... Oh, here it is. Oh. Well, uh... It might have been either one of these two. They, they, they look a little alike. Without the bandage, I couldn't swear which one. Okay, thanks, Gold. If we need you later, we'll call on you. Yeah, sure, sure. Any time, Chief. Any time at all. Well, pretty close. One of the two was a picture of Payne. Who was the other one he thought looked like Payne? An old newspaper picture of you, Mark. Me? Yeah. You didn't know I collected all your publicity, did you? <laughs> It'd been funny if he just identified you. Yeah. Yeah, very funny. Who's your other witness, Riley? An old lady who lives in the house across the street from Payne's place. Will you come in now, Miss Meacham? Miss 
Mr. Meacham, this is Captain Knight. How do you do, Mr. Meacham? How do you do? This is Lieutenant Teglin. Uh, Mrs. Meacham, Mark. I've seen you, Lieutenant. You have? Oh, yes. Oh, well, maybe it was when I was over to Payne's the other night, huh? Oh, no, I didn't mean there. In the papers. Oh. Your picture's been in the papers a lot. Yeah, I guess it has. Uh, Mrs. Meacham, Detective Riley tells me that you saw several things the other night, things that puzzled you. They certainly did puzzle me, Captain. Do you see quite a few things in the neighborhood, Mrs. Meacham? Well, some say that's all I do. Well, I say when a body gets old like me, there ain't much left but looking. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Now, what did you see the other night, Mrs. Meacham? Let's see. Oh, that was night before last. Well, like I told Mr. Riley, I couldn't sleep. So I was up late, and I saw Mr. Payne and his girl go in. But I didn't see her come out. You didn't see her come out? I made tea. Uh, Might have missed her. I have to have my tea, you know. But I did see her go back in later. How much later? Oh, maybe half an hour, or maybe more. But before she came back, somebody else left. Well, that must have been pain. Well, I don't rightly know. He was wearing a bandage and was carrying his kit bag, but he didn't wave to me. Didn't wave to you? Oh, Mr. Payne always waved to me when he went out. So it was mighty funny he didn't that time. Well, maybe he just forgot. What happened after that? No, sir, he never forgot to wave. Oh, well, anyway, about 20 minutes later... Mr. Payne's girl came back. She stayed just a little while and then went away. That's very interesting, Mrs. Meacham. Is that all? Of course it is. And that was a lot for a neighborhood where nothing ever happens. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Meacham. We'll call you if we need to talk to you again. Well, I won't remember any more than I have. Well, let's go, boys. Where are we going? I've been behind this desk so long, Mark, I'm getting calluses. I'm going over to Payne's room with you and Riley. The room was as I remembered it, except there wasn't any body on the floor and the police technicians were there. Now, let's see now. The old lady says she saw the girl come in twice, but never saw her go out. Any other way out of here, Riley? Through the window. Let's take a look. You men through with this window? Yeah, all through, Captain. On plenty of prints of some guy, probably this pain. A few prints of a small man or woman. Uh huh. Let's look at this window. I stood watching. They weren't going to find anything looking out of the window. Maybe they'd see the pry marks in the wood and find the satchelates were missing. But that wouldn't mean a thing. Suddenly, Riley let go of the window and... Watch 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 it! It It almost took my fingers off. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Hey, Al. The sash cords have been cut and the satchelates are missing. So what? Ah, I see what you mean, Dan. The river's near here, isn't it? That's what I was thinking. Okay. We'll call the harbor patrol and see what we get. So Riley had finally bulldogged into something. The walk down to the river was short. Shorter than the last time, it seemed. The police tug was stirring the mud of the river bottom with its grappling hook. When Payne's body finally came up, the dirty water cascaded from the blanket shroud and the sash weights dripped mud. Well, that's that, boys. Payne didn't run away at all. Somebody killed him. I think we can wrap this one up fast. How'd you figure that, Knight? Well, it's easy, Mark. The girl had a fight with him. She's the only one seen going in the other night. Her prints are on the window. She probably killed him, dressed up in his clothes, made it look like he was leaving, then came back and dumped the body. It's the girl, all right. But, Mark, but listen, this, this Taylor girl couldn't carry a big guy like that. Couldn't she? She was in the ambulance service overseas, Mark, and carried soldiers around. Civilians aren't any heavier. I'm putting out a pickup on the girl. Well, that's the way it was. I had an out, but it was the one out I didn't want. I didn't want the chair getting Morgan Taylor. Not when I wanted her. I'd have to fix it some way. I had to go home and think. Well, I hadn't been there long when... Morgan stood in the doorway. Her eyes tired and frightened, her face white. She went past me without speaking and over to a chair. When she looked at me, I knew I was right. I had to find some way to save her. Mark, I just heard. 
They want me for the murder of Ken. I know, honey. Well, why did you come here? Why? Why, because... Where else would I go, Mark? But you, you're not forgetting that I'm a cop, too. I... If you want to take me in, Mark, I'll understand. I only want to take you one place, Morgan. And that's not headquarters. But I've got to take you in. Whatever you say, Mark. But I'll get you out, honey. You won't be in there long enough to remember even what it looks like. After they booked her at headquarters, I went back to the apartment. I had to figure out some way to save her and myself. But first I had to get rid of that kit bag. If she'd seen it, everything would have been ruined. Besides, it was stupid to leave it around. Then, then I had an idea. There was one way out. That was to write this report to you, Captain Knight, and get out of the country. Then, when she was freed, she could join me. She was worth running for. Only wouldn't really be running. I was walking away. Well, that's that. So long, Captain Knight. I won't be seeing you. I picked up the kit bag with Payne's name on the side, went down the steps. Hello, Mark. Riley, what? I think I got a lead on the girl, and I thought you'd want to be in on the kill. But I... I got it, Dan. I just turned her in. What? Well, wh where'd you find it? What's the bag? Oh, nothing, Dan. Nothing. I... And, uh... Pain. Mark. Look, I found it. Where? In... in his apartment. I was there yesterday, and we were all there today. Look, what's the matter? You think I'm lying? I... I don't know, Mark. Say... What time were you at Payne's the other night? Look, Dan, I got something to do. But we'll talk about this case later, huh? Wait a minute, Mark. That cab driver picked out your picture as well as Payne's. The old lady said she'd seen you. Maybe they knew what they were talking about. Listen. You weren't surprised when we found those sash weights gone, or even when you saw Payne's body dragged out of the river. Oh, there's nothing worse than a cop who's turned bad. Mark. Get out of my way, Dan. Hey, hey, Mark, Mark. I had to run. Everything had been crowding in all day. That cab driver, the old lady, the kit bag. And now Riley, pushing in like a bulldog with his questions. I had to run and keep running. I had to get away before he could ask another question. Mark, don't run, Mark. Don't. Ah, oh, yeah. You shouldn't have run, Mark. You know what happens. When a guy runs. Thank you, Ray Milan, for a splendid performance. Mr. Milan will return in just a moment. Say, uh, Haro. Uh, what about Autolite's, uh... What about Autolite resistor spark plugs, stay-full batteries, ignition systems, and over 400 other automotive, aviation, and marine products? Yeah. Oh, let's save it for next week, Hap, while we salute the safest, surest, sanest drivers under the sun. And by Cornelius, I didn't say under the sod. That's the truck drivers of America, Hap. Dependable as a donut is dunkable, as a resistor spark plug is sparkable, as an Autolite product is superbable. Say, these wonderful truckers have got me wound up -able. I'm delighted. I'm auto-lighted. By Cornelius, I'm excited. Uh, Harlow, before these good friends have been good-nighted, remember... Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition-engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. <laughs> And now here again is Mr. Ray Milland. It has been such a pleasure to appear here tonight with this great cast of suspense actors. And I'm expecting almost as much pleasure from listening next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Lucille Ball in a little piece of rope. Another gripping study in... Suspense. Ray Milland may currently be seen in the Hal Wallace production So Evil, My Love. Tonight's sus suspense play was adapted from the novel of William L. Stewart, Night Cry, which will shortly be made into a motion picture. The music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leder. 
In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as William Powell, Agnes Moorhead, John Garfield, Edmund O'Brien, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Lucille Ball in A Little Piece of Rope. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive as if your life depends on it. It does. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. James Cagney in Anton Leder's production of No Escape, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The only thing I can do now is tell you how it happened, without any bunk. I don't care what you've heard or read about me. I'm not a devil or a mad dog. I don't know what people think happens to a fella. Do they think all of a sudden I turned into stone? I'm no different than anybody else. If I don't eat, I get hungry. If I cut myself shaving, I bleed. I'm just like the next guy, and that's the whole idea. This, this, it happened to me, sure, but it, it would have happened to anybody. It could have happened to you. It was supposed to have been one of them days you circle on the calendar with a red pencil. You see, with a little town like ours, 23 miles from the big city, right on the main highway, we get the speed artists going both ways. Yeah, and every couple of days they manage to leave something behind to remember them by. Like a kid with a broken back or, well, well, you get the idea. So a couple of years ago, the Chamber of Commerce started a safety campaign to name the safest driver of the year. Something to kind of keep the guys in their toes. And this year, the fellow they chose for the award was yours truly. And tonight was the big doings with a few well-chosen words from me, a lad who was a public speaker, was a wonderful bus driver. I got to the house a little after six. Teddy, uh, my kid brother, was just leaving. Hi, you big shot. <laughs> Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, the world's champion driver. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, all right. Hey, that's a swell picture of you in the paper. You don't look so bad for an older man. Quiet or I'll beat your ears in. <laughs> say, Eve called to say you should wear your blue suit and try to look human. That I would like to see. Me too. <laughs> Sorry, I can't wait, though. I'm late for a date. I'll see you in the morning, and you can tell me how you slayed. All right, Ted. So long. I gave myself the works. Shower, shave, the blue suit like the lady said. <laughs> Eve looked after me like I was at least five years old. But I didn't mind a bit. Ever since Ma died in 42, I'd kept the house going for Teddy because a kid needs something like that. But he was getting out of school in June, and then maybe Eve and I... Well, it was nice thinking about it. So nice that I guess I forgot all about the time that was passing. Yeah? Look, slow motion. You should be halfway over here by now. <laughs> okay, Eve, honey. You got the speech ready? Yes, but if you don't get moving, you'll be making that speech to a bunch of empty chairs and dirty plates. Yes, Mama. Be right over. Eve lived outside of town. I'd really have to step on it to pick her up and spend some time rehearsing the speech and then get to the high school auditorium by eight. I got into the car and I decided to take the canyon road through the hills where there wasn't any traffic. I could make better time that way. Now, wait, wait, wait just a second. Let me get my thoughts together. I got to get this part exactly right. You got to see it just like it happened or else it's all a waste of time. All right. I was on the canyon road that wound up through the steep hills, the wall of the mountain on one side of the road and the deep canyon on the other, about, about 10 to 7, but already dark. Nobody on the road but me, so I stuck pretty close to the middle. And every time, at every turn, the scream of the tires. But I wasn't worried about that. Four brand new tires, hardly a week old, and good brakes. I never take chances with things like that. Going about, about 50 miles an hour, maybe a little bit better. But I was all alone on the road, so what difference did it make? I was maybe two-thirds of the way up to the top right where the road makes a wide curve. I remember I, I put a cigarette in my mouth and I pushed the dashboard lighter in. I heard the lighter click and I started reaching for it. And then a pair of headlights 
blazing out of nowhere. And then a, a, a screeching horn, a car coming the other way. I felt my inside double up like a fist. I slammed my foot on the brake, swung the steering wheel to the right. I didn't feel anything hit, and I thought, oh, God, it's going to be okay. I jammed on the emergency. I jerked the door open. Now look back. The road was empty. I still heard the horn, though, but far away, and another sound, too, like a bunch of empty crates topping over and over. And at first, it didn't register with me. For maybe, maybe half a second, I just stood there wondering what happened. Then I saw the reflection of the flame lighting up the whole canyon. I went to the side of the road and looked down. The car was about 500 feet below, burning. And the horn still blasting away like the driver's body had fallen against it. I started down the canyon. It was almost, almost straight down. I fell and I rode and I came to my feet again. Why didn't that horn stop? Why didn't it stop? And then, then it did stop. And I realized that I had stopped. I had stopped too. What was I waiting for? Oh, to get my wind, that's all. I, I went down another few feet. And then, and I stopped again, holding myself against the tree. Come on. Come on, Harry. Get going. No. No. What good would it do to go down there? I couldn't help whoever was in that car. It was too late. Nobody could help. That far down the road, I saw another pair of headlights starting the long climb. I went back to my car. I told myself I was going for help. I drove on to the top of the hill. There was a little gas station up there. They'd have a phone. I was almost there. An old fellow in white overalls was putting around the pumps. I started slowing down. My whole life was about to be smashed. I'd have to tell them the truth, and what good would it do? What about Eve? What about my kid brother, Teddy? What's more important than a man's own family? I'd reached the gravel driveway to the gas station. The old guy heard me coming and started straightening up. No, no. I swung back onto the highway and pushed the accelerators to the floor. I got to Eve's house a little before 7.30. It was funny. I thought I was okay until I reached for the door handle. And then my fingers seemed to go dead and my heart stopped, started going a mile a minute. That's me. I'm sorry. Sorry I'm late, Eve. Well, where in heaven's name have you been? Honestly, if you aren't the most aggravate... Harry Graham. What? Huh? Look at you. You look like you've been run through a threshing machine. Yeah, I know. Let's go in and out. I'll clean up a little. Well, what in the world happened? Uh, I had a flat tire. I had to change it on the road. Flat tire? Oh, fine. All right, wait right here. I'll get the whisper room. Of all things to happen tonight. All right, all right. Happen. Lay off, will you? Harry. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, don't just stand there. While I'm doing this, take your comb out and start combing your hair. Hmm. Took my comb out and turned toward the whole mirror. Funny, I didn't look any different than yesterday or the day before that. I was still Harry Graham. After, after he finished with me, we went back to the car. Get in. I tell you what, you're so upset anyhow. Why don't you let me drive into town? Okay, if you want to. See, now, I turn left at the next block, don't I, for the canyon road? Canyon road? Yes, we can save some time going that way. No, no. Huh? No. No, I, I don't want to go to the canyon road. I want you to go the regular way. But we're going to be late. Do what I tell you. I'll drive the car myself. But, Harry, we always... Do what I tell you, Eve. All right. I don't have to bite my head off. What have you got against canyon road? It's, it's too dangerous at night. Well... All I've got to say is that when they picked you for the safest driver of the year, Harry Graham, they really hit the jackpot. We got to the high school auditorium just a couple of minutes late. But as it turned out, we weren't the only ones late. When we got to the main table, I saw that the chair next to mine was empty. Police Chief Blake, who was supposed to introduce me for my speech, hadn't showed up yet. And they... Then when the dinner was ended... Chief Blake came through the door, and he looked awful. He went over to the chairman of the meeting and whispered something, pointing at me. And then, then he started for me, and I, I thought my heart would quit beating. I was looking for a way to escape, maybe when... Hello, Harry. Oh, uh, hello, Chief. Hello. Folks, folks, please. I'm sorry I'm so late. I've just come from Canyon Road. Another terrible accident. The car went over the canyon, four people killed and burned. We still haven't gotten them out of the wreckage. It looks like they were forced off the road 
Another dirty hit and run case. Oh, that's terrible. Goodness. My boys are up there now looking for traces of this other car. And I don't have to tell you that we're going to keep on looking till we find out who it was. That's why I had one of my boys bring me back to town here to this meeting tonight. Because now it's even more important to let a fellow like our friend Harry Graham here know we appreciate his good work and wish to the saints there were more like him. Yes, after what I just saw on Canyon Road, I'm really proud of Harry Graham. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. James Cagney in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hap, this show hits with the zing of a set of Autolite resistor spark plugs. It gets me right between the optics. Arnold, I've been doing a little research. Yes? The frigid facts on faulty driving should dispel the optical illusions of any automobile driver foolish enough to relax his vigilance for one single moment. Every 30 seconds, a man, woman, or child is injured on our streets or highways. This year, 32,300 people are doomed to death. By Cornelius Happ, I never stopped to realize. You know, Harlow, it takes 10 seconds and 336 feet to stop a car traveling at 60 miles an hour. That's why brains are more important than brakes. Why the man behind the wheel should beware of the speed at which he's driving. Why safe and sane are synonymous words to drivers who value their fellows' lives as well as their own. In other words, Hap, just because auto light resistor spark plugs give your car more pep, don't try to use all of it, eh? Exactly, Harlow. Hey, but there's more. The Good Samaritan is the gracious guy or gal who not only knows and keeps the rules of the road, but also keeps his temper in his head when some bungling Benny gives him the hog, the road hog treatment. Yes, Hap, it's sad but true that one right way to wrong driving is to always demand your highway rights. Be sure to be safe. Right, Harlow. And now let's get back to suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. James Cagney as Harry in No Escape, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I I had to keep my eyes on the table. I couldn't even look at the chief as he stood there praising me. All I could see was that burning wreck at the foot of the cliff, and all I could hear was that awful horn blowing. I had to bite my lips to keep him screaming, I did it. Harry. Uh, Harry. What? Oh, what? Uh, Open your feet, son. We'd like to hear a few words from you. Yeah. Oh, look, uh, look, uh, look, Chief, folks, I, I don't think anybody wants to listen to me tonight. Uh, please, let's forget it. No, Harry. Now more than ever, we should hear what a fellow like you has to say. Come on, Harry. Hey, oh, but, but listen, listen. Uh, Go on, Harry. Uh, oh, well, all right. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm no, I'm no great shakes as a speech maker. Just a lucky thing my girl's a good English teacher. <laughs> I, uh... I don't believe we should honor a man for safe driving any more than we should honor him because he's never killed anyone with a gun. Now, uh, when, a, when a man gets behind the wheel of a car, he doesn't give up his responsibilities to his fellow men. No one can escape the, 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 uh, the responsibility of being his brother's keeper. And, and that goes for... That goes for... That... Harry, what's Listen wrong? Listen to me. How can I stand up here and read a speech after what... After what Chief Blake just told us. No, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Uh, I guess Harry's right after all, folks. I guess maybe we just better call him eating off. I know I've got to get back to Canyon Road as soon as I can. Come on, Eve. Come on. Let's get out of here. All right, honey. Oh, Harry. Yeah, Chief. Uh, you can do me a big favor. Huh? The fellow brought me down here. I had to beat it right back to the accident. Oh, so? I've got to get back there myself right away. Hmm. Can you give me a lift? Uh, well, I, I sure like to, Chief, but, well, I've got to I've got to get Eve home. Well, you could take me home by the way of Canyon Road. We've gone that way before, honey. But uh, I'd uh, be much obliged to you, Harry. Well, you see, Chief. It's Harry. Okay, okay, let's go. Uh, it's too bad the meeting had to end like this. But I have a hunch you feel like I do, Harry. Like you can't sit still till you find the rat who killed those people. Well, I promise you this, Harry. Whoever he is, we'll get him. Yeah, wasn't that one for the book? 
Less than two hours after my accident, with the other car going over into the canyon, I was back on Canyon Road. Only this time with Eve sitting behind me and the chief of police in back. Uh, Harry, if you don't mind, could you step on a little bit? I, I promise you I won't give you a ticket. Okay, chief. Honey, push the lighter in, will you? Lighter? For my cigarette. Oh, sure, sure. The speed better, chief? Fine. Harry hates this road. I wanted him to take it earlier tonight. Well, it's all right if you got good tires. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Had four brand new ones put on just last week. Oh, here, here's your light, Eve. Eve. Huh? Oh. Thanks. Hmm. Her voice didn't sound right. Her voice didn't sound right. And then I remembered. When I picked her up tonight, I told her the reason I was so messed up was that I'd had to change a tire. She was thinking about that now. I knew she was, trying to figure out why I'd lied to her. Nobody said anything after that. When we reached the part of the road just before it made the big bend, I started slowing down. I uh, hope I got you here quick enough, Chief. Yeah, you did fine. Is this where it was? Yeah, just around this bend. Yeah, that's right. But how did... Huh? Nothing. Again, again, I'd said the wrong thing. What was the matter with me? How was I supposed to know that that accident was around the bend? I was cutting my own throat, but now... Now I'd made the turn and there was the red flag burning on the road and a big crash truck at the edge of the canyon and police cars blocking the highway. Just pull over the side, Harry. Okay. Now oh, they're coming down there, Fraser. Oh, oh, hello, Chief. You ready to start bringing them up soon? That's, uh... That's a walkie-talkie he's working with? Yeah. He keeps contact with the men down the canyon. Say, Harry, why don't you come along with me and really see how's, how we work here? Oh, thanks, but I've, I've got to get Eve on home. The school teacher's got, got to get up early. Isn't that right, baby? I don't mind waiting if you'd like to stay. Huh? Yeah, come along, Harry. Oh, but, uh... I don't mind waiting, Harry. Hmm. Now, now it was me against all of them. Oh, I was sick about that car down there in the canyon, those four bodies inside. But, well, nothing could change that now. And I was fighting for my own life. And they wouldn't break me down. I stood with my foot on the bumper and Chief Blake leaned me against the fender of my car while his boys gave yep. their reports about the hit-and-run car and didn't bother me a bit. Oh, Two of them okay. told about the plastic cars they made a, of, a, of, a, of a tire mark they found on the road. Uh, <clears throat> does it help you any, Chief? Uh, not much, Harry. No tire. A lot of people have no tires. <laughs> you, for instance. <laughs> And I kicked my new front tire for them, kicked it hard. They brought over an old fellow in white overalls. The guy in the service station where I'd almost turned in to report the accident. The chief asked him if he thought the car I'd seen was a hit and run. It must have been just about that time, you know. And the way this fellow skadoodled away for no reason at all. I don't know what kind of a car it was, though. A black sedan, I'd say. <laughs> like this one, maybe? Uh, uh, well, might be. Might be that. But there's two darks, to be sure. Well, first thing tomorrow, I'm going to get myself a green convertible. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody got a good laugh out of that, but I would have to be careful. Mustn't go too far. It was me against all of them, and I felt the kind of excitement that a guy might get from walking a tightrope. Thinking back now, sure seems screwy, but that, that's how I felt. And maybe that is the worst thing that happens to a guy in my spot. The way it turns you into a wild animal against the world. Chief Blake. Hey, yeah, Charlie. It was the fellow with the walkie-talkie over near the crash truck. We're ready to start bringing up the bodies. Okay. Come on, Harry. Let's go over. Something flopped coldly in my stomach and then lay still. This was the test. If they didn't break me down now, they could never do it, never in a million years. All the people who'd come up from the town started gathering around the crash truck. I wanted to run and never stop running. But I didn't move. And just then, the first body swung into view. And you could hear everyone in the crowd suck in his breath. And I bit down hard on my lip till I tasted blood. A brown blanket wrapped neatly around something. And then the bundle rested on the ground. And everyone seemed to edge away from it like it could hurt them. And the cable went down into the valley again. And then there was a second bundle. And then there was a third. And then a fourth. 
and over and over like a drum beat, like a prayer, I told myself they wouldn't break me down. And then someone pushed forward from the crowd. Joe Mandel, the little tailor. He seemed shy and embarrassed, as though he had no business being here. Uh, uh, Chief, Chief Blake. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, Joe. Uh, well, my boy, Philip, he, he didn't come home for supper tonight, and I... You, you want to look? Uh... Well, you know how a woman is. Rose will feel better if I tell her, okay, I looked, and it wasn't... Well, you know. All right, Joe. Doesn't hurt none. Thank you. No. I... No. I... I... I better go back to my rose. I... Sorry, Joe. I... Uh, w wait a minute. Yes? Do you know who Phil was going to be with tonight? I... His best friend was Mike Roebuck. They were always together. <laughs> the Goldust twins, everybody called them. Thanks, Joe. Excuse me, Chief. I must go to Rose now. Fraser! Hey, yes, Chief. Get back to town. Go with the Robucks. Don't tell them anything is wrong. Just see if Mike's home. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't take any more. I started back for the car. My legs felt like they weighed a ton. I heard a sudden movement in the crowd behind me. Oh, no! Oh, my baby! My baby! They wouldn't break me down. They wouldn't break me down. I opened the car door. And Eve was there. I'd almost forgotten her. And I was sure she knew the truth. They brought up all four? Yeah. Harry. I, I, don't, I don't want to hear anything now. I'm taking you home. Wait, Harry. Listen, I'm telling you. Kiss me, Harry. What? Hold me and kiss me. I'm such a stupid fool. Hold me. Hold all me. right, all right. Now, now stop it, stop it. Harry, if you knew what's been going through my mind. Okay, okay. Stop it. Just a fool, a stupid fool. And then when I saw you come back to the car, the look on your face... Oh, Harry, how could I have ever thought... Oh, all right, all right. Now, we, we'll talk about it later. I'll never talk about it again. Never, Harry. So, it was all over with. I was going to be okay. God, I wasn't proud. I felt rotten and sick. And now that it was all over, the strength ran out of me like water running out of a glass. But what good would it have been to crucify myself? It wouldn't have changed anything. I wasn't a bad guy. It could have happened to anybody. And now, now I was going to be able to take care of my own. Eve and my kid brother, Teddy. Was that a bad guy? A fellow who wanted to do right for his family? I started the car. And I put in gear and then looking at me through the window was, was Chief Blake signaling me to wait. I turned the key off. Well, whatever it was, I was very tired. Come on out, Harry. I've got to get Eve home. Come on out of the car. But, Harry... Do like I tell you. Come with me. What do you want? Come with me. When you drove up here tonight, I... I didn't think it would end like this. You know about it? You, of all people, Harry. Listen, you've got to believe me. It shouldn't have happened to a fella like you. You've got to hear my side. Right here, Harry. Huh? Huh? What do you... Take a look at... this fourth body. Why should I? Pull the blanket back, Harry. Oh, no. No. Teddy. Teddy! So, 
That's it. The whole works. I don't care what you heard or read in the papers. That's the story, just like it happened. No bunk. And thinking back, I, I guess I kind of hit the nail on the head in that speech that I made that night. You know, that part about no man can ever escape the responsibility of being his brother's keeper. Thank you, James Cagney, for a magnificent performance. Mr. Cagney will return in just a moment. Well, Hap, after that performance of Jimmy Cagney's and your heartfelt expressions on the rights and wrongs of the driving man, it's hard to switch the conversation to auto light resistor spark plugs. <laughs> well, Harlow, I'm sure you'll find a way. Yes, I think I'll just say, friends, switch to a set of auto light resistor spark plugs just as quickly as you can swing into a service station. When you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs, your car will idle smoother, give you better luck with lean gas mixtures, actually save you gas dollars. What's more, auto light resistor spark plugs cut down spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Switch to auto light resistor spark plugs today. And remember, auto light means spark plugs. Ignition engineered resistor spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Mr. James Cagney. It's always a pleasure to appear on Suspense, but I was especially pleased when Tony Lita asked me to do tonight's story. That's because I feel strongly about the kind of thing that happened to Harry Graham. I believe that any person who gets behind the wheel of a car assumes a great responsibility to himself, to his family, to his fellow men. That one moment of carelessness or recklessness or drunkenness can mean a lifetime of pain and misery for someone. And it might be you or me. Yes, when you're driving an automobile, we are our brother's keeper. Over the holiday season and all the time, drive carefully. Next week on radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Herbert Marshall will appear in a story with a Christmas atmosphere. Another study in... Suspense. James Cagney is now appearing in the photoplay of William Saroyan's prize stage hit, The Time of Your Life. Copies of tonight's suspense play, No Escape, by Larry Marcus, will be available for educational use by groups interested in highway safety. They may be obtained by writing Suspense, the Columbia Broadcasting System, Hollywood, California. Music was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Ronald Coleman, Robert Montgomery, Dana Andrews, and Frank Sinatra. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And next Thursday, same time, hear Herbert Marshall. Now... The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense! Tonight, the Roma Wines bring you Dane Clark, a star of This Will Kill You, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Dane Clark in a remarkable tale of... Suspense!
Listen, get a load of this. This will kill you. I got a story that should be written up by one of those big magazine writers. Only mine is true. The whole thing is true, so help me. You know, they say truth is stranger than fiction, don't they? Well, get this. I was working down at the Acme Engineering, an outfit making hydraulic valves for gun turrets. And we had a foreman named Charlie Harris, one of those uh, big, good-looking guys who thought he was a big shot because he was a boss. Well, this guy was always picking on me. Like, for instance, one morning, I come to work a few minutes late, and this Harris says, Well, good afternoon, Jordan. Ah, save those gags for Jack Benny. It's only a quarter after eight. Well, get here at eight, and you'll be spared my sense of humor. Well, ain't a guy got a right to get here a couple of minutes late once in a while? Yeah, sure, once in a while, Joe, but not every other day. Oh, gee, Charlie, my alarm clock's on a bum. You know you can't buy a new one these days. Oh, save that for the teacher. Now, come on, Joe, come on, get on the ball. Save that for the teacher, he said. Always throwing up to me that he graduated from engineering school and I never even had a chance to go to high school. As if you need an education to be a smart guy. Why, well, I could tell you a hundred guys who never even went to school could buy and sell that guy a million... Well, that's another story. Anyway, this Charlie Harris kept giving me the needle. Joe, can I talk to you for a minute? What is it now, Chief? Quit calling me Chief. Now look, kid, look. I don't know what's wrong, but you're slowing up. The other boys are turning out 100 parts a day, and you're only averaging 80. Now, what's the trouble, Joe? Well, I don't know. My eyes hurt. This work gets tough on the eyes, and I got to stop once in a while. My, my eyes hurt bad. You complained last week, too, Joe, and the company doctor's report said there was nothing wrong. Ah, what does that quack know? All right, all right. Now, quit the complaints and get on the job, Joe. We've still got a war on our hands, even though you and a lot of other guys have forgotten it since Germany took the count. <laughs> There's a war on. Did you get that? At the time, he was technically right, but give me the business just because he didn't like me, waving your flag and singing, oh, say, can you see? Look, I'm just as patriotic as him or any other guy. Could I help it if my eyes hurt bad? But he had to go make a big thing out of it just because I got in the habit of, uh, well, stepping out a little here and there, and he found out. Well, ain't a guy got a right to have a little fun once in a while just because those Japs are still popping away? So my eyes hurt a little the next day. Is that so terrible? Are the Japs going to win a war just because I've had a little fun? Well, anyway, he keeps picking on me and picking on me. And one day, while I was knocking my brains out... Joe! Oh, let me ride in the wide open spaces that I love. Don't offense me Joe! In... What? Yeah? Now, look, Joe, look. I don't like playing cops, but you know there's oil and gasoline all over the place. Yeah? And that a cigarette dropped in one of those pools could burn the plant down? So what? So read the sign beside your machine. Well, I can read it, Charlie. Go on, read it. No smoking. Drop that cigarette. Why, what cigarette, Charlie? You stupid jerk! Why, you, I'll break your head for that! Oh, you will, eh? No, there you go, Oh, oh, oh! I would have mobilized a guy, but he hit me a lucky punch. Never would have happened again in a million years, but... Well, he knocked me out. Charlie was standing by the cop when I came to looking worried, and he started to apologize, but I gave him a quick brush. Why, that stinking rat, he was scared of me. That's why he didn't report me to the front office. He acted as if he were doing me a big thing by not snitching, but it was because he was scared of me. He thought I'd forget. <laughs> Joe Jordan never forgets. Remember that. And Joe Jordan always gets even. But I played my cards right. I didn't let him know I was still sore. Now, that was smart, wasn't it? I went on working as if nothing happened, even though the rest of the guys started picking on me, too. Because he was a boss and they were trying to get in good with him, they kept it after me every day until I thought my head would explode, always, always rubbing it in. Hey, Jack Dempsey, still leading with your chin? <laughs> Quit using my tools all the time, Joe. Hey, Joe, you ain't smoking again, are you? You'll able to get another lucky punch from Charlie. Hey, hey, quit throwing your shavings on my machine, Joe. I used to get splitting headaches and the pounding on my brain. Well, you would too get it from all sides like that, wouldn't you? It wasn't so bad during the day. The machine drowned out the noise in my head, but at night, at night, that pounding would start steady like my machine, banging away all the time so I couldn't sleep. 
It might have got another guy, but not me. Not me. I'm too tough. And I got plans for Joe Jordan. Be a big guy someday with my brains. No foreman of some small time outfit. Be head man of the biggest shop in town with a classy car, a big house with servants, and a beautiful wife. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful wife. And I had her all picked out. Her name was Harriet Slate, and she was a stenographer at Acme. All the guys was on the make for her, but, well, she had a yen for me. Not that she ever said anything, but I can tell. You see, I know dames. Well, at the water cooler this day, I managed to bump her as I got a paper cup and... Oh, what? Oh, pardon as moi Oh, you speak French. <laughs> oh, a little. I knew a guy from Paris, France once, and he taught me a couple of things. Uh, Cherchez la femme. <laughs> Comentez, uh, alley <laughs> Quite an accent. Excuse me, Joe, I gotta get back to No, me. no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got a lot of accomplishments. I'm a good dancer, too. Did you know that I took second place in the jitterbug contest at Ocean Park last year? No, I didn't. Huh? The Lindy? No, I'm sort of on the conservative side. Well, I can do the square stuff, too. We must have a dance sometime. Excuse me, Joe, I'm No, must get... uh, wait, Harriet, I just happened to think, uh, how about going on a company dance with me on Friday? I'm very sorry, Joe, but I can't. Why, aren't you going? Yes, but... I have a date with Charlie. Charlie who? Charlie Harris. Charlie Harris. Charlie Harris. Charlie Harris. He moved into my life. Then he moved into my head and he started it banging. And now he moved in with my girl. That guy was doing everything he could to burn me up. He knew I was going to ask Harry to the dance, but he beat me to it. Okay, I said to myself, I can wait a week. But I'll get to dance with that little lady, and once I get her in my arms and I show her a couple of steps, she won't want to dance with him again. Well, it was a long week, and I kept hearing reports that Charlie and Harriet were engaged. But that was just to burn me up, see? And then came the dance. Hey, didn't you bring a dame, Joe? I got a doll here, pal. Where is she, dancing with some other guy? Yeah, yeah, she's dancing with some other guy. Don't stand there with egg all over your face. <laughs> my dame was dancing with another guy, you can bet I'd cut in. Well, that's a good idea. Uh, pardon me, I'm cutting in. Oh, no, you're not, Joe. Look, I wasn't asking the pleasure of you, Charlie. Now, if you don't mind... This is our favorite number, Joe. Well, why can't I cut in once? Just because he's a big foreman or something? No, because you're the big dope. <laughs> dope. Did you get that? He called me a dope. But he didn't know I was smart. You know, all good things ain't on the surface, you know. I went home, I tried to sleep. But the pounding on my brain was coming like a sledgehammer. Bang, 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 bang. And I could hear her laughing at me. I, that dirty, double-crossing dame, laughing at me. Laughing at me! And the bang on my head was coming louder and louder and crashing against my brain, exploding on my forehead. And then the pounding stopped. For the first time in weeks, there was silence in my head. That soft, cool quiet, like Sunday morning when you were a kid and no one was awake in the house but you. That Christmas night after the excitement was over and you went to bed and you thought about the new sled and the wonderful dinner you just ate. And there was peace on earth and... And then I got the idea. No more pounding in my head now. I was going to eliminate the cause of the pounding, kill the root. Yeah, I was going to kill two birds with one stone. Charlie Harris was going to burn for murder. And the murder? The murder of Harriet Slate. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Dane Clark in This Will Kill You by I.A. Finley. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Here's a suggestion from the internationally renowned hostess Elsa Maxwell, who says this about smart and gracious hospitality. 
Next time you entertain, flatter your guests by serving glorious gold and amber Roma California Sherry. Perfect before dinner, perfect at any time. A most delightful wine of light, nut-like taste. Serve cool. From California's choicest vineyards come the carefully selected wine grapes for distinguished Roma Sherry and all fine Roma wines. Remember, good Roma wines never vary in fine quality, are always pleasing, the happy result of selected grapes, carefully picked at their peak of flavor goodness, gently pressed, then unhurriedly, guided to perfection by the ancient skill of Roma's famed wineries. Yes, good Roma wines are always delicious, yet cost only pennies a glass. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at reasonable cost, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Dane Clark in This Will Kill You, a narrative well calculated to keep you in suspense. Are you still with me? Well, listen. Like I was telling you, I decided to kill Harriet and pin the rap on Charlie. <laughs> Fooled you, didn't I? You thought I was going to knock off Charlie myself, didn't you? No, 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 no. The law was going to do that. You see? You get the switch? Now, get this. I knew how I was going to knock off the dame, and I knew how I was going to pin the blame on Charlie. But the only thing missing was the motive. You understand the motive? So before I killed her, I started supplying the motive. Every day down at the plant, I drop something here, and I drop something there to the guys. Hey, uh, I uh, just heard that Charlie and Harriet was having an argument down the hall. Oh, love a spat, probably. No, no, I understand things aren't so hot job between those two. Oh, you're crazy, Joe. Well, that's what I heard. Hey, Charlie's been doing a lot of bowling these nights, hasn't he? Yeah, he loves it. Well, he didn't seem to when he and Harriet were so palsy walsy I heard something about that, but I don't believe it. No, I do, I do. I heard him arguing plenty in the hall the other day. Say, did you hear that Charlie and Harriet had a big blow-off last night? Something about another guy? Yeah, I heard things weren't going so hot with those two lately. Listen, did you hear that Harriet and Charlie had a big scrap the other night? Old news, Marty. It's old news. I understand she's got a guy up north, and Charlie is burning. Oh, he ought to bust her head wide open. It'd serve her right for two time and a white guy like Charlie. There was the motive. Signed, sealed, wrapped up in a big red ribbon. Now, was that smart or was that smart? The next afternoon, I heard Charlie making a date with her for that night. <laughs> he didn't know it, but it was going to be his last date. When the five o'clock whistle blew, Charlie went in to wash his hands. I slipped over to his workbench. I grabbed the steel pipe he used on his drill press, and I slipped under my coat. I wore gloves so my fingerprints wouldn't show on it. Smart, huh? Only Charlie's fingerprints were on the pipe. I waited outside the plant, and a little while, Charlie walked by. Uh, got a minute, Charlie? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Look, there's an idea I've been working on that can speed production in our department. Now, can I talk to you tonight for an hour or so? Oh, I'm sorry, Joe. I can't tonight. I got a date with an angel. But, Charlie, with my idea, each man can turn out 200 valves a day easy. I got it all worked out in a model in my room. Can't you make it tonight? Look, Joe, I told you I got a date. Oh, fine, fine. You're always giving me that patriotic stuff when it doesn't cost you anything. Huh? Okay, Charlie, I took you up on it. I've been giving up my nights to work on this idea I have. Now, look, I don't expect nothing out of it. But when I ask you to give up a measly hour, you're too busy. Now, why can't you come up after your date? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy there, Joe. Easy. Oh, I didn't know you were so hot about all of this. Okay, okay, if it means so much to you. Look, uh, suppose I leave my girl about 11 and get to your room a few minutes later, huh? Gee, you're swell, Charlie, swell. I'll be waiting for you. Now, look, I may be out for a minute or two to get a pack of butts or something, but the door will be open, so will you wait for me? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. I'll see you later. You sure will. Everything was working out just like I planned. Pretty good for a dumb guy, huh? I grabbed a bite of dinner and then I dropped over to Charlie's boarding house. He lived on the first floor in the back. I looked at his window and it was open. Perfect. I waited until dark, I pushed up the window and I dropped in. 
It took only a few seconds to find what I wanted. A handkerchief with Charlie's initials on it. I was outside and walking down the street before I had a chance to even get nervous. I killed time till about 10.30, and then I drove over to Harriet's house, and I waited across the street. In a little while, Harriet and Charlie walked up, and they talked, and then Charlie looked at his watch, and he kissed her goodnight. Kissed her goodnight. I waited for a few minutes after he left, then I walked up to her room and knocked on the door. It's me, Harry. It's Joe Jordan. I got something to tell you about Charlie. What is it, Joe? <laughs> well, don't get nervous. Nothing's happened. I'm just playing a little trick on Charlie. Oh, you got me scared for a second. <laughs> Come on in, Joe. I was just making a little home recording of this song on the radio. You know, singing along with the band. I know Charlie will get a big kick out of it. That's your uh, favorite song, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's Charlie's, too. We love it. You really go for that guy, don't you? Is there any question about it? Joe, we were going to tell everybody in a few days anyway, so you may as well know now. Charlie and I are going to be married in three weeks when we get our vacations. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's wonderful. Only you're taking your vacation a little sooner than that, baby. What do you mean? You're not marrying him or anybody else. Are you kidding? Get out of here, you big dope. Oh, I'm a big dope, huh? I'm a big dope. Joe. Joe. What are you going to do with it? Joe! Joe, no! Ah! I did it. It was done. I looked at a clock. It was 11.10. He'd just be getting to my room now. Five minutes to kill. Hey, did you get that? Now I had time to kill. That was a good one, wasn't it? I dropped Charlie's handkerchief on the floor, then messed up the joint to look like a struggle. And I waited till 11.15, and then I smashed the clock. It stopped dead. <laughs> Did you hear that one? The clock stopped dead. Good, huh? I dropped the steel pipe on the floor, blew the place fast, and raced home. I ran up the stairs, worried that maybe Charlie had left, but he was still there. Well, where have you been, Joe? I was just getting ready to leave. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I... I got stuck. Oh, okay, okay. Where's the model you were talking about? Oh, gee, I'm sorry to drag you all the way over here for nothing. It's huh? it's still at the welders. I I thought it would be here sure by tonight. Can we make it tomorrow? Oh, you're a corker, Joe. You've messed up my whole evening. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> I kept chewing the fat with Charlie about this and that until I was sure he wouldn't get home until late. And then I dropped off to a nice, restful sleep. The next morning, I was on the job at eight on the dot. Charlie was there already, but that didn't worry me. It wouldn't be for long. And about an hour later, the kid from the front office came up and said something to Charlie, and he left the shop. Now, that was it. Those were the dicks, and Charlie was a dead pigeon. I went on with my work, not doing very much, just faking, you know, because I knew I was going to be next. And I was. The same kid came at lunchtime and told me I was wanted at the front gate. Got a little nervous when I saw the two big coppers, but as soon as they spoke, I felt it was going to be all right. Joe Jordan? Yeah? Yeah, that's me. I'm Lieutenant Sullivan, Homicide Squad. This is Sergeant Carter. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hop in. Hope you don't mind coming down to headquarters with us when I ask you a couple of questions. No, I don't mind. What's it all about? Uh, where were you last night, Jordan? Uh, last night? Well, I... I hit the hay early. What time? I was awful tired. I had a tough day at the shop yesterday. I guess it was about 9.30. Did you see Charlie Harris last night? No, I saw him when we left the plant yesterday about 5, but... Hey, wait a minute. Where's Charlie now? He left the shop about 10 this morning. Never mind. But he says he was in your room at 11.15. He says he was in my room at 11... Well, maybe he was. No, Charlie Harris is a white guy. He don't lie. If, if he says so, then he's probably right. I thought you said you went to bed about 9.30. Well, I, I did. <laughs> maybe I was asleep when he came in. Maybe I was talking to my sleep when he was there. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do anything to contradict Charlie. Say, say, what are you guys trying to pin on me? If Charlie's in a jam, I got to know what he said because I got to back him Save up. Save it, kid. Tell me, 
Huh? Do you know Harriet Slate? Why, that no good two-timing dame double-crossing a good guy like Charlie. Why, you know, he was telling me yesterday when we left the plant yesterday that he was going to get a settle last night once and for all. As a matter of fact, he... Say, what are you guys smiling at? Did I say something? Why, did I say anything to make Charlie... To Charlie... Smart, huh? I handled that smart, didn't I? You see now how I worked the whole thing out? Every little detail? Remember now how I planned it that night in bed when the pounding stopped like I told you before? Oh, oh the trial was a cinch. The DA had all the evidence he needed and a little more. Charlie was with her that night? Proved. The steel pipe was his, wasn't it? Proved. They were his fingerprints on it, wasn't they? Proved. And the motive? The boys in the plant furnished that. They were perfect witnesses. They liked Charlie. They tried to help him, but they had to admit the stories that were going around. And the piece, the resistance, <laughs> that's French, you know, was the way I knocked his alibi for a loop. Now do you see why I smashed the clock at 11.15, do you? It was airtight. Charles Harris, will you rise and come before the court? Charles Harris, a jury of your peers have found you guilty of murder in the first degree, and I... <laughs> Boy, what a day. You should have seen him. He stood there trying to put on the big shot stuff even then, trying to act like he wasn't scared. But I could tell he was ready to faint right there and then. But the newspaper guys were taken and they said he stood straight and fine and brave, like a soldier facing a firing squad. That's what they said, the dopes. But I knew he was yellow. Or else he wouldn't have picked on me just because he was boss, would he? Would he? Huh? So you see? I was smarter than he thought, than anybody thought, even the D.A. and those dicks. Now, there was a funny situation for you, wasn't it? The real murderer was in court furnishing that testimony that convicted that poor... <laughs> and no one knew it. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it, huh? <laughs> isn't that wonderful, Father, huh? Wasn't that marvelous? The real guy was in court... It's time, Father. Be brave now, Joseph. We must go. Well, all right, Father, but let me tell you the punchline. Come on, Joe, it's time. Ah, oh, will you quit a warden so we'll be a minute late? So you'll pay the guy who pulls the switch a minute overtime. The state can afford it. I've been telling Father here the whole story. I gotta tell him the snapper, don't I? Let him finish, warden. Go on, my son. Well, you see, it was a fluke, Father. A million to one shot. He never would have got me if not for just one thing. One little mistake, Father. You see, the night I knocked the doll off, she up and told me that she was making a recording of that song on the radio. She told me, do you hear? And I forget all about it. So all the time I was spilling my guts to Harriet, that machine was taking down every word. And I forgot about it. Why, if I had only thought of the record, if I only smashed it that night. But I didn't. Then Harriet's old lady got a hold of her stuff, and months later she decided to play the records, and she heard the whole thing. My whole confession, just as if I spilled it to the dicks. Father. We must go now, Joseph. Okay, Father. I'm coming. Come on, Warden. Come on, come on. Watch a real man walk down the last mile. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You make it me to lie down. You've seen uh, plenty of guys walking down this road, didn't you, Warden? Huh? I bet none of them ever took it as good as me, did they? They say guys uh, crack up on this little walk, don't they? Not me. I got guts. I bet Charlie would have cracked up by now, huh, Warden? You know, those... Those newspaper guys said he stood straight and fine and brave that day. He wouldn't be standing that way now, would he, Warden? He'd be, he'd be screaming his yellow head off. He wouldn't be taking it like me. See, there's nothing to be scared of. Guy pulls a little switch, it's all over. They say you don't feel a thing. You don't feel nothing, do you, Warden? You should know, you see plenty of it. It doesn't hurt. Does he? I would have been a big man in this town. Classy car. Big house with servants. Beautiful wife. It's a beautiful wife, but I, I got a tough break. You know, one, one in a million, I tell you, but it, it's all in the game, see? Come see, come saw. It's French, you know. I'm taking it pretty good, ain't I? Nobody take it like me. Nobody. Not many of them, do they? Do they, wouldn't, huh? Huh? 
Do you think the paper will say I stood straight, fine, and brave? Like a guy facing the firing squad, huh? Do you? I'm taking it pretty good, ain't I, Warden? Ain't I, Father? Tell me. I said, tell me. I'm not afraid. You hear me? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to burn. Look, I'm laughing. Aha! 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 No, don't take me in there, oh God! Please don't take me in there, don't take me in there! I won't take me in there, don't Roma Wines have brought you Dane Clark as star of This Will Kill You. Tonight's study in Suspense. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood... Roma Wines bring you the remarkable actress whose performance in the Paramount picture For Whom the Bell Tolls won her an Academy Award, Katina Paxinou. And so with a woman in red and with the performance of Madame Paxinou, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! All of London, few houses were so fine, so correct, so austere, and yet gracious with age as number 30, Henrik Square. That was true of its reception room, true of its long, quiet hallway along which the young man led the girl. Aunt Rita, this is Miss Julia Ross. The woman rested her knitting in her lap and slowly turned around. She was a giant of a woman, a woman of 60 in a bright red dress. For several seconds, she stared fixedly across at Julia. Then, in an instant, a soft, gentle smile came on her face. Perfect. How perfect. I beg your pardon? Here. Come over here, child. Let me look at you. That's it. Over there, child. Sit there on the divan. And, and Carl, I think I shall have my milk now. And Miss Ross will have some with me. Will you? Won't you, Miss Ross? Oh, some milk? Oh, but I, I never... Some warm milk and a biscuit. Of course you will. I always find it very sustaining. Uh, Carl, you heard the young lady. <laughs> and stop staring at her. You've seen a pretty girl before. Was I staring? <laughs> Excuse me, Miss Ross. Hurry now like a nice boy. Is he your secretary? Let us say that he has been substituting... Until I find someone like you. You mean, you think I will do? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> well, I... All I know is when I saw your advertisement in the paper, Miss Crable, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Wanted secretary, Irish girl, blonde hair, age about 25. It was all so perfect. It sounded just... Well, it was like me. And just like Sheila. That was my former secretary, Miss Ross. You, who passed away just recently. Oh. She had been with me many years. I'm so sorry, Miss Crable. I had the feeling that my loss might be lessened if I could really replace her. <laughs> An old lady's whim, of course. Uh, because no one is ever exactly like someone else. You, for example, I'm sure you have friends, acquaintances... Relatives, perhaps, uh, you see now and then. Uh, Sheila oh, didn't... But, but, but you see, I don't. What I mean is, my parents aren't living, and so far as friends or acquaintances are concerned, I I hadn't had much time lately, and... Well, my landlady, of course, I know her, but... Unbelievable, Miss Ross. Uh, 
because it's so perfect. You see, the less time you have for outside attractions, the more time you have for me. The milk, Aunt Rita, and the biscuits. Uh, will this table do here? That will be fine, dear. And leave us alone. Oh, very well. My aunt is a very domineering woman, Miss Rose. <laughs> oh, but also a generous one, I think. Your milk, dear. And a biscuit? Oh, just the milk, thank you. Miss Crabo, there's something you must know. Uh, well, don't hesitate, child. Miss Crabo, I... I'm afraid I'm not quite what you think. I mean, I've never really done any secretarial work before. Oh. I've had some business training, a little, but not oh. actual experience. <laughs> I... I mean it, Miss Crabo. I, I lied in what I wrote you. I, I wanted the position and I needed it so much. And... You silly girl. <laughs> you mean... You still want me? Certainly. Now finish your milk before it, it gets cold. Oh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there will be very little secretarial work for you to do. I shall want uh, a sort of, uh, yes, a companion. Now, I shall want you to start immediately. You will, of course, live here in the house and... Live in the house? But of course, you are my companion. Oh, but I didn't understand that I... Yes. Oh, well, then... I think perhaps I should make plans accordingly. I mean, I'd better leave now. I, oh. I shall want to go to my boarding house and cancel my lodging. Oh, there will be plenty of time for that, child. Carl and I generally take an afternoon stroll and would like you oh, to... But, but you see, there'll be other arrangements. People I must see and people? things to... But you said you knew no people. Oh, yes. Well, um, Miss Crabo, I have no qualifications for this position. I... Oh... Why, uh, child? What's the matter? I don't know. Suddenly, I... I feel so drowsy. Well, then, I would just lie back on the diamond. Oh, but there's no reason for it. I... Oh, but there is, child. You are weary from the strain, the uncertainty, the ceaseless search for work in a strange and friendless city. The milk. Oh. There was something and in it. so you relax. Oh. Your nerves. They go to sleep. Yes. Sleep. Carl. Oh, Carl. Yes, Aunt Rita. Have you finished the note, oh, dear? Oh, yes, only this moment. I... Well, don't just stand there. Let me see. Aunt Rita. Please, she's so harmless. She... <laughs> and so perfect. And now read me the note. Oh. Uh, to Department KL, Southern mm. Development. Leaving at once for Dublin, Ireland. We'll communicate in ten days. Ten days, Carl? We won't need so much time. Make that five. Just as you say, Aunt Rita. Then sign it Sheila Campbell and post it to British Intelligence. <laughs> Night for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you as star Madame Katina Paxinu, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Woman in Red by Anthony Gilbert. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. Feeling better, Julia? After your little nap? No. No, I don't feel better. Well, the walk and a little something to eat... Will do wonders for you. There is a little tea shop up here. At I the don't corner. want anything to eat. Oh. And please don't hold on to my arm. Like oh, that. now, child, is that a way to talk? You seem a bit shaky, that's all. Here we are. Carl, you wait with Julia. Oh. I'll just look in first to see that it's no too crowded. And now you have to hold my arm. Oh, no, wait, Miss Ross. I don't have to hold. Hey, no, don't, don't. Let me go. What are you doing, Miss Ross? Why do you run like that? Please, don't you understand? If I'm to move in with Miss Crabo, I've. I've got to get in touch with my landlady. But there'll be plenty of time. Plenty of time. What do you want with me? Why are you both... Oh, Carl. Oh, yes, Aunt Rita? Come along, you two. No. Oh, please, you're making yourself worried about nothing. My aunt, it is just that she's a peculiar... Hurry, lady. hurry, children. Uh, then remember that I am here. I have already ordered for us. Oh, fine, Aunt Rita. Our table, this is it? Yes, sir, here in the corner. Uh. Miss Craver. Thank you, Mr. James. And Sheila will sit huh? here to my left. Of course. Miss Sheila. Miss Sheila? What? This is your place here, Miss Sheila. Sheila? 
Why are you calling me Sheila? <laughs> what is it? Why are they laughing? Pay no attention, dear. Just sit down, please. This woman called me Sheila. You both did. My name is... I know. I know, dear. It is Julia. <laughs> Everything is all right. Sh shall I serve the tea now? If you will, please. Uh, now, Sheila, sit down, dear, like a nice girl. No. What, dear? I'm... I'm going to the restaurant. Sheila! It's all right, Miss Crabo. Don't bother. There's no other exit from that room. Oh, I'm so sorry to impose on you, Mrs. James. I had no idea she would be so difficult. Oh, don't give it a thought. Once you explained uh, the situation, we were only too glad to help. Of course, uh, I'd never seen your secretary. I had no idea that... Uh... It's only a recent development. Uh, yes. Shall I pour the young lady's tea now? No, thank you. I can manage. Yes. You know, I was just saying to Mrs. Blandin the other day, I says... I wonder if Miss Crabo and her nephew are still in the neighbourhood, I says. Why, they haven't been in my shop for ages, I says. And she says, no, Ah, they... yes. You see, Mrs. James, uh, we don't dare leave her for long. Uh, for her own protection, that is. Her protection? Uh, yes, we are a little worried about suicide. Oh, oh, yes. Aunt Rita, Sheila's coming. Well, just call me in case I can help. Thank you. Oh, here you are, dear. Carl, help Sheila into her chair. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Sheila... Thank you, Carl. Relax now, dear, and drink your tea. It's all ready for you. My tea in this cup? No, I won't drink it. You won't drink it? Sheila, what? You're pouring, pouring it into your saucer. <laughs> dear, everybody's staring at you, laughing at you. There's nothing for them to laugh at. I simply prefer to pour my own cup of tea. And that's exactly what I shall do. But, but I... Dear, you don't think I... Do you really believe that I, I... I put something in that first cup of tea? Yes. Yes, I do. You did it before and there's no reason to think you wouldn't do it again. Sheila! Very well, then. Drink your tea. Only hurry. I don't think I can endure much more. Never mind. I shall hurry. I'm just as eager to leave as you. And I'm going straight to the police. Oh, now you're not starting that again. Are you insane? Do you think I'm helpless, that I can't get away from you? That I shall simply stand here and... Oh, it, it's happening. What, dear? What's oh, happening? You, you had it in the teapot. Oh, you're tired again, aren't you, child? Is there something oh. I can do, Miss Crabble? These attacks, Mrs. James, they, they leave her quite exhausted. Oh. If, you, if you, if you'd be good enough to open the door. Of course, Miss Crabble, of course. No. Uh, no. She, she must be taken straight to her room, Carl. Yes. Uh, please, if you just give her a hand. Uh, that's it. That's fine. You are really such a help to me, Carl. Here we are, Sheila. Right here. Now, just go to bed, dear. Let me alone. Come along then, Carl. Uh, Sheila is quite tired. Yes, Aunt Rita, I shall. You, you said you'd always be here. You've got to help me. What can I do? Here. I've had it in my pocket. A note. Are you coming, dear? Uh, right away, Aunt Rita. It's to my landlady. I wrote it in the restroom at the tea shop. Here, mail it to her. It's my only chance. But I, I can't keep this. Oh, Carl! She's coming. Yes, Aunt Rita. You can do it. You've got to do it. Good night, Sheila. How very slow you are, Carl. Oh, was I so very long? <laughs> oh, you like her, I can see that. A letter, I imagine. She gave you a letter to post. A letter? Oh. Oh, no, I, I was just locking the door. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Perhaps I have letters on my mind, dear. After that episode with Sheila. <laughs> the first Sheila Campbell, that is. Uh, dear, hand me my knitting. Please. That's a nice boy. Do you know, I'm continually amazed at the stupidity of these English. Can you imagine that girl, that, that supposedly trained agent, dropping that note? <laughs> and addressed, mind you, to the British intelligence. It was very alert of you, Carl, finding it. <laughs> Thank you. Enough. You excuse me, I'm rather tired. But... Uh, yes, uh, this espionage, it's not a restful service. 
Sometimes I wonder if Burning really appreciates the risk we have taken. Yes, the girl had to be disposed of. There was no doubt of it. That was her report on us. All the facts... Andre, that... we've gone over this a thousand times. I really, I'm tired. Mm, yes. You were right in realizing what, bad to be, uh, what had to be done. It was just that you acted too... Please, Andre, I explained all that. Too hastily, that. too thoughtfully, too violently. I couldn't help it, I tell you. She rushed into the telephone room out there. I ran after her, and that, that stupid catch lock pinned us in. She went to pieces, pounding on the door, screaming, tearing at me. I didn't know what I was doing. There was that bookend, the big one. I lost my head, that's all. It's all your fault. Why didn't you unlock the door? But Where were you? I simply want you to remember that every incident counts. Because of you, we cannot produce Sheila Campbell's remains. And we certainly can't allow the police to tear up the cellar to find them. Because of you, we shall have to produce a substitute body. A substitute Sheila Campbell, who will satisfy the authorities completely. We have her, and I don't, de- I don't intend to lose her. The note, please. The note? The one that girl just gave you to mail. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is you don't have to use this girl. You could get somebody else, somebody just as good. She's not right for it. She... Not right for it. A girl who denies her identity, who shrieks of drug drinks, persecution. She's ideal. The police will accept her as a suicide without giving it a second thought. Yes, yes, if they knew she was really insane, but she isn't. Don't you see? She isn't. She isn't. <laughs> just ask those people at this tea shop and that foolish Mrs. James. She will tell you. <laughs> she will tell the whole neighborhood. Oh, Mrs. James, a few neighborhood gossips. They aren't enough. You have to have someone professional and authority. Listen to me. Our not to, to British intelligence will divert them for just five days. Within that time, Julia Ross must commit suicide. And we will see that she does. No. No, I won't. I won't go through with it, I tell you. I see... <laughs> What a pity it would be if the police learned who was the last person seen with the first Sheila Campbell. You you wouldn't. You wouldn't turn me over. This espionage call, it's a very demanding trade. The note, please. Thank you. Thank you, dear. I knew it was an oversight. Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me if a Miss Crabo lives here? Miss Cra- Why, yes, this is her home, but she's rather busy upstairs, however. Oh, yes, Andrita? Was that someone at the door? I thought... Oh. How do you do, Miss Crabo? My name is Turner, Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner? Yes, I happened to drop into the tea shop yesterday, Mrs. James' shop, you know, and she told me about your situation. Yes? Well, I... I thought I might be of some service. My field, you see, is psychiatry. Yes. Yes, I see. Oh, how very thoughtful, Doctor. Uh, Please, uh, won't you come right up? Thank you. Uh, Miss Campbell's room is up in this floor, Doctor. I thought you might as well see her at once. I know how busy you must be. Yes. Well, the case has been uh, quite difficult, Miss Crable. In many ways, yes, Dr. Turner. Naturally, I feel that uh, someday with professional guidance and with those things, I can give her patience, understanding. Mm-hmm. I can bring her out of the darkness. Until then, here we are. Sheila. Sheila, dear. That is Dr. Turner. Step right in, Doctor. He's coming to visit you, dear. How are you, Sheila? How do you feel? Uh, Doctor, I... I rather think my presence will interfere. Mr. James has undoubtedly explained. Uh, If you don't mind... Yes, yes. That might be best. Won't you talk to me? It's all right, Sheila. Believe me. I'm a doctor. You're no doctor. No, no, Sheila. Don't call me Sheila. You're here to help her. Help her keep me prisoner here in this house. Uh Uh-uh, stop it. Help her drive me out of my mind. Help her. Yes, help her to murder me. Sheila, pull yourself together. She's you told you everything. You can't to act like this. Told you how to act. You must Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't oh, you go away? I don't, 
Oh, excuse me, Dr. Turner, uh, but I became a little bit uneasy. Yes, yes, I can understand. Well, Doctor? Uh, yes, it's persecution mania, clearly enough. She has all the symptoms, the deep melancholia, the stubborn hysterical insistence that she's about to be done away with. Yes? I happen to be attached to the King James General Asylum, and I'm somewhat familiar with this type of case. There is one important thing, Miss Crable. Over here, please. Yes, Doctor? The uh, matter of Miss Campbell's protection. Her protection? Yes, from herself. You undoubtedly are not aware of it, but uh, her type is often inclined toward uh, suicide. <gasps> How dreadful. In case those tendencies uh, should become apparent, naturally you'd let me know. Naturally, Doctor. She would then require professional care. Meanwhile, I'm sure your own treatment will be as effective as any. Patience and understanding. Torture me like this, will they? Murder me here in this house. Sheila! No, I won't let them. I'll kill myself first. Miss Campbell. I'll kill myself. That's what I'll do. The window. Stop her. Carl, oh, yes. Carl. Oh, yes, the window. Yes, That's it, the window. I'll jump through the window. A young woman, control yourself. Let me go. Come Don't let me go. Come on, come on. What's going on here? What? What happened? Well, this girl, she just tried to kill herself. I'm afraid this changes things, Miss Crable. She must be put away. Put away? Yes, as soon as possible. I'll have the men come at once. You mean take her away from me? But you can't. I've looked after her myself. Uh, why can't I go on doing that? Because it's beyond you now, Miss Crable. No, no. No, to... I'm sorry, but there's nothing else I can do. Would you be good enough to direct me to your telephone? Telephone? Yes, I wish to order a car. Some uh, men from the asylum. Of course. There is a small telephone room right uh, right on down the hall. Uh, this way, please. I know how you must feel, Miss Crable. But you uh, see, it's the... The telephone, thing. Dr. Turner, is in this room right here. Just sit down there at the desk. Oh, thank you. You're sure the young man can handle the girl? I mean... I will go back myself and take charge. Well, that will be safer, I'm sure. Excuse me. Hello? Turner speaking. Yes, Dr. Turner. I'd like you to send a car right away. And three men. The address? It's number 30. Uh, just a moment. Uh, Miss Crable. Miss Crable! Yes, Dr. Turner? I can't open the door. It's locked. Oh, sorry, Doctor. I'll have to get the keys from Carl. Keys? To unlock this door? This very special look. Locked, Dr. Turner. You don't need any keys. Just open the door from your side. Miss Crable, Miss Crable, where are you, Miss Crable? Aunt Rita, she won't stop crying. I just can't get her to stop. I will get her to stop. A clever one, aren't you, child? <laughs> Pretending to commit suicide so the doctor would take you away. The doctor, where is he? A splendid idea you had, leaping out that window. We'll see if we can help you this time. No, don't come near me. Carla, huh? we've only a very few seconds. Get her across the no. window. Don't make me do it, Aunt Rita. Please, oh, you don't. You wretched, sniveling coward. Do you want us both to hang? Help me get this girl to that window. You, you'll be sorry you made me, Aunt Rita. You will, you will! <laughs> I couldn't help it, Dr. Turner. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I, I just, just lost my head, that's all. But she made me do it. She made me do it. Don't you see? Don't you understand how it was? She made me do it. She drove me, Dr. Turner. All right, now settle down, settle down. And do stop calling me Dr. Turner. Stop calling you Dr. You? Well, no, I'm not a psychiatrist. But I'm going to see that you meet one. I happen to be from British Intelligence, Carl. I suppose I have you to thank for that letter. What? Letter? Yes, the one supposedly signed by Sheila Campbell, telling us she was off to Dublin, Ireland. Oh, yes. It would communicate with us in five days. Well, Aunt Rita, she made me do that, too. <laughs> ah, that was an inexcusable mistake, Carl. You see, Sheila would never have written Dublin, Ireland. Now, an Irishman assumes that everybody knows where Dublin is. Uh... How about that, Miss Ross? Am I right? Well, I know where it is, all right. And I'm going back there as fast as I can. Oh, now, Julia, London isn't as bad as all that, you know. Maybe not. 
I suppose it all depends upon the murderers you meet. Why, child, you wouldn't want to meet a nicer lad than Carl here. After all, it isn't everybody who'd pitch his aunt through a bedroom room window just to save your life. Yes, he's really a very nice boy. Sergeant, better take him down to the cellar now and have him show you where he buried Sheila Campbell. <laughs> aunt Rita, she made me do it. Oh, she made you do <laughs> that too. A woman of character, Miss Crabo. I'm uh, sure you'll miss her very much. But that's the way it goes. This espionage, Carl, is a very uncertain trade. (laughs) 